Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 251, Delegate Part 1 The negativity coursing through his veins felt euphoric. Different hateful emotions like fear, doubt, loathing, envy, greed, they all feed into him, pushing his abilities ever forward. Truly McKeel himself had no idea how powerful he was. And it was all due to this little plan his master had cooked up. The strength increase was a bonus. What took the cake was the delicious death happening all around him. Calling it death was not an apt description however. Michael liked to think of it as a time out on life. The souls of the fallen were harvested for future use. Every villain inside the huge and reinforced arena had done some heinous things. Any other villain whose biggest wrongdoing was robbing a store and maybe flying without a license in the case of Kite Man was not part of the lot. Those petty crime villains were getting punished as well but only according to the severity of their crimes. Most were being forced to relive their lives in an endless cycle of regret up until they truly and properly repented. They were forced to feel every single uncomfortable moment from inconveniences that they had caused to others. Such an emotion when compounded would prove to be hell to anyone. Those didn't interest Michael all that much. Polite and well dressed in a suit didn't mean Jack. When he peeled away the layers, Michael was one sadistic fucker. He knew it and relished in his master's enemies' faces when they found that out. He looked down at the arena, invisible while in the sky. 90% of all the villains that had been fighting in the arena were dead, their souls tucked away in the core of the realm. He looked at the 16 villains left alive, huddled under various things. The largest group so far was inside a tall dome of ice sustained by two villains, Killer Frost and Mr. Freeze. They had chosen to stay as far away from the battle as they could, only taking lives in an act of self-defense. That said, some among them had still killed others before deciding to sit out the bloodbath. Why was this so important? Easy, because Michael had heightened each and every villain's aggression to make them fight and kill. Anyone who had managed to fight against his manipulation of their emotions had displayed that maybe just maybe they had a chance to be redeemed. So, back to their punishments. Just because they had survived did not mean they would automatically be allowed to join the populace. They would surely cause problems. No, Master Raiden, wanted things to go as smooth as possible. It wouldn't be considered smooth if Mr. Freeze decided to start killing innocent people, until someone told him where his wife was. If Michael was any less sadistic, he would have told the ice-themed supervillain that his wife was okay. There was another group of special villains that Master Raiden had allowed Gaia to take from the Hololands. Raz al Ghul and a very ferocious woman who Michael had instantly liked called Lady Shiva. Gaia needed them for a super secret project. Michael somehow found himself pitying them. Oh it seems like I have kept my pets waiting too long that they have begun to grow restless. Michael commented, deciding to finally reveal himself. General POV. Is it, is it over? Captain Boomerang asked from within the dome. Things had been silent for a very long time. The fighters left had been Bizarro, Enchantress, Mammoth, Blockbuster, Votan and a few more high-powered brutes. But that had been before Killer Frost and Mr. Freeze had reinforced the walls of the Ice Dome to avoid dying from the shockwaves produced as these juggernauts went head to head. Things were silent now. Too silent actually. Killer Frost lowered her arms that were sustaining the Ice Dome and fell to the ground, suddenly weak. Frost. Deadshot was there to hold her before her legs gave out. Hey. Hey what, what are you doing? Keep using your powers, the ice is cracking. A scared shaggy man cried out. Shut the fuck up, shaggy man. Can't you see that she can't keep it up anymore? Cheetah growled out, hitting him with a feral look. Shaggy man stumbled back, stepping on Scarecrow's feet. He was huge with thick red fur but that did not mean he wanted to cross Cheetah. Unfortunately, an argument sprang up between shaggy man and Scarecrow after shaggy man stepped on his feet. Deadshot caught Captain Boomerang's eye and the motion to Shaggy Man and Scarecrow. Boomerang looked at them and then shrugged in a the fuck you want me to do to them way. Deadshot shook his head and aimed his wrist gun at them. 
A pasty white hand grabbed his wrist and lowered it down. The hand belonged to Harley Quinn. The normally excitable and upbeat villainess had a cold expression on her face. She walked over towards the two of them who were dangerously close to fighting and then grabbed their heads together and smashed both of their faces onto each other. Hard. Both cried out, stumbling away with broken noses and missing teeth. In the case of Scarecrow, his face looked to be more hurt from the collision. Harley spat on them before looking around at the rest of the villains, challengingly. A slow clap sounded out from above them. Wow, well done Harley. Have you ever considered that the Joker might have been holding you back before? The voice had them all turning to face the sky. Their mouths dried, their eyes bugged out, their legs trembled. Terror the likes of which they hadn't ever felt before hit them. T.H.Th, the wisp, errs. The whispers. Cheetah sounded absolutely scared. Yet she was better off than the others who peed or shat themselves. What she meant by whispers was the universal voice they all had, whispering all their regrets and despair to their ears. There was nothing they could do then and there was nothing they could do now. Michael's eyebrows rose up. Oh, so your souls recognize me. He floated gently down. The villains all stayed in place. Too overwhelmed by fear to do anything. No, you. You're not real. This is an illusion. Damn it. I killed you. Deadshot's wrist gun was already up by the time he finished his words. He targeted Michael's vital organs. All 37 bullets slowed down as they closed in on Michael, seeming to move and thick syrup. Deadshot's attack seemed to rouse almost everyone else and in desperation they joined in. Ice beams, poke dots, boomerangs, all kinds of attacks flew towards the warden. Michael smiled. Reality around them began to change. The arena broke away into fragments of millions of Dementors all flying towards the sky. They formed a black cloud that sucked away all the light and the warmth around, hovering above Michael as if he was the eye of the storm. The whispers in the dark, that which hides in the corner of your eye. The fear of the unknown. Well, now you know. The villains abandoned their attacks and started trying to run away, towards anything. Only for the ground to break apart and reveal wide bottomless chasms. Their screams were the only thing left echoing out as they were devoured by the darkness. Michael looked up at the sky. You know Gar ear, I just had a thought. That whole thing would make awesome entertainment. Michael's surroundings changed as he teleported away from his realm. You have a point. We could use the footage from the fight as a sort of way to debut the realm-wide news network project. It would hurry Master Raiden's plan. Michael floated down towards the Hugh Duke's building headquarters. The statue behind it depicting Aiden had been completed and in his opinion looked as grand as fuck. He managed to capture the figures of both Superion and Superman as they flew towards the woods. Enhancing his sensing skills, Michael was able to capture the building constructed deep into the mountain range. That was also coincidentally where Superman and Superion were headed. He narrowed his gaze. Is that going to be a problem? The question was directed to Gar ear. No, Master Raiden is quite aware of their little fan club. However he hopes that some of the more, wise members of the hero community will be able to talk the rest out of whatever foolhardy schemes they may be plotting. And I'm guessing one of those wise members is the Kryptonian? Someone who wears his underwear above his costume. Gaia was silent for a while. Just get here. She finally said which earned her a laugh from the warden. Michael took the direct route. He flew down and phased through the roof of the building, appearing in a small conference room occupied by a few notable figures. Gaia was standing at the front of the table. Behind her was a holographic display of a few incomplete building projects which seemed to be what she was discussing with Luther and a few others. The whole setup was direct. There was a row of thrones on what passed as the stage. The thrones numbered seven with one huge throne sitting right in the middle. Below the stage was what would come to be known as the council, and the only ones occupying the seats were Luther and a man that Michael had never seen before. The man was dressed in fine clothes and had a moustache across his face. He was also struggling to open a can of pineapple slices. He was visibly sweating and red in the face. Before long he gave up and wordlessly offered the can to the girl wearing similar clothing to him, standing behind his chair. She received it and opened it with no effort before passing the can back to the unfamiliar human. Michael was instantly annoyed. He questioningly looked at Gaia. She ignored him in favor of leveling a hard stare towards the new couple. The realm mother sighed in exasperation. Vrick, if you could please pay attention. Michael's expression underwent a change. Wow. His master did not waste time using his vast powers to bring an other world to the realm. 
Michael really wanted to learn more about the man. Despite his eccentrics, anyone Master Raiden picked must have been useful. Michael sat on the far left throne while thinking a lot. His attention was only broken when Master Raiden along with Vatu, Yotl and Ravu appeared on stage all at the same time. Michael was up to his feet without a hand. Aiden looked around at the conference room and clapped his hands together. Well then, how about we begin the most important meeting of all time? To Aiden, after today's meeting, he would be free to do anything like training for more power and exploring the water realm. With his increased comprehension speed, it was only a matter of time before he completely mastered both water and earth. He anticipated they wouldn't even take up any time. With only a few weeks of meditation he could reach Grandmaster level and passed it. Chapter 252, Delegate Part 2 The entire room grew silent the second we appeared. Lex sat up straighter, Varok's laid-back attitude shifted to a stiff yet forcibly relaxed demeanor. It reminded me of the conversation we had had after summoning him from the system. This place is beautiful. The genius man had said as we faced each other on the beach in front of my house, cottage. The kids were asleep as was Cory and the sun was just beginning to peek through the horizon. The last embers of the campfire Rava and the kids were dancing around were still burning bright. Zilila's wife and assistant was dutifully standing behind him, ready to do whatever he needed. It is, I agreed. The rocking waves of ocean water gently lapping at the beach, no matter how many times I described the scene, it never got old. So what exactly are you? Varok answered after a few minutes. I stroked the fire with a stick, watching the sparks fly up into the dawn sky. The sparks began to change into strange images. Varok looked on with interest. That depends on whether you are ready to learn the truth. A symbol of the avatar appeared on a spark, shifting colors between the dark state and the light state. Chaos and order. Varok watched on, entranced. Zili, are you getting this? I heard a flash of camera light and saw one of those classic cameras in Zili's hands. Where the heck was she hiding something so huge? I am what you would call a cosmic entity. The sparks reflected everything I said. Many think of me as a god and send their worship, offering up their eternal servitude in supplication to me. An image of all the different planets worshipping me appeared in midair. Statues of Adonal, Adan and Adira with the largest one being the Aden statue in my main dimension showed up in the air as well. Are you? He asked, a glint in his eyes. We are taught that gods are beings we cannot ascribe understanding to. Yet I see you, hear you and smell you. I doubt, you. I chuckled. You're right. But I never said I was a god, did I? Varok smiled in disbelief. I am shocked that you would admit that so easily. Keeping up the lie would have eventually grown exhausting. I smiled back. So you do not believe me? He shook his head. I'm an inventor and businessman. I am grounded in reality. Your reality, I interjected. Not mine. I never said I was a god, I am something more. Even Zili shifted uncomfortably. Varak leaned in. You already know what I am going to say then. He leaned back and crossed his hands together, stubbornly. If I wanted to order him around, there would be nothing stopping me. He was linked to me through the mechanisms of the Avatar system, something that for all my power, I was yet to even understand, something that provided for me everything I needed without knowing I actually needed it. I wonder if I could create my own version of it? You want me to prove it to you? I settled instead for asking him the question. Naturally, he shrugged, I am a scientist after all. Good, I abruptly got up and shed away the layers of reality. Varuk and Zili screamed in alarm when they started falling away into stellar cosmic equations, explaining the core of being and sustenance of the elemental dimension. No other human had ever been here except for the two of them and the only reason I allowed it was because they were completely bonded to me. Their souls, their minds and their bodies were mine to do with as I pleased. However, that kind of control was something I never wanted to exercise. It was better if I showed him a single glance if what I was. It pointed out how insane Varuk was that the raw collision between matter, energy and meaning did not break his mind. Zili must have already gotten used to his antics as she was also more or less unharmed after the experience. After that, Varuk agreed to work for me of his own volition maybe telling him that he could continue his research into spirit energy as an alternative means to energy, without the fear of his inventions being used as a weapon had something to do with it. I left him with Gaia, warping space to a meeting with the Amazons that was long overdue, I had followed one of Yotl's advices and separated the Amazonians from the rest of humanity, choosing to give them an island stocked with everything they would ever need. 
Within a few days, the female warrior society had changed the island to look like theirs, complete with a fighting arena, archery ranges, riding tracks and weapons training grounds. A more respectful man would have used the door to the small palace that they had built out of the material Gaia had provided for them. Me? I teleported straight inside. The chamber was actually really well constructed. They were so badass they wanted to build their own houses. Of course Gaia made distributing the material and correcting any errors in construction her job, doing the bulk of the work. Still, they had shown dedication. The second I appeared unannounced, they all, did nothing? Huh. Where are the spears and arrows? Where is the hostility I was expecting due to being a man? As one, the Amazons gathered lowered their eyes and took a knee. There seemed to be court proceedings going on, with Yotl standing dutifully on the side of the throne, the Queen's throne. Next to Hippolyta was another throne that had Wonder Woman sigil above its head. Diana was not in the realm now, having opted to leave due to being a god queen of her own pantheon, so the seat was empty. Hippolyta rose up from the throne with a regal expression, walked down the stairs and took a knee. Welcome my lord. To say no more, the meeting went splendidly. I had thought I would need to make an example out of them, to show them exactly who they were dealing with. Now assured that I would face no problems with the Amazons and after going through their revamped list of traditions and laws, I decided to let them live life however they wanted. Who knows, maybe I could find a use for them. They were more talented than the average person in spirit manipulation as well. Gaia scanned them and told me. And we needed more of those so we left the meeting to go to another one. Hopefully, this one would be the last in a long time. Yotl and I picked up Vatu and Rava on the way, before walking towards the conference hall of what was to be the governing council in the Uk building. Gaia, Varik, and Zuli, Luther and finally Michael. I gestured and everyone sat down. My spirits took the thrones behind us while I remained standing. I cleared my throat. First of all, I want to introduce you all to a new colleague and his assistant. It was clear I was talking about Varric. You want to say hello? I asked dryly. Varric jumped up onto the table. Zuli. Do the thing. Yes, sir. A whistle and a bunch of confetti exploded in a spectacle behind him. Feast your eyes upon the greatest inventor you will likely ever see. I immediately regretted it and quickly cut off the rest of his long-winded introduction. Varric, everyone. I then turned and introduced everyone else to the eccentric scientist. Now that that's out of the way my tone grew serious, just as an image of the Earth continent, the continent holding all the humans, appeared on a hollow screen behind me. Let's get down to business. As you are all aware, the Yuk is responsible for the welfare of every human in the realm. That will not change as long as you have a democratic system of governing among you Luther. Gaia retains the position of an overseer and has the ability to take matters into her own hands in case the situation calls for it. If I may, sir. Luther replied, that's quite a contradictory system, democracy applies on all levels. It's inclusive. I knew he was pointing out the hypocrisy and giving them freedom that was conditional in them acting the way I wanted. Suck it up human, life is not fair. Vatu answered grouchily. He hadn't seen Demeter in a few days. Luther, admit it, humanity is a danger to itself. Before Darkseid, you were well on your way to destroying your own planet. I will not risk my realm by allowing you to do whatever you want. Gael is in charge. Got that? He eyes briefly landed on the realm mother and he nodded. Good, moving on. The hologram behind me panned out to reveal five more huge landmasses and over a million islands the size of the largest continents back on Earth. Vara whistled and Luther blinked at the scale of distance provided. 102 million square miles. And expanding. Added, here comes the bad news. The other continents are off limits to any human. There are delicate ecosystems that are in an infant state and I want to give them more time to grow before humanity begins to destroy. I snorted. This might turn out to be a challenging adventure in the future. Something for explorers to seek out. But for now, tell your people Luther, you're all on house arrest. He looked like he wanted to protest that but instead settled for a curt nod. Varric will be heading the technological side of things. Luther, you will be included in the fold but only as a consultant. We have no need for weapon advancement, medical services due to the drones or a number of the projects you were involved in where you had government contracts. There is only one thing I am interested in and Varric is heading it. Be sure to provide him with anything he requires within reason. Luther and Varric looked at each other over the table. Luther sighed before nodding his head. Varric merely smirked. I wasn't interested in them being friends, merely working well together was enough for me. 
Good. The matter of the day-to-day -day lives has been taken care of. There is now a system in place. Gaia has helped you and will continue to help you in constructing everything you need, from making up new laws or readjusting old ones to fit in with the new standard. Not to mention look the necessary people to hold necessary positions. School will soon start as well. Different career opportunities will be made available as Gaia withdraws her influence from the things you yourself can handle. I estimate that within three months, things will go back to how they were, in a sense. I looked around for one last time. I won't be around for some time but I hope you all work together to make this work. I gave a nod to my spirits and the others before teleporting away, hoping and wishing that I hadn't made a mistake by choosing to leave matters in their hands. There was nothing I could do though, I had to get ready for what was coming. But before that, I had to see Cory and my kids for the last time before I started my training montage. Chapter 253, Training Montage Part Cory and I hadn't had some time alone in a long time and with Rava capable of looking after the kids, that provided us the perfect opportunity to bond. I set up a beautiful picnic on the edge of a waterfall that fell from a really long height. The spray of water managed to create a very beautiful rainbow that paired up perfectly with the greenery of the island we were on. The beach here as seen from the distance was simply a work of art. Gaia could engineer the best tropical getaways or such beautiful landscapes, that you would lose your breath from sighing in happiness too much. The best part of this island? It was all natural. As natural as it could be given that the whole realm was only a few months old. Holy shit. The realm was actually only a few months old? My surprise aside, I made sure to set up the most romantic date we had ever gone on. The best part about the island was that the waters near it were home to a school of flammy dolphins, creature that were hybrids between flamingos and dolphins. They were also humongous, easily the size of a blue whale. Every time they jumped out of the water, it was a spectacle to see. Corrie enjoyed it immensely. We stayed there just chatting about everything. She told me about her worries and I swayed them. I told her about my doubts and she hugged them away. It was nice to have someone who wouldn't judge you. Nice to have someone who cared. After the beautiful day, I took her home and enjoyed the evening with my family. The kids could sense I was about to leave and so more than usual they wanted to spend every single minute with me. At the end of it all, I stood alone watching the ocean my toes digging into the sand. The stars in the sky, a mere illusion yet they managed to cast the natural light down to the surroundings. I knew that one day, every single star I could see, would ignite and become real, gain substance. I wasn't going to stop until I made this realm the best. I would even take all the followers I made in the other universes and bring them over. I would create a utopia not free of strife or suffering but with just the right amount of pain and the right amount of pleasure. Pureless for eternity is no different than pure suffering for all eternity, in a way. So my creation was going to have realism, where you were free to achieve anything you wanted. My ideal ideal world. I was still not sure about letting humanity stay though. The amount of faith I was receiving from the populace was increasing each day. It felt scummy to eventually abandon those who decided to worship me. That was something the Greek gods did, not me. Yet, humanity had proved time and time again that bitter change usually accompanied them. Was I dooming myself and the realm for considering what I was considering? I stayed there for over three hours. Not meditating or doing anything of great importance, just chilling and thinking. Eventually, I had to depart. Duty called and I would be remiss if I didn't answer. No one says no to a training montage. I jumped to my feet and closed my eyes in concentration. At my urging, my body split into two forms. The original body had green and red eyes while the homunculi puppet looked like the white shadow. It was strange seeing myself from outside my body. I had grown really tall. I was my dad's height now and although faint, some of the resemblance that had been there still flashed through in certain angles despite my face now looking like this. I was really really handsome. It threw me out of loop and left me feeling weirded out that I was staring at myself. How the fuck had no one pointed out the unnaturalness of the whole thing? Oh. Yeah, the ones who would have said something were too scared of me and the ones who wouldn't, saw past my outer image. They saw me for me. The homunculi puppet perk had evolved. I could now sustain another homunculi without any side effects. Which gave me three independent forms for each of my unlocked elements. That meant that sooner or later, I would be able to split my attention among all the elements and their sub-skills. I could coordinate attacks with myself and have a better layout of the battlefield. This particular homunculi only had access to the water element. It had no connection to any of my divinities, major or lesser. All it basically had was my strong body and skills. 
My mental faculties were fortunately split between all my active forms, so my comprehension speed was still very high. I saluted the original, which was still me, I guess. So I basically saluted myself and then disappeared into the water realm. My original self shook my head at my antics before turning to the realm mother. Gaia, is everything ready? I stretched my body, the air undulating and the sand on the beach shaking. I heaved and jumped with my physical power alone. The air tore apart and a path of super hot energy was left behind my trail. I reached the atmosphere of the planet in a split second and then beyond that to plunge into the cold of space. The sun was huge. It covered every corner of my vision when I looked at it. Space itself was cold but my godly immortal body easily shrugged off its effects. I was now sustained by my power and domains. Nothing lesser than me could kill me. Gaia's answer came just as I was drifting around, basking in the rays of the sun. As the god of light and the stars, the sun was under my control. I tried to absorb some of its power and found it easy. Though I would probably need like a hundred suns to actually absorb a good amount. Yes. It was difficult but with the Justice League's data on wormholes and spatial manipulation for faster travel, I came up with the working model. Though it only goes up to 500 times the gravity. She answered through telepathy. I hummed in acknowledgement and reoriented my body, then shot off towards the only other giant planet in the star system. I hadn't bothered with creating other exoplanets, deciding to wait until there was a need. Gaia was huge, almost the quarter of the sun and closer. The other giant planet was near the outskirts of the star system. Gaia itself had several Jupiter-sized moons revolving around it. The number was six. Gaia had a project to combine them all into one moon, stabilize the gravitational forces between the two to stop any adverse effects and give Gaia one beautiful moon that occupied the night sky. We were literally rewriting the laws of physics however we wanted. For her it was just a matter of saying, it works. And it would with trillions of simulations running on how to make the planet more evolved, then it really was a matter of saying, it works. I weaved through an asteroid belt, escaping the field with crazy flight maneuvers that reminded me of my favorite sci-fi shows, to come up on the literal opposite to Gaia. Even from space itself this planet was an enigma. It was silver with a layer of white covering it. Not to mention, smooth like a globe due to the high gravity restricting the formation of tall mountains and hills. The planet was also frozen over with temperatures that approached the absolute cold, only off by a few degrees. It was made for ash living. The air was not breathable and instead contained an atmosphere dominated by a gas that was highly poisonous to biological life forms. The planet had custom-made drones that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Justice League and best them. Those were going to be for sparring. The thing that set the planet apart from Gaia or anything else however was that I could afford to go all out here without the danger of breaking it apart. The planet had a Kaum core and absorbed any energy you threw at it, giving off a field of dark energy that cast the planet in a dark light. The darkness drained even more energy from someone. It was the perfect training place. The planet was Gaia's size as well. But the gravity was crazy. 500 times the gravity of Earth or Gaia's own adjusted gravity. The pull from the planet was bringing me closer to its atmosphere without my wanting to. The second I breached the zone separating it from space, I plunged right through like a meteor, feeling a slightly uncomfortable weight acting upon my body. It was easy enough to shrug it off, but my trajectory kept on shifting due to the increased gravity. It would take some time to get used to it. I hoped the other me was having more fun. White Shadow. Yeah. I was having fun. In fact, it wasn't just fun, it was something else entirely. Awe and satisfaction. I had just found the winner for the prettiest plane in my realm. A world made entirely of water and the occasional ice landscapes floating above the surface. Despite that, the temperature was not freezing. It was actually warm in a way. The clouds above were a beautiful golden color that seemed to exude out a light that hit the water and caused all these beautiful shades through the environment contained inside. And that was where the ore came from. The underwater was its very own sustained ecosystem. It contained beautiful aquatic plants and animals. The sea life looked like something you would see straight from a fantasy movie. The entire dimension was as big as the rest of the planes, with no discernible end. Or something like that. To be honest, space was folded and stretched out in places. The elemental planes did not follow the same rules as the main dimension. The main dimension had a sun, none of the planes had that. I swam inside the waters, just enjoying the view. Huge sea creatures that were bigger than the Unagi passed me by peacefully. I touched one of them and had it leaning into my touch. They recognized me. 
And just as they recognized me, I recognized the spark of life inside each of them, the connection they possessed that made them stand apart from the rest of the creatures in my fire plane and air plane. That spark of life culminated into a special universal consciousness that I could feel watching me curiously and with interest. I smiled as a name appeared out of nowhere, glowing with the light of knowledge inside my mind. Aqua, the spirit of water and life. She wasn't ready to meet me yet though. I could feel her hesitation. She was. Unsure. I was something else. I was different. She could not feel me or control me or be me. I smiled, closing my eyes and allowing the water to pull on my body, causing me to sink into its blue embrace. It's all right, I mean you no harm. I sent forth calming telepathic tones, hoping that I made a good impression on her. I had a feeling that water training would go faster if I had Aqua helping me. Chapter 254, Training Montage Part 2 Five days. That's how long I spent inside the depths of the ocean. Everything was dark all around me. This was not even the deepest part of the water plane, yet it was a veritable void with tons of liters of water weighing down on me. For reference, the deepest part on Earth was or had been, the Mariana Trench located in the Pacific Ocean. It measured more than a whooping 34,000 feet deep. That was literally nothing compared to the deepest part on Gaia. The oceans in Gaia went deeper than 4 million feet. That is more than 1,219,200 meters deep. The water plane was much much deeper. To be honest, I had no idea how deep it went. I was already more than a billion feet inside, yeah. That was why my theory of space being folded or stretched out in particular places was more than just a theory. It had some truth to it. I just couldn't verify it in this form. I didn't have access to my spatial abilities so I couldn't accurately figure out the mystery myself. One thing I knew however was that there was more to this plane than the ashy landscape of the fire plane or the cloudy peaks of the air dimension. The golden clouds. Something was off about them. Anyway, the reason I was deep inside the ocean was fairly simple. I was going about things differently. This time I wanted to begin my water bending by mastering a subskill, to be precise its solid form before the most common expression of the element, its liquid. The reason was that in my eyes, ice was not only more fascinating but was also connected to a certain fundamental aspect of reality that I was coordinating with my original body to learn. I got the idea from Miss Teeth. If she could tap into time and freeze it then I could do. And if I could freeze it, then mission complete. I would have had a taste of time manipulation and could work from there. Too bad Vata destroyed Kronos, I could have studied his divinity and copied it. So my first training aspect of water bending was trying to form ice. Not just any ice though. The question comes in, if I was training to learn how to manipulate ice, why was I not in one of the ice islands floating on the surface of the ocean? Why was I so deep into the ocean that no ordinary life could be sustained by such an environment? Well, because of the very high pressure of the water, the ocean floor was nothing but a dense connective layer of ice seven a crystallized solid formed by the high pressures in the depths of the ocean. The whole sea floor was made up of ice. I meditated in those depths, trying to understand the process in which the ice was formed. And what caused the water above me to remain in liquid form while lying above a plate of ice that had no end. The crust, the core, everything below the water was ice. Yet, life lived. How did the aquatic plants survive? Thick roots the size of story buildings that stubbornly dug into the ice floor and then branched out into a mesh of branches and leaves that formed a fake sea floor. Above that fake sea floor, life thrived. Sharks, schools of fish, hybrid aquatic creatures, you name it. Too bad I hadn't seen any mermaids, which was a bummer. Mermaid? A soft voice asked, straight to my mind, Aqua. She would occasionally check up on me. I had deliberately let my mental walls down which was how we communicated. Through the same innate link I possessed with the rest of the kids. Aqua was so shy that she only said one word at times before retreating to where she usually stayed, which I couldn't pinpoint exactly. I sent her an image of what a mermaid looked like. I chose Ariel as an example, but changed her hair and tail into a blue color. I felt Aqua's emotions suddenly shift from cautious curiosity into excitement and happiness. Love. She sent over before cutting off the connection, leaving me all alone in the darkness. Finally, I saw some results. I had been trying to understand the formation of water into ice and by the fifth day of my meditation, I finally succeeded. Just bleed out the temperature. Yet was that obvious. I had thought there would be more to it but seems like I had been wrong. Or maybe instead of saying that that was the way, it was more accurate to say it was one of the ways of forming ice from water. Because I could not form ice 7, 
nor was my ice the normal type that could break apart into chunks and melt above the surface of the water. My ice was more akin to a crystal. It wasn't as cold as normal ice but neither was it as weak. To reflect on my progress, the display box accurately displayed my stats. Colon. Water, beginner. Ice. Colon. With that out of the way and seeing no progress in freezing time, I decided to move on to actually learning how to water bend. My original body was still meditating on time and he was more than capable of handling that problem. There was no use in wasting precious time when I could be better off mastering my new element as quickly as possible. Learning how to create ice using the little control over water I had, came to be a blessing in disguise. It opened new avenues of training that I was all too eager to try. I stood bare-chested on a small piece of ice that was softly swaying on the surface of the water. It had already been two weeks for me. Most of the time after learning how to freeze water into ice had been spent trying to take its temperature lower and lower, approaching absolute cold. It hadn't happened but that precise ice control came in handy now. The ocean all around me added to a feeling of immense tininess I only felt when staring at space. All I could see, horizon to horizon was water and golden clouds hanging low. The sheet of ice I was standing on was about one inch thick and could barely handle my weight. If it broke, I would unceremoniously be dumped into the water. Now, my body could handle the cold easily but getting wet is not always fun. My long hair especially was a bitch and a half to dry without access to my other elements like hair. I breathed out as I readied myself. All the distractions left me. My mind became focused, falling into the rhythm with my body, where thought and action were separated by a very small margin. Water bending was an art that was very similar to Tai Chi, an elegant and flowing style that is in constant motion. This type of bending required deep breathing and fluidity of the physical body and of the mind. It was all about the push and pull, a cycle sustained by the flexibility of the wielder. It could change from calm to angry like a storm in seconds. Water bending was arguably the best bending art in the Avatar world. You could heal with it, form water from the atmosphere, bend an enemy's blood. I can imagine being able to bend an entire army simply by wanting to, could form ice, control plants by bending the water inside. Honestly, despite my love for fire bending, water bending took the cake. And I couldn't wait to see how I could break it. The basic moves of the art were clear in my head. The moves emphasized going with the flow, the sway, the motion. When water meets a rock, it flows round it, unobstructed and uncaged. Different from air that had less mass and could be released in short bursts, water had to be coaxed but in return brought with it more power behind each move and better control. Two water benders were equal to four fire benders, it just made sense. Which was surprising because the fire nation had managed to almost destroy the southern water nation. The purpose of the thin ice platform was to teach me how to go with the constant troils, twists and laps of the ocean water under me. I swept my leg from the front to the right. The motion rocked the ice sheet and I tensed, locking my body to stop from breaking through the ice. A second later the sheet cracked into tiny ice plates and I was dumped into the water. Inside the blue depths, I blew out a raspberry before coming up to the surface and trying the test again. The water solidified into another thin sheet of ice. I stood atop it and tried to fall into the rhythm. My eyes closed. I stretched my hands to the sides, as if painting a picture on a canvas hanging in the air. The motion of my hands followed a set of moves that emphasized on stretches and coils. My fingers bent, followed by the arm, then the other hand followed the same motion closely. I breathed out, sweating a little because it wasn't easy trying to maintain the structure of the ice. I lifted one leg, held it level to the knee of the other leg and then crouched low, sweeping out the leg to the right along with my right hand, and then came the spin. The ice sheet broke and I fell into the sea. I swam up and spit out the salty water. Okay, maybe this is not going to be as simple as I envisioned. I considered using the spark of enlightenment but then decided against it. It would have been such a waste. Why was it so hard to get this? I was frustrated, I was angry and I was irritated. I calmed myself down and got back on the horse. I hadn't come all this way just to give up now, right? I was the avatar. This shit was in me. I just had to pull it out. Once I was back on the sheet of ice, I stayed still, just feeling the effects of the water's boots on the sheet of ice. One thing I noticed was that the sheet of ice did not try to counteract or restrict each and every action the water did. If it roiled, the sheet roiled with it and by consequence, I roiled with it too. Huh, so it wasn't trying to adjust itself to fit by the water's rule, instead it simply allowed the water to do what it wanted. It was going with the flow and the motion because it was in the water's domain. 
My mind buzzed. That's it. I had been trying to copy the motion and do the basic move sets of water bending according to an order. What I should have been doing is surrendering completely. If the sea raged, I would rage. If it was calm, I was calm. True Harmony. Chapter 255 Training Montage Part Stepping foot on the giant training planet was more akin to the exertion of running a million miles. I could easily do it but still, the effort was noticeable. I burst through the ever-present grey clouds that could instantly flash freeze a human just from being too close. The entry was fairly okay. Before my eyes, I could see a smooth landscape made up of shallow craters and small mounds of rock. I discovered a huge portion of the planet and no life was present here. No carbon life at least. Silicone-based life forms could maybe survive here but I was not about to find that out. This was my training grounds. A place I could go all out without fear of breaking something. My breath fogged and broke apart into tiny ice shards that fell to the ground. I immediately decided against breathing. My feet landed on the ground and the pull of the planet's gravity stuck to me like glue. Immediately I could tell that any other flyer would be hard pressed to leave the surface of the planet without a great amount of propulsion. The first thing I did upon reaching there was go into meditation to mentally prepare myself for the task ahead. I knew what I wanted and how to go about it, all I needed was the will to keep at it. My homunculi puppet was similarly training, having started upon the concept of ice and time, I didn't think there would be a lot of noticeable progress from that, but it didn't mean that that particular path was wrong. Everything was connected, it was all about finding that bond. I arranged my thoughts, using a telepathic skill I had learned where I completely discarded any other thoughts processes not pertaining or relating to one sole objective, I felt my mind grow sharper, the faces of everyone I knew and loved taking a back seat. Was it possible to be more powerful than I already was? Yes. How though? A few ways come to mind. First of all, I could essentially gain more divinities and domains. Every single divinity would come with an enhancement to my physique that stacked onto what I already had. This would effectively increase my physical parameters to even scarier levels and came with additional powers and skills. The second way was to focus on shoring up my weaknesses, which begs the question, what weakness did I have? My energy manipulation abilities had always been the focus and my main fighting style. Using elemental attacks to bombard an enemy from different angles, I had been in so many numerous fights, I could come up with attack strategies that they wouldn't see coming. And with my homunculi puppet focusing entirely on water bending, it was safe to say that this particular fighting style would only grow. It wasn't accurate to say it was my weakness. Then we have the divine side of things. To be completely honest, being a god was harder than I thought it would be. No, I'm not complaining. I always had to keep my aura in check, especially my true form which was whenever I went into elementalization or cast away my mortal flesh and became a being of super energy. Power? I had lots of it. The problem was the control at times. Imagine walking around with cuffs in your hands, that was what it felt like whenever I had to interact with a lower life form. Ha ha, can't believe I thought of them like that. Then again, it is factually true, so while it wasn't correct to call it a weakness, neither was it a strong point. Only meditation and increased mind and body mastery could help that. Moving on, there was the matter of my psychic abilities. I had telepathy which I constantly used, telekinesis which I rarely if ever used, the complete control over the realm I possessed made me spoiled, clairvoyance and a number of crazy mental abilities that I had the potential to achieve. Time was the problem. I especially wanted to master telekinesis. Having seen the information that at its highest level, I could effectively achieve control over reality. The system never lied. If it thought I could do so, then I had the potential for it. The skills were too undeveloped to call them a weakness though. That would change if I focused on my mental abilities and found my talent for it lacking. The spirit or rather the soul was next up, to be frank, I probably had the most talent in this branch of my power system than anything else. Let me explain. The avatar was the bridge between the physical world and the ethereal. That was the core of my being. That was the basis of all of it. I was literally made for this. It was in me, which is most likely why I took it for granted. My approach to it was the weakness. The last and the most underestimated of my combat styles was my physique. When I had first arrived here, all my focus had been on ensuring I survived. And that had meant having a stronger body. Taking advantage of adaptive physiology, I had managed to use two serums to upgrade my body to the level where I wouldn't immediately die from the aftershocks of a battle between powerful opponents. But then when my skill in elemental manipulation picked up, my physique had taken a backseat. 
That was my true weakness. A stronger body only posed an advantage for me. It would ensure that controlling my other powers went smoothly. A strong body meant doing feats that were crazy. Saitama only had his body to rely on. And now that I had regeneration, paired up with adaptive physiology, it would be dumb and a blatant insult to the geek community if I didn't take this chance to power up even more. This would be completed in two sets of training. The first was body refining. I did not waste time and immediately delved into the first set of the training. With immense control I was able to coax out my flames. The golden flames were the combination of all my myriad flames apart from my silver fire but that was not what I was going for. Instead the former was the highlight. Silver fire was still the most dangerous thing in my arsenal. The more I developed into a high tier being, the more I was weirded out by its nature. Silver fire could burn something in its entirety. It followed no one's law. Even I could only direct these flames, not control them. Not really. And I was going to use them for something that was downright insane and reckless. Body refining. I had stumbled my way onto that particular perk by accident and it hadn't had time to shine yet. That would change today. So how? My slither flames rose up under my direction, covering my body in a silver cloak. Instantly in a zone of about 500 feet all around, the temperature grew to insane levels, melting the ground and ice into a viscous watery gel that popped and released noxious acidic gas. The clothes I was wearing disappeared in the blaze. I let it happen. I started sweating as the silver flames buckled against my control. A few seconds of this and I would be burnt to a crisp if I wasn't careful. I wouldn't die but I would also be stuck in agony for eternity. My immortal soul would be sustained by the realm and my divinities while the silver flames continued to burn tirelessly, aiming to destroy me. Luckily, it did not get to that point. I directed the flames throughout my body, refining it by focusing on any waste I had accumulated. A pleasurable feeling invaded my body. It felt like the best massage I had ever had. A few hours later and I looked different. My brown skin had a glow to it. My teeth were sparkling white, my eyes were clear and twinkled and my height had increased by an inch. My hair funnily enough trailed all the way to my lower back. I felt euphoric and itched to try and see the effects of the change. However, I stopped myself, preparing my mind and body for what was about to happen. Burning away the accumulated waste was not enough. The vessel, the holder, the container. I chanted a calming mantra. Imperfect. Perfect in potential. I fell deeper into the conceptual, my mind pulling me past the walls of my personality into my metaphysical state. A state where my whole being did not distinguish from the soul, the mind and the body. A unification of all. My whole being was laid bare for me to see, to read to understand, to change. A bunch of incomprehensible jargon to someone else, I could see the aspects of myself I hid from the world. The driving force under every action, the code. Authorities held together each of these aspects, connecting and detaching with every change in thought but never fading away to obscurity. It was a world onto itself. Maintained by trillions of cells all with their own functionality and living mark. I passed that and delved even deeper into my existence, then deeper into the shackles imposed on that existence. There, I found it. Below my true name that I immediately erased the memory of, I found the third dimension being template. The signature of my creator in other words. The limits of my being. A stop gap to ensure I never became more than I was supposed to be. The signature reminded me of the same spark of power the presence had in every single creation of his. Weakness. Mortality. Disease. Death. Emotions. These were the locks imposed on my existence. I could not exist without them because they made me, me. This was a true going against the heavens shit. There might have been me might have been necessary for this component of different aspects that was me to essentially keep living. However, my silver flames had something to say to that. Chapter 256 Training Montage Par The streets outside the Ick building were crowded with rioters. About a hundred thousand, holding up boards with words such as, down with tyranny. Life is sacred and false gods die. The rioting had happened right after the clip showing the battle royale among the villains in an arena, was played. What was meant to be a symbol for solidarity quickly changed. There were multiple deaths and only a fraction of villains managed to survive. The rioters opposed the blatant bloodshedding and hoped to prove a point by boycotting the Uke building. On the highest floor of the Uke building, a meeting was happening. Luther, Tarlock, Zuli and a few more high-ranking officials were in a heated debate on what to do. The meeting was interrupted by a sudden flash of light. They all turned their eyes to stare at the thrones placed above the stage. Luther stood up. 
Your Excellencies. He nodded towards the new arrivals, Vatu and Rava. Vatu had an impassive look on his face as he walked down the stairs, followed closely by Rava who was staring at Terra, standing dutifully behind Luther. She had on a curious look on her beautiful face. Gaia sent us here saying something needed our attention. Tarlok snorted at Vatu's opening words. Just humanity being humanity. Luther and the others looked at him with various expressions on their faces. I see. Vatu replied. Is it something you can handle by yourselves? He asked about to leave. Luther blinked his eyes, as an easy smile appeared on his face. But of course, we were just discussing a few measures. He said it in a way meant to wave away their concerns. Wait. Rava spoke up, placing a palm on Vatu's shoulder. Her brother looked at her with his bored expression. It had been long since he had seen Dmita and it was messing with his mind. Rava told herself to remember to ask Gaia if they could release Vata into the other world. I'm curious about everything. Gaia would not send us here if it wasn't important. Luther's face smoothed out as he adopted a blank expression. Of course my lady. He nodded in acceptance. Vata sighed and turned to face the rest. Fine, what's the issue? After telling the both of them what was going on, an overpowered aura erupted out of Vatu. An aura that dominated everyone present with the exception of Rava. How dare you? Vatu asked coldly. You humans are ungrateful creatures. Rava's own aura burst out, counteracting the effects of Vatu's rage on the officials in the meeting room. Vatu. Brother, calm down. Her words went unheeded as Vatu threw everything away with a shockwave and began to float towards the wall of the Uke building. The concrete and stone making up the wall were pulled away by a purple energy that washed out of Vatu. He floated out of the building and proceeded to take steps in the air. The rioters shouting and yelling at the base of the building fell silent as the sky above started to rapidly change. Dark ominous clouds had taken over. A cold biting wind began to blow and their spirits and souls shook with the emergence of a purple light from the sky. Hey what's that? One of them asked, pointing a finger at the sky. The purple light pulsed and with each resonance, the very air buzzed with some unseen force. Humans, you stand so brazenly with your backs to my master's inviolable statue. The voice that spoke was audible and clear, sending the whole courtyard full of people into a silent state. With sticks and boards made from the realm, you seek to question your savior, to impose your meager influence upon a force of nature who favored you enough to allow you to live. For that transgression, die. Vatu finished and raised a hand. It didn't matter that death had no influence here, Vata was determined to send them all into their soul states, consequences be damned. The rioting group realized that something bad was about to happen, something that they couldn't stop. Cue the screams as over a hundred thousand people started shoving and bumping into each other to run away. Many were trampled underfoot and the panicked sounds could be heard over miles away. The purple sphere forming above Vatu's hands grew bigger and bigger before finally, he cast it down with a soft statement he thought fitting. Judgment. A new sun bloomed behind the rioters. Holly who had been invited to the riot by a friend she had made in the festival a few days ago, could not believe that this was happening. She had only come here to see if she could find traces of her sister. And now, now she was going to die. Her shadow grew larger and larger as the purple sun from behind neared them. Then a blast of white power appeared in the path of the purple sphere attack. Cracks appeared on the ground as everyone closest to the collision between Rava and Vata was bodily thrown away. Rava exerted a little strength and sent the ball flying away into space. The sphere exploded, pushing away the ominous clouds and dyeing the sky in a purple color. Enough Vatu. That voice. Holly pulled herself off the destroyed street and the throngs of moaning people to stare up at their savior. She had on fully white hair now when a few days ago, there were only stakes of white in her red hair. She wore a beautiful pale blue dress that was unique, seeming to reflect light like a mirror. A white light. Dove. Holly muttered in disbelief. Her sister was alive. Dove. She screamed out, frantically running towards Rava. Rava turned upon hearing her previous name. She blinked in surprise upon seeing the person calling her. Guilt and a multitude of other emotions hit her. Holly. The two sisters looked at each other without speaking for a few long seconds. Then Rava turned to look towards Vata who was flying away, leaving behind a sonic boom. Rava breathed out heavily. Yeah she needed to talk to Gaia and see if Vata could be allowed to leave for a short time, but first. I'll come find you. We have a lot to talk about. She said and then flew away as well, leaving behind a stunned Holly. The white shadows POV. 
I had mastered the basic forms to a high degree. Now I could dance or rather move through the sets without overly upsetting the ice sheet below me. It had yet to break even after sixteen continuous hours of sinking my actions to those of the rocking waves and tides below me. After that, I went on to a staple water bending exercise that was not contained in the basic forms but provided a deeper connection with the element. The concept of push and pull. It was the bedrock of all other motion. A concept that was higher than what I termed as true harmony. The concept of flow. Standing on the same sheet of ice, I exhaled and tried to push the water out with the exhalation of my breath. I sensed no change. The water was still as rowdy and aimless as before. I could force it but that would be going against true harmony. And I felt that using that connection to direct its movements was better than trying to force it. I inhaled and imagined the pull. Then exhaled, push. Inhale, pull. Exhale, push. Inhale, pull. Exhale. I continued with the exercise, focused entirely on succeeding. At the sixth hour, I felt Hack would come to check up on me. She was everything so the only thing I could sense was an influence surrounding the golden clouds and the water around. She watched me as I pulled and pushed, using my hands to mimic the gestures. She left soon after. Had there been a sun here, it would have already risen, set and risen again. Twenty-four hours later, I was still pulling and pushing. Aqua came to watch me again. This time lingering for far longer. Three days later, I was still pulling and pushing. It began with a tentative if curious pull. Then naturally there was a push to compensate for the pull. Then the pull came again and a few minutes later, I almost burst out in laughter at seeing a prompt appear in my vision. Colon. Water. Practitioner. Ice. Colon. I was at the rank of a practitioner. I fell out of the cycle of pushes and pull allowing the towering wave of water formed by my pull to flow back into its buoyant state smoothly. Water sprayed on my body, wetting my hair slightly. Despite that, nothing could hide the look of happiness on my face. I breathed in and waved a hand. The water followed my action, roiling to the left in a swirling motion around me. The ice sheet began to spin with me on top. I raised my right hand and the water under the ice sheet suddenly rose up throwing the sheet to the sky. I spun in the air and kicked out. The sheet of ice broke apart into sharp spikes that pelted a nearby ice cap. But then I was left suspended in the air about fifty feet up. Another arm motion and a tower of water rose up to receive me. My body plunged into its depths easily. I kept a small rotation around me while allowing myself to be pulled under, my last view being of the tiny holes I had created with my ice attack on the ice chunk nearby. Then using the concept of push, the rotation around me instantly changed and I was propelled up to the surface. I broke through the water like a dolphin, a laugh escaping me. This was fun. And for my grand finale, I focused on my unlocked subskill, hot air escaping my mouth and fogging. The air around me grew colder as I fell towards the water once more. When I landed, my foot did not land on water. Cracks spread out on the ice floor owing to the fact that I had lowered the temperature of the water before landing. It spread out with a cold pressure blast. Mist heralding the change of water into ice. I stood up and surveyed the scene. Now we're talking. Over more than a thousand feet of ice covered my surroundings. I walked around testing the strength by stomping on it. It held up. A confident smile appeared on my face. Time to handle the next subskill. Chapter 257, Happening Zo, the center of the universe. Hawkman, Green Lantern Gardener and Wonder Woman stood in front of the Guardians of the Universe on the planet O, the Green Lantern's headquarters. We have heard your testimony and rest assured, this matter is very serious. Gant that responded after an accounting of how the Earth had been destroyed. I fail to see how this concerns us. One planet is of no great consequence. Another guardian added, making the three heroes agitated. Are you serious? We just told you that over seven billion people could have died were it not for Aiden Strong and you're acting all blasé about it? Guy growled out. Wonder Woman placed a palm on his shoulder, pulling him back with a shake of her head. It would be wise Lantern Gardener, to remember whom you stand before. A stone-faced guardian warned. Guy snorted and looked away, crossing his hands together. He is not wrong, however. Wonder Woman came to his defense. Yes, he is not. Surprisingly, this came from a guardian who was hovering to their left. The others turned to stare at him questioningly. I find myself, intrigued by the prospect of there being an individual, human no less capable of destroying a being such as Darkseid. He looked around at his colleagues. 
the fact that his religion has sprouted out in a certain quadrant and a number of sentient civilizations across the universe is worth noting as well. Another guardian added. Darkseid was even more powerful than the Promethean gods at his peak. It is indeed intriguing. Diana looked at Hawkman and Guy. Could you both excuse us? Hawkman stared at her for some time before giving a curt nod and proceeding to fly out of the Guardian's Hall. Guy looked like he was about to protest before relenting. If you need me, I'll be right outside. He told Wonder Woman, before nodding at the Guardians, Ganthet in particular and flying away. Once they were gone, leaving the Guardians and Kilowog who had up until then been silently standing guard on the side, Wonder Woman stepped up and began to speak. Guardians, I personally know Aiden Strong. The God Queen of Olympus begun heavily. He is strong. Immensely so. He has the capability to do just about anything. His power inches on the boundary of reality manipulation. They were attentive, surprised, but patient enough to hear her out. But perhaps what is more terrifying, is his ability to keep on growing stronger. I estimate that as he is right now, no one can stop him. Not the Green Lanterns, and not even you. Impossible. No mortal can reach such a level. Even Kilowog stiffened in shock. There was no reason for Diana to lie to them. The Guardians were powerful and skilled, figuring out falsehoods from the truth was as easy as breathing. Ganthet had a different reaction from the rest. The way you speak, it seems you have a solution to this growing threat? Diana looked down in thought. If this was before her talk with Odin and a few other gods, then she would not have thought of going against Hayden, but now things were different. They needed Earth and Earth needed people. The way things stood, she was not sure Aiden would give up the people he had saved willingly. Power and authority changes a person and Diana was not sure asking nicely would work. And given the fact that Aiden could apparently create realms and dimensions, he had the capability to restore Earth many times over yet hadn't. This meant that he didn't want to, and no one could force him to do so. Diana and the rest needed to band together if they had any hope of stopping more catastrophes from occurring. Not many knew it but Earth was the most important place in the universe. And for something so significant, friendships and feelings had to take a backseat. She looked up and. Elsewhere. We fight. Black Canary softly said to the gathered room. Dozens of voices joined her, either in support or refusal. You are asking us to go against the world itself. We all know we hold no candle to his power. What you are suggesting is death. Fire, a hero from South America was vocal in her refusal. Life was different, sure but that did not mean it was necessarily worse. So you are okay living under a dictatorship, right? Red Hood sneered. Dictatorship? Do you even hear yourself? Ice came to fire's rescue? You American heroes have no idea what actually goes on outside the borders of your great nation. She looked around. People starved, died because of diseases and life was generally miserable. And no one denies that, as Atara held up his hands amiably. He was trying to appease the over dozen powered individuals. I understand, I migrated to the US, leaving behind the difficult life I had back in my country of birth. Life on Earth was unfairly hard. And for the first time in history, things are fair now. Everybody has something to eat, somewhere to sleep and less worry. A majority of those gathered agreed with him. However, that does not excuse almost killing off more than a hundred thousand people because of protesting what was an inhumane incident. Arg, Are you seriously going to argue against the deaths of supervillains? Huntress spat out. The heroes began to argue once again. Silence. She ordered, making the room quiet down. With vitriol she began. Most were despicable human beings whose biggest contribution in life was bringing pain and suffering to everyone else. I say good riddance. How can you say that? The Flash, Jay Garrick asked. From there the talks devolved into a shouting match. One team was led by the more hardened heroes. Those who had faced the harsh reality of life, lost everything and decided to be merciless in their approach to crime fighting. The others were led by the optimistic ones. The ones who understood that fighting with extreme prejudice would only darken their souls. Making them end up like the ones they were fighting, Superman saw no true end up this conflict. For one, he was unsure of what to choose. This wasn't Earth where they could bombard Aiden and his people with over a hundred different laws and regulations, this was his world. Vatu's attempt at killing people had pushed him slightly to the side opposing Aiden's rule but, on the other side, after so many years, he could sleep without hearing cries of pain half a world away. He could spend time with Lois, concentrate on building a family. Clark knew that what they now had was a gift. 
The meeting ended just like the previous one, with no true decision on whether to take a stand, no matter how hopeless it might have been or to simply live. Clark had known that Batman wanted to talk to him, so after the meeting had ended, he had made sure to fly away quickly. Batman was brilliant and knew just what to say to get others to see his view but what Clark needed right now was peace not a reality check. As long as no one was suffering, he wanted to keep it that way. He felt something fast flying towards him before slowing down upon getting closer. Hey, you left so quickly. Connor addressed him with a questioning glance. Before Superman could tell him why, something appeared before them. Clark shielded his eyes while Connor tensed in anticipation of a fight. The light died out, revealing Gaia. Everyone knew who she was. Aiden's religion termed her as the Realm Mother. She was everything around, even the very air. Superman was not too sure about the god thing but he could tell that he had no way to win against her. Gaia looked at the both of them and then with great seriousness said. You both need to come with me. A short time later. She remembered the last scene she ever witnessed. The scene of everything she ever held dear exploding behind her as the pod flew her away right behind her cousin. Kara was devastated by the loss of her parents and planet. But that devastation soon gave way to terror at the enormity of her situation. She was flying through space, all alone. Separated from death by only a few sheets of metals, she saw wondrous things, clouds of gases that shifted with beautiful colors, cosmic storms hovering around star systems with planets teeming with nascent life. Krypton usually pruned any other developing life close to their galactic quadrant. They were isolated in more ways than one. Kara got to enjoy the sights as a way to forget the pain of loss she had suffered. But even that grew to not be enough. Nothing was. By the time she was swallowed up by the wormhole that took her to Apocalypse, Kara's or El had lost hope. Her time under Granny Goodness was filled with never-ending pain and indoctrinated processes to get her to serve Darkseid. After having her mind broken down, she took to the training with a crazy devotion and seal. And then the last fight she had been involved in, happened and everything changed. They were utterly destroyed, all of Apocalypse forces beaten and defeated. The last dregs of Kara's or L that had been left had thought that this was the end of it all. Then, light. Welcome back to the land of the living, Kryptonian. An exotic beauty of wondrous features, tall and dark with pools of eyes that seemed to contain beauty that surpassed all the gas clouds, cosmic storms, planets and nebulas she had ever witnessed, greeted her. Kara's lips were slightly parted as she groaned, looking around at where she was. The room was bare and painted a calming white. She tried to get off the bed she was lying on and failed, not having enough strength. Don't strain yourself. It will take a few days for your biology to absorb sufficient solar energy and charge you back up. Gaia told her. Kara listened, allowing her body to sink into the soft mattress. Her eyes closed. When she woke up again, the exotic woman from before was nowhere to be seen. Next to her waiting patiently was a blue-colored woman instead. However, one look into her eyes and Kara realized it was the exact woman from before, just in another form. Gaia realized that Kara knew about her two forms and cheekily brought her finger to her lips. That's our little secret. Kara found herself nodding. I'll come in to check on you later. Right now, you have a family reunion waiting for you. Gaia disappeared in a flash of light just as the door to the room opened and in walked her cousin. Chapter 258, The Creator Rarely Do Universes From Different Layers Of The Multiverse Intersect But a quintillion years before the before, a young realm sprouted. Its branches grew in the space containing the paradox of boundless existence and non-existence. And it managed to touch upon one of the oldest multiverses at that time. The concept of infinity is different. Some infinities are larger than others. One such was the opposite of the creator of this particular multiverse. It saw a chance to take over its multiverse of origin by using the young universe, and so begun its machinations. Aiden's POV. My dad and I sat in his office. There was a chessboard on the table in between us and suffice to say, he was kicking my ass more than anything else. No matter what I did, he had counter moves for every action I took. And that was with him taking it easy on me. I still had my king, a couple of pawns and a rook. I sighed and leaned back in my chair, giving him a critical look. What do you think you're doing old man? Teaching my son the true meaning of despair. Mew ha 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 ha. His villain laugh was actually on point. Keep it down there Jeff. Lindy is about to fall asleep. We both winced at mom's loud yell. Jefferson Strong might have been the head of the family to the outside world but we both knew who actually held the position or in this case, the spoon and she was not afraid to use it. Ha 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 you're so whipped. I told him with a laugh, 
not missing the opportunity to tease him a little. My dad and I had a really close relationship. It wasn't wrong to say he was my best friend. We just got each other. I was practically a mini him. He snorted, finally capturing my king. One day you'll understand the value of a good woman boy, he leaned closer. And how controlling she can be. We both burst out in laughter. You better not be gossiping about me, you two. Mom's voice came from downstairs. We looked at each other and the laugh died out, leaving behind smirks. I looked down at the chessboard, then took a deep breath to catch the faint scent of old books that Dad loved to collect. I have someone like that Dad, I told him. He perked up at the news. Just like you have Mum, Cory, I sighed, missing her. Cory's amazing. You would love her. And you're gonna be a granddad. He was stunned for a while before swallowing the emotional lump in his throat. That's good. That's really good kid, he ruffled my long hair. I'm so proud of the man you have become, and I know your mom and Lindy are as well. They say a man doesn't cry and they are right. However, the single streak of tear coming down my left eye tried its best to prove me wrong. He held my palm in his hand. You know, your mom and I worry about you a lot. I wiped the tear away and asked him. Why is that? Dad barked out a humorless laugh. You are blessed or more like cursed with passion Aiden. When you feel so strongly, there is nothing that can stop you. He shook his head. Such drive can be turned towards the wrong things. Things, I have tried my hardest to shield you and our family from. He grabbed my other palm and held it in his hands. A look of desperation appeared on his face. But now, I can't do that anymore, and it scares me Aiden. It scared me more than I can ever explain, every single time I regained a little consciousness, only to hear that you were still missing. The authorities had tried their best to find you and failed. There wasn't a trace left. Tears started falling from his face. You and I failed our family without meaning to, your mom and sister, all alone. Me dying of cancer and you, my beloved boy, lost forever. We didn't even find your body. I was hit with a sudden weakness and the world started spinning. All this, why didn't I? Couldn't I? How could I forget? Dad had cancer, how could I forget that? Mom, Lindy, I left them all alone to deal with this. My mind was utterly blank. Dad squeezed my hand, making me turn to stare at him lifelessly. He smiled in assurance. Your mom and Lindy will be okay. They'll be fine, I just know it. Your uncle will make sure nothing happens to them. He nodded his head with a watery smile. And now that I know you you have someone you can rely on, it's easy on the soul, I can go, knowing you're okay. His face started to rapidly change. My family is, okay. The strong jaw shriveled into loose skin and bone. His skin lost its glow and the muscles of his arms shrunk. What's happening? My heart began to race inside my chest as fear gripped me. I immediately got off my seat, letting it fall behind me as I went around the table and held him. Dad, Dad? Are you okay? Please say something. He was wasting away in front of me and there was nothing I could do. His hair fell off and what I was left with was a poor replica of my father. The one man who looked to be insurmountable to me. The one man who despite being a normal human, cast a larger shadow than Superman and all the rest of the Justice League. My true hero was dying. I panicked, pulling in from my life divinity reserves. Hey, you're going to be okay. I won't let anything happen to you, I promise. Just hold on. A golden glow suffused his entire body, the light washing down from his head to his toes. His eyes regained some color. He stared at me emotionally and conveyed everything he ever needed to say with one simple look. Don't forget us, Aiden. Then the light faded away. Dad, Pops. Wake up man, this ain't funny. Not like this. His body began to flake off into light. I used everything I had at my disposal going as far as to attempt using a miracle to bring him back but nothing worked. I felt the power of the miracle try to breach the dimensional plane only to rebound against something powerful, something infinite, something my soul recognized instantly even if my mind struggled with the concept of what was happening. Dad's body turned into golden light that disappeared into the air. The whole room started changing, breaking down as my silver flames devoured it all. My anger was palpable but even more than that. The sense of loss I felt was so shattering, I wanted to curl up on the floor and cry myself to sleep. Do I add? This was something much deeper than what modicum of relief, tears could bring. I hated the feeling of helplessness I felt. Nothing mattered at that moment. Nothing mattered than the utter and complete destruction of the one who had stopped me from saving him. 
My silver flames drowned everything in my space of being. My clothes turned to ash and I stood in a literal ocean of fire looking up at the sky. Looking up at the first ever instance of true infinity I had ever witnessed before. A deep darkness that could not be breached by any conceptual or cosmic entity. A darkness so supreme that it contained its very own multiverse in it. An antithesis to the light that I knew to be true. A darkness so authentically real, all others like dark entities like Dark Sid had pulled from it to gain meaning. Even now I could feel the connection my chaos sided with it. It was so comprehensively massive that all that had existed or could exist was well within it, contained in a swirling mass of matter, energy, antimatter, and anti energy. The essence of my father, mother, little sister, friends, my high school bullies, the president, Genghis Khan, Barack Obama, Mother Teresa, Elon Musk, wild animals, ocean creatures, extinct animals like the dinosaurs, the history, the future, and the present of the world of my birth. I was looking at my very own creator. And within him, was me. A copy of my strongest self stared down at me imperiously and my soul shook, my body lost strength, my resolve faltered, my hope diminished. All that was left was my hatred. My hatred which burned with the same passion that always worried my dad. Aiden Strong, you have failed to keep your end of the bargain. Trillions of voices said, making the space of my being experience tremors and world-ending cataclysm events. I blacked out then came to with a shuddering breath, prevailing only because I used up most of my divine energy to stabilize my consciousness. Bargain? I breathed out, my eyes blazing with anger and the promise of pain. What do the dead need bargains for? Is it to pay Thanatos as you close the river into the underworld? I asked with the full intent to carry out my threat. The creator went silent. We had a bargain Aiden Strong, your father's life for conquest. You promised me dominion. Why have you not delivered? The voices were slow to say. Is that why you blocked the memory of my father's illness away from me? I have been living a lie, for months. And now he's dead, so fuck you and your bargains. I did no such thing. You chose to do so yourself, to stop any distractions from clouding your judgment and derailing your mission. You promised me a doorway yet you took it upon yourself to make with my gift your own realm of dominion. I should have foreseen this, I did not. You have failed me, Aiden Strong and so my punishment was taking from you what you hold dear. Every single statement that left this thing's mouth only spurred my hate for it. For making me into a plaything. For allowing my dad to die. But if you had done what you were supposed to do, he would still be alive. The words hit me with the force of a sledgehammer. Yes. I was the one responsible for that. But even if everything it said was true, had my order state not created a realm but instead a doorway for this thing to come through, the universe would have ended. And had he known that I had unknowingly or knowingly sacrificed him for the preservation of countless lives in the multiverse, my dad would have been proud of me. He was dead but goddammit would he have been proud of me. You seek to trump my control and fashion yourself into a separate entity. The creator begun. Oh what gave that away? I asked it, putting strength into my feet and getting up. The fact that it was trying to stop me from going beyond the limit of my makeup meant, I was on the right path. I was not going to stop. So be it, perhaps my champion will have a better time of convincing you on the foolishness of this endeavor. It stated. Before my eyes, the sky that was completely covered by his unbelievably dark form started roiling and twisting into itself, forming into a very strange yet familiar being. Black as night, his skin was and on the top of his head were four horns two long ones on the side of the head and two shorter ones in between the other pair. He was huge and intimidating. Castant forth taint and corruption in my being that I only held off due to exhausting lesser miracles. The eyes looking at me were eyes devoid of nothing but a certain kind of devotion. It floated down gently. My soul immediately recognized the danger and my divinities spurred on by the instinct to continue existing activated by themselves. Storms of fiery swords, beams of plasma waves, Lightning bolts the size of skyscrapers made up of pure cosmic rays and elemental energy, light beams owing to my electromagnetic spectrum abilities, hell flames, golden flames and spatial rending attacks all fell upon it from every single possible direction. Armageddon had descended. The figure waited until right before the attacks landed and stretched out its hand, opening its closed fist into a palm. An empty palm. Everything vanished. Erased. Each attack I had thrown was enough to destroy countless solar systems. Together those attacks had the destructive capacity to annihilate an entire galaxy and yet. It smiled, holding out its hand. My hand is empty. Those words were like a lightning bolt through my spine. 
It continued, eager and gleeful at the look of abject terror on my face. Supplicate yourself before our master, Aiden Strong. Deny him no longer. Bow down and worship your creator, the great darkness. Chapter 259 An Unbeatable Foe? The presence looked up from the pond of reality. The sky overhead was dark and gloomy. It is going to rain soon. His unwanted guest made an observation. For the first time, the soft expression on his face was gone. In its place was an impassive look, one born out of being the most powerful entity in existence and the worries that came with that. Well most powerful was not completely accurate. At his level he could do anything. What limited beings such as him were their personal beliefs and ideals. When an infinite being fights another infinite being, the battle lasts infinitely. That was why conflict was meaningless to beings above the twelfth dimension. It served little purpose. They had evolved beyond that. They existed above such concepts of life. Wars and violence were best left to lower life forms. He cast his gaze down at the pond. The clear waters were no longer taint free. A darkness from the deep was encroaching on the light, and the corners of the endless pond had a layer of oil on the surface. The presence's reflection snorted. How long will you keep on ignoring the obvious thing? The presence looked down at his opposite. They have surprised us time and time again. Maybe this time, it won't be different as well. He answered. The reflection scowled. You are wrong. I have foreseen how this ends. How I end it, and my will shall be done. The presence took his umbrella and dipped the pointed end inside the pool, disrupting the reflection. Arrogance is the bane of all. You will learn that lesson, I assure you. But it will be too late. The darkness creeping up from the depths of the pond, receded and the edges of the boundless pool similarly lost their oily surface. The great darkness influence was once again undermined. The presence looked up at the sky. Ha, huh, he was right. He got up from the bench and opened his umbrella. It is going to rain. An old man in a bowler hat started walking away, a light shower of rain pelting the umbrella he held overhead gently. Aiden's POV. The nerve. Come, boy. We do not have to fight. There is no need to waste time on a futile endeavor. The absolute goddamn nerve of this creature. Every attack I had thrown, planet bursting, star bursting, nut bursting. Nothing had worked. Not a goddamn thing. It pissed me off. That he could stand so brazen inside my being, inside my metaphysical space and talk. Down. At. Me. My power is incomprehensible. Empty hand boasted. Our masters even more so. I offer you. And he just didn't stop talking. Shut your trap. I finally said, fed up. I had limits to break and power to achieve. This thing and whoever it worked for could kiss my divine arse. Empty hand had lost the smug smile on his face. Now he looked positively mad. No more playing around. Equity manifested in my hand. Due to it being a bonded weapon, I could bring it out here. The moment the sword appeared in my hands, the world trembled. Air started roiling around the weapon as I held it up. Empty hand narrowed his eyes at the weapon in my hands. That sword is about to bring you a world of pain. I said from his side, having covered the distance between us in a split second. He was immobilized and couldn't react as I leaned then flashed past his body once, twice, a million times. The slashes were superimposed in reality in blue slashes. I landed on the other side and slid a little across the flames. I looked back over my shoulder and watched as his body turned into fine black mist. I looked away to the front, spreading out my senses to see if the darkness was still around. There was nothing left after my powerful move. Not many things could survive that. The silver flames flared up at my urging, burning the fine mist into nothing. Finally, I allowed myself a sigh of relief. He was gone. Gone but not dead. Still, the revelations, I looked at my hand, I was from the dark multiverse. How was, how was it possible? It made no sense for my universe to have knowledge about the main DC timeline and its changes written down in such detailed format if it was part of the same multiverse in the first place. I had thought that I was from the prime timeline. The true Earth. The Earth that was the home of all the writers who came up with the characters and storylines that shaped DC Comics. I mean, if the darkness was to be believed, there was no real world. There was just my home, the dark alternate of the DC multiverse, and the great darkness was my, maker. Something landed behind me, or rather a formed from, the fire? What? How? Impossible. I thought, spinning around suddenly. Nothing could survive my silver flames. Nothing. Except, 
Before my very eyes, black smoke rose up and formed into my adversary. The negativity came back. An aura that was vindictive and hateful. Empty Hand had an impassive look on his face. Your efforts are meaningless. He landed on a pitch black ground that appeared when darkness pushed away my silver fire. How? Soul annihilation flames, can they burn that which exists beyond the concept of heat? He asked with a twist on the corner of his lips. Then his face changed to a malevolent one as he tightened his hand into a fist. You will pay for that, pest. I crouched, equity changing into a short serrated nodaki. You didn't leave when you could. That's a mistake. This time I'll kill you, and make it painful. I was still high on my anger, if I hadn't been, I would have paused first and came up with a suitable plan. It would have saved me a lot of headache. In my current condition, I wanted to destroy something, and luckily, I wasn't short on that. I'm going to show you something I've been working on. Make sure you survive, because I won't be satisfied by your quick end. I snarled in anger. The first step between us took me over one trillion miles away towards my back. Then I used space to slingshot me back at high speeds which added to my divinity as the god of speed, caused time to get wonky. Space cracked and then stitched itself back together forcibly. Inside my mind, a clock that begun to tick backwards as time reversed appeared. This was as a result of the initial little success I achieved with time manipulation while meditating. It was not reliable in the real world due to the damages in the timeline I could cause just by moving at such speeds. My space of being was more malleable than the real world however, so I could use that to my advantage and pull off neat moves like these. The world fractured as I found myself two seconds back in time, then five seconds. At the one minute mark I saw my past self, throwing numerous attacks towards empty hand. A field of nullification covered him, causing all the attacks to simply die out. Swords of flames and other constructs meant nothing to him. Beams of supercharged energy fizzled out into nothing. Well, two could play that game. When are you from? My past self asked me telepathically, the connection between us slotting itself together. One minute into the future. I sent him the mental recording of our fight keep up the pressure. I told him and he complied. The attacks coming in increased in both size and quantity. Now it was my turn, I held out my hand and squeezed space, connecting with the film of the nullifying sphere and then eliminated the infinite corners around the space surrounding the spherical shape of the field, only leaving four corners to his back. There was a brief twist and pop and the nullifying sphere was turned into a two-dimensional square that was to his back. Empty hand's eyes widened when every attack from my past self landed. The torrent of elemental and divine attacks drowned him under, pushing him towards the ocean of fire on the ground. A dragon made up of silver flames erupted from the sea and swallowed him whole before exploding apart in one massive blast. I'm guessing the reason you're here is because that isn't enough to put him down? Past Aiden told me the second I floated closer, eyes on the flames dying out in the sky. Not even close. You distract, I attack. He gave a curt nod and instantly split into two forms, air godly form and fire godly form. He could use homunculi puppet. How? Huh? They both shrugged. Didn't know I could do that. Went with my gut. I blinked. Cool. Get ready. His flame god form said, both it and the air god billowing up in size to a gigantic skyscraper size. That hurt my pride, you little brat. Now I'll have to get serious. Empty hand yelled, landing on the ground in one fell swoop. You're going to hurt much more after I'm done. Then I was off, shortening the distance between us again, faster than he could react. With my first attack I managed to come out of the clash with his right arm clasped tight in my hand. Then Bones broke under a heavy fist, collapsing his right chest side, I appeared before him and kicked out with my foot landing on his cheek. Empty hand was lifted off his feet towards my air form. An air construct in the shape of a hammer was swung down with full force, slamming onto his flying form and digging it into the ocean of flames. The fight entered a lull. Is he dead? The flame god wondered. We were answered a second later. The creature released a wide burst of sonic scream that caught me unaware. Following the scream, a cloak of darkness erupted out in a wave that pushed my past self's air god form away. However, my own aerokinetic abilities nullified the attack and I was able to land more hits in the time it took my past self's flame god to make a single step. I streaked over a dark scythe and popped behind his back, throwing a punch. Wait. I paused in midair, a shockwave blasting out into the surroundings from the sudden stop. Wait. I hadn't completely gotten rid of the biggest problem with time reversal. 
I was actively changing the past in real time without it affecting my memories or splitting the timeline into two. With that realization came an unreasonable amount of fear. Everything froze in midair. My past self's divine forms were similarly frozen in place. Then they faded away into a dark cloud as the world around us rapidly changed or in other words, revealed that I had not taken another step after the fist instant, I thought I had killed him. I see you finally noticed my trick. My adversary pointed out from my front. My eyes never left his beaten form. He was missing a hand, his spine was broken from my actions, both his eyes had exploded from a timely blast and his left side was covered by slowly encroaching ice. However, none of that was real. I stiffened in place, my body betraying me. Every single action I had taken turned out to not be real. It all turned out to be a mental illusion, a lie. The ground started to fracture into a sea of silver flames, only they were tainted black and burned with an oily slowness. The sky above was dark and very gloomy, and this thing was standing behind me, not in front. And its sharp nail was digging into the back of my neck, slightly. From that single point, my body was covered by black spider web like veins. I couldn't move, calling on my divinities was futile. There was something actively blocking me. Oh no you don't. He clutched my neck from the back in a vice grip, his huge face, coming to rest a little over my shoulder. Give up. Fuck you. There was a wall separating my powers from me. The same field of nullification only, it went deeper into the conceptual. You thought you could fill me with a mental illusion. I gasped in pain as my words trailed off. Looking down at my chest, a black arm with sharpened nails had pierced right through. I was in painful disbelief while spewing out blood. How, how the fuck was he hurting me in my space of being? Chapter 260, A Promise of Death This is nothing compared to the eternal torture you will feel for daring to stand in my way. Empty hand whispered close to Aiden's ear. In response, the creator of Gaia, shifted forms into his golden flame state in a sudden power-up. Divine energy rippled out to the surroundings. The pain in Aiden's chest was immediately alleviated. He looked down at the hand going through his chest and held onto it tightly. You're not going anywhere. He yelled. Then, energy started wafting off Aiden's body like a broken faucet. His golden form turned white due to the heat he was exuding. Heat hot enough to turn anything into ash. Empty hand felt the effects the most, the skin and flesh of his hand almost instantly combusted, turning into ash. The being screamed in pain. However Aiden was not done. He pulled in all the energy into a spot within him, his body changing back to gold then yellow, orange before becoming a red giant. Inside him all the energy was compressed into a sphere that was too bright to even stare at. Empty hand felt something coming but was too slow to react. An explosion of great magnitude erupted from their position. The shock waves bombarded the being from the dark multiverse, breaking down his shadowy form before the heat drowned him under and ended him. A zone of more than 38 million miles in every direction was left bare of anything. The silver fire was pushed away revealing charred grey sand under the fire as the entire space of Aiden's being, groaned. Cracks appeared everywhere, showing nothing but dark holes and unstable rifts. Aiden suddenly felt weak and fell from the air, smacking onto the ground after the damage his being had taken. Within him, was the feeling of something important breaking. He felt as if his life force was draining away. He did not have time to regret as intricate webs of white and black energy appeared, covering everything his eyes landed on. Healing his sense of self, Aiden felt strength come back to him as he instinctively used chaos and order to heal his being. He groaned, floating off the ground after that showing. Somehow a hangover feels worse than this. He joked. He knew it was not enough. Empty hand had shown, time and time again that he always came back, somehow someway, he always fucking came back. It had reached a point where Aiden understood that he needed to change tactics. He hated fighting tricky opponents like these. He needed help. Aiden's POV. My original was fighting against an entity of untold power. Splitting my attention into two like this while not too distracting, rendered itself pretty counterproductive in a high-stakes battle like this was turning out to be. It wasn't your run-of-the-mill fight either, no. I needed to give this my all, but first. Gaia, is everything okay in the main dimension? I asked in concern, it wouldn't be good if the fight happening between Empty Hand and I started affecting the realm. No mortal could survive the mere shockwaves produced as a result of every clash. Still, to find out that I had been mind-fucked into thinking the initial fight had happened, 
his telepathic abilities were leagues above my own and although I was confident in fighting him on an even ground despite the fact that he had some pretty big advantages over me, I needed a plan B. The realm is safe, but I calculate a 70% chance that things get worse the longer the battle goes on. Gaia's words confirmed my fears, I had to end this fast. But how? Logically speaking, I was supposed to hold more power than him as long as we were both in my consciousness. Yet the opposite seemed to be true. He could regenerate even from my silver flames and could cast mental illusions that were nigh unbreakable. Lastly he had a nullifying effect on all my divinities. A drop of sweat fell down my forehead, uncaring of the cold temperatures. Plan B it is then. Gaia, keep an eye on things for me. I'll be back. I told her. Luckily she was connected to pretty much everything in the realms. I could feel Aqua's curiosity when I used my authority over the realm to leave the water dimension. I'll be back, I promise. I assured her, speaking straight into her mind. The yellow light from a boom tube manifested under my form and swallowed me. My view changed, as I appeared in outer space. My homunculi puppet skill could not really handle continued exposure to this type of environment but a few minutes was not a big issue. My clothes started freezing over my skin and the cold of space was only mitigated by a great amount of chi energy circulating within my body. The sun and the stars dotted around, provided enough light to see the floating pieces of rock that used to be earth. My guilt came back in full force. I could feel over a dozen awarenesses hone in on me the minute I appeared, and if I couldn't capture the attention of the one I wanted. My surroundings changed instantly. I found myself seating on a table inside a cozy tavern. The cold vanished and I could finally breath. I hadn't noticed it but the shivering I had been experiencing from the chill had ended. Something was slammed onto the table in front of me. My eyes captured the steaming hot cup of tea from the barista, waitress, who turned out to be a red and yellow colored girl. No, I kid you not. Her skin was scarlet and yellow zigzag streaks of energy ran from her similarly yellow hair down to her body. There was something also eerily familiar about her. Who are you? I asked but instead of answering she merely winked at me and walked off. That wink, and that motif. Speed force. I muttered to myself. Her aura gave me the same feeling as pulling in energy from the dimensional energy that governed momentum. Close enough. A voice stated and, it's like I hadn't noticed him before despite him sitting right opposite me. The presence, oh thank god, ha ha. I tightened my fingers into fists and immediately bowed my head. There was no time to waste. I am sorry, because of my negligence, I let the cradle of humanity get destroyed. Knowing just who I sat before was enough to humble me. The fear I held for him was almost outweighed by the desperation I had to seek him out. I was from his biggest enemy's side. I wouldn't blame him if he blinked his eyes and made me disappear. I see you found yourself in quite a pickle. He commented dryly, not offering up insight on his true feelings. I dared to look up. Yes, an enemy even I struggled to defeat. Empty hand was a bit too much for me now. It grated on my nerves that I had to admit that. I couldn't go all ouchy to the risk it carried. I needed a surefire way to thoroughly defeat him. I didn't know where else to turn to. I looked away in shame, for all my power, yet I was reduced to begging for help. I understand, the creator of the DC multiverse stated, too easily, where's the blame? The dislike? I wondered. Establishing eye contact with his A's to try and see for myself his true feelings was a bad idea. My mind opened, seeing everyone and all things. Aiden. My name startled me and I blinked, feeling something flowing down my nose. I dabbed at it with a finger and found. Blood? The presence sighed, removing his hat and placing it on the table before me. You looked into my eyes. No mind is strong enough to handle this train, he frowned. We have wasted enough time here. My surroundings changed yet again. This time I found myself floating in nothingness. The void, or rather a layer of it. The presence tapped his umbrella on something, and the nothingness was replaced by a canvas of endless white, something I could finally perceive. That was trippy as hell. I stated from his side, trippy but eye-opening as well. It showed me I still had leagues to go before I approached his power. My breath was then stolen away by the image before us. Two swirling masses of existence, one dark and the other bright, one positive and the other negative. Two polar opposite bubbles lying around like marble balls in their wide and boundless infinitude. An infinitude that stretched out to... Thwack. The umbrella in his hands landed on my head. Focus. Ow, it was actually more painful than it was supposed to be. On what? 
There is nothing here except for the multiverse and its opposite, oh. I finally understood what he meant and turned my eyes towards the two bubbles. They were connected together by a force of mutual attraction and the mutual repelling, ensuring they never collided on each other or drifted apart. The vision changed from two bubbles of existence to two discs, one gloriously bright and the other anti-everything to the first. Like the reflection on a mirror, seen from the mirror's perspective. No distinction between the two except a necessity to be separate. They steal meaning from each other. I stated, comprehending something not meant to be seen for even one such as I. Put up against these two multiverses, my own realm seemed so pitiful in comparison. It was so young it was crazy. What does this mean? Still there was a difference between comprehending the intricacies of reality and actually understanding how I could apply that knowledge for my own gain. If you're looking for a way to kill its servant, then you will not find it here. The presence informed me. I turned towards him and opened my mouth, only to close it as a look of contemplation appeared on my face. Okay, so, that makes sense. I'm not fighting his true self, his physical body is elsewhere. Which means that what I'm seeing is a mental projection. I frowned, casting another look at the discs. They changed shape and pattern again into strings of energy pulling and pushing at each other. Under the power of the presence, I floated around the void easily, trying to capture a different angle I could use to look at the multiverses. If it's a mental projection, then how is empty hand connecting to my mind despite my realm being on a different layer of the void entirely? That question was the most important one. When scratching my head to answer it became too difficult, I tried another tactic. If it was me, how would I do it? And then the answer hit me like a ton of bricks. That's it. How had I not seen it before? It was so obvious. I stared at the presence and saw a gentle smile on his face. I bowed down or at least tried. Mostly, I just ended up looking funny as up and down was confusing here. Thank you. I said sincerely. He tipped his bowler hat. Give them hell. I will. I promised, deactivating homunculi puppet. Now with all my mental focus back in my consciousness, I disengaged from the fight and jumped away, creating massive distance between Empty Hand and I. Oh, have you decided to give up now? Empty Hand questioned, its face split into a vicious smile. Instead of the furious expression he was expecting, I smiled, dismissing equity back into my hammer space. God, I hope this works. Your jig is up. He narrowed his eyes. Explain. I shook my head. I won't. This fight needed to end now. I had finally figured out how he was doing what he was doing. And it all had to do with my dualities. Despite being the master of chaos and darkness, the concept itself was not anything new to the great darkness. One might even say he was the first master. The first wielder. The presence presented order and meaning. Which made sense that the great darkness would be the opposite to that. And the opposite of order is, chaos. They were essentially like me only plus a few infinite, years. In a way. It's complicated. As it stood, the great darkness had a more strict control over darkness and to that effect chaos which was stronger than mine. That's how Empty Hand kept coming back. He just used my own connection to chaos to do it as well as sustain bus mental projection. This news elated me. Why? If the great darkness could supersede my own control over my abilities, who says I couldn't do the same and take control over the dark multiverse? For all I knew my mom and little sister were back in my universe. The only way to make sure they were truly safe was by eliminating the threat completely. I did not care if the great darkness was something otherworldly. I was issuing a challenge and that challenge came with a promise of death for fucking with me. Back to empty hand, he seemed harmless in comparison to what I knew now. There was only one way to finish this. I looked deep within myself, and called him out. The Order Avatar State. Chapter 26 Say I Couldn't Sleep. He looked around and noticed the darkness of dawn. His entire night had involved a lot of tossing and turning, something nagged at him on the back of his mind. He considered waking up before but decided against it. Maybe he just needed to take a walk, or fly around the island, flying was fun, or he could go visit the bloom birds. They came out in the morning in fact. Or, he could do all of the above. He just had to make sure that Big Brother Yotl didn't catch him. Now armed with what he thought to be a solid plan, the young boy got off his bed and flew out towards the beach. The sun was just peeking out from the horizon, the first rays hitting the gentle water and bringing about this untainted beauty that seemed almost magical. He was dressed in thin PJs and while that would have made anyone else shiver and cold, say I wasn't just anyone. He was the spirit of rebirth. 
He was fire incarnate. He sank his toes on the wet sand and giggled, feeling the ticklish effect the grains had on the underside of his feet. A few minutes of this, with most of his surroundings now visible, he floated up and gently started flying around the island just admiring his home. He loved his dad, his mum, his sisters and brothers and his home. If anyone tried to take any of that away from him, they would have to deal with his dragon breath. Say I imagine he was powerful like his dad, ready to fight for what he loved and believed in, ready to save people and protect him and their family. That's why he and Vor had begun to secretly train more. They needed to be strong enough for when their dad needed them. His flight path took him past the small cluster of Grango trees behind their house. He obviously dove down and grabbed a few before leisurely continuing on with his journey. He was just a short distance away from the bloom bird's orchid. A sort of plant-animal hybrid. The flowers bloomed in the morning in the shape of six-winged petal wings birds and took off, leaving a green stalk waving in the air. To stop any predators from getting too close, the plants emitted a sweet-smelling scent that caused hallucinations and increased paranoia to anyone. The most special thing about the flowers was how they seemed to appear out of nowhere. Ash and his siblings had found this place by chance and the instant when the bloom birds decided to ascend and take off was a sight to behold. He made it to the top of the hill overlooking the bloom birds and, frowned. Instead of the ascension of the pink, red and yellow flower birds, there was a dense groove of trees surrounding a pulsing cocoon with something vaguely humanoid inside. Say I blinked and flew closer, losing the frown on his face. Instead, an intrigued look came over it. He finally knew what was causing him to lose sleep. It was this thing. The closer he got the more his abilities reacted to the presence of the pulsing object, or rather what was inside it. Before he could get too close, vines from the forest started slithering through the ground forming up into something. Ash stopped right where he was as he went on guard. There was little chance of anything, animal or not hurting say I. This was his dad's realm after all, so he was not too worried. The vines formed up into a huge monstrous plant being with red eyes. Favored child, do not take another step, or you will risk destabilizing the mistress's rebirth. A deep but gentle voice rumbled out of the plant creature. Mistress? Rebirth? Ash shook his head. Interesting but not as much as the question burning him up from the inside. What happened to the bloom birds? He said pointing at the edges of the new strange forest, where the stalks of the bloom birds were left looking shrunken and missing the flowers. Swamp Thing blinked, wondering how it was going to tell the disappointed child that the bloom birds were merely energy gathering agents that the mistress had needed to complete her evolution. Think of solar panels, but instead of solar energy, they traveled to places with high density of ether and absorbed it to bring back to the cocoon. They had not noticed the cocoon before because it was hidden underground, but now that she was close to awakening, the bloom birds were no longer needed. Swamp Thing was aware that explaining it like that would not earn him any favors so it wisely kept quiet. The child started nagging him soon after and he ended up regretting his decision to stay silent. Elsewhere. Holly was finally going to get her answers, no more making wild guesses that did not even come close to the real truth. Somehow, someway, Dove had been chosen. Remade into a god, she was dazzlingly beautiful, incredibly powerful, Holly could remember her standing in front of the massive attack that had shaken the world and taken over her entire vision, Dove had swatted it away as if it was a nuisance keep up human. My objectives do not contain understanding why you are walking slower than a snail. Ha ha ha. The drone that was leading her to a teleport hub stated. She looked away to hide her mocking smile. Its attempts at copying human behavior were laughable. The drone was the first testing sample of a new concept Gaia had. Drones that could mimic human speech and mannerisms to help the wider population during special circumstances. Holly remembered the advertisement that had played on the sky and on the fast-developing Ethernet. So far she wasn't impressed by the Emphatho drone. It looked funny too. Having the upper portion of C-3PO, a robot from a popular franchise back on Earth called Star Wars. The lower portion ended in a dome-like shape with hovertech which was how it could fly. The robot had extra limbs woven from strong but highly flexible material to enable it to accomplish different tasks. The limbs were inside its chassis. Holly's thoughts drifted back to Dove. The world had changed, so she guessed having a sister who had superpowers was not too surprising. Still, she wondered if Dove was still the same Dove. The way she had looked at her that one time, it was like Holly was a distant acquaintance of hers. Holly reached the teleport hub quickly, managing to grab a glimpse of the newly constructed spiritual school. The fact that people could get abilities was a subject that was met with a lot of excitement as everyone wanted to be special. Holly too. 
We have arrived human. The drone informed her in an annoyed tone. Holly stopped before entering the teleport hub. Okay first of all, if you want to seem more approachable, ditch the word human. I know I am you don't need to keep reminding me. Secondly watch your tone, droid. Then she entered with a snort. The coordinates were already entered and in a sudden wash of color, Holly disappeared. Elsewhere. The Earth had been destroyed. The three legionnaires were the only surviving thing from the planet that had housed billions. They had been in New Genesis, following after Lawsid's trail, when it had happened and it laid witness to the god of evil Darkseid's death, something that would have only happened two years into the future in the original timeline. The fight had been a spectacle to watch and it reminded all them why Aiden was who he was. So they had failed their mission. The objective given had been to protect Superion as he would have become a central figure in the future, but now there wasn't even an Earth. They could not also use the Time Sphere to go back and try to change it either. Why? The three of them could not agree on the right course of action to take. Chameleon was proposing that anything that hadn't been directly caused by laws it was not something that they should have changed but rather the result of the changes that they had already made. He thought that going back to the past to change a new shift in time would strain the time continuum and have further detrimental effects in the future. Saturn Girl and Phantom Girl argued that it wouldn't matter what changes they made because if the desired result was not met then they had failed the mission and had to try again. The argument was almost over, with Chameleon agreeing with them when something happened. One instant they were inside their time sphere, when the next, it was being jerked away towards a certain direction. The pull had lessened as the environmental shielding programs activated. What's going on? Phantom Girl had asked with Saturn Girl's fingers flew over the keyboard. I don't know. Something pulled us out of. She trailed off once she managed to activate the time sphere's transparent mode, revealing the scene on the outside. They were not expecting what they saw. A man floating in outer space while staring at them. The time sphere had been warped from its location in a maintenance station on Mars to outer space. With wide eyes chameleon boy asked the other two. Is that his majesty? Before they could answer. Indeed it is. But I told you not to call me that. A new voice spoke up from the middle of the time sphere. The three legionnaires were spooked and turned to stare at the new arrival. Your majesty. They all bowed down. The prince had light green hair, red eyes and was standing at 6,8 feet. He was wearing a martial robe constructed from the toughest material that the 30th century could afford and underneath the orange robe was a white combat bodysuit. A very familiar symbol of the avatar was imprinted on the robe, just below the shoulder. Prince say I, sir. Satin girl raised up her head. What are you doing here, in the past? She wondered out loud. The aforementioned Prince say I smiled. To bring you home of course. Chapter 262, Horrid Everything Changed the Second Aiden called him out. White eyes opened to a world that was on the brink of collapse. He blinked, surveying the scene with a critical eye. There was no aura or a display of his considerable power, yet the minute his eyes landed on empty hand, the latter froze like a deer caught in headlights. What is this feeling? Empty hand asked himself, lifting up a single palm only to see it shaking. His eyes widened. Get ready. A bored voice said from the side. Empty hand slowly turned his head and established eye contact with him. Order stared back, unflinchingly and unimpressed. Empty hand felt his spirit waver under such a look. Huh? Empty hand tried to jump away only to feel his neck grasped in a vice grip. He choked, beginning to pry off the hold in panic. What was happening? Why was it happening? He stopped trying to overpower the palm holding his neck and instead began to power up bringing more of himself through the link Aiden still had with the great darkness. The realm began to shake more and more as darkness spilled out of Empty Hand in considerable amounts. Empty Hand's eyes blazed with black flames as he looked down at Order. You! No matter how much he tried, he still couldn't escape the hold. Order began squeezing his fingers. That won't work anymore. He told the panicking villain. Voice full of quiet confidence that one could have mistaken for arrogance. What, a what are you? The world overturned under Empty Hand's vision. His back smacked onto the grey ground, completely rupturing his veins, shredding his back muscles and breaking his spinal column. Order lifted what was left of the servant of the one below and scrunched up his nose in distaste. Gross. Silver fire poured out of his mouth and eyes, completely drowning the remains of Empty Hand under a torrent of flame. Nothing remained. Order floated in the air calmly, waiting. A few seconds later, as if remade from the sand itself, empty hand reformed himself. Ha ha ha, you cannot hope to defeat me. 
he sneered as his limbs formed, whole again. Instead of the fear and worry he was expecting, Order looked at him with the same blank expression. Then something shifted and a maniacal smile appeared on Aiden's face. Order craned his neck. I was counting on IT. Boom. The first fist that was thrown by Order completely turned empty hand into dust. A pressure blast that was so strong, the webs of energy covering Aiden's space of being grown to hold back the torrent of power. Empty hand came back again with a gasp. What? Then a hundred strikes landed on his body before he could react. Arr! A blast of darkness devoured the surroundings from him. Only for an explosion of light to completely submerge the darkness, destroy it and then go ahead to disintegrate empty hand. What was, he wasn't the one. Once more he appeared. This time Aiden's face took over his whole vision. He was fifty meters tall now, holding on to empty hand by the torso. The latter could not budge, only tremble in fear while shaking his head. No, no. How did you do this? It's impossible. I was in, ugh. The giant fingers around him began to squeeze. You finally caught on. The order state said, an out of character smile on its face. I am supposed to be his logic. But the prospect of endlessly killing you, brings a smile to my face. Order then opened his mouth, showing nothing but a chaotic swirl of power inside. Order particles clashing against each other to give rise to chaos and vice versa. Empty hand strained in futility. Master. Master help me. Call for him as much as you want, I have severed your connection with his domain. You're in my world now. Empty hand found this death to be even worse than before. He was shredded to nothing but the violent opposing forces when he was swallowed by the giant. Then when he came back, his eyes exploded in his skull, following that, his organs one by one met the same fate. The culmination was an explosion of energy the equivalent of a star. He still came back. A meteor shower burned him up to nothing. Each death was worse than the other and this went on for over a billion times. Time had effectively lost meaning. Order had cut the connection between the great darkness and his chaos side, effectively trapping empty hand in a cycle of death and rebirth, endlessly. A nigh-omnipotent being was imprisoned in the same mind he tried to raid. The tables were turned so drastically it was crazy. This was not a fight. Neither was it a beatdown. This was simply torture of the highest degree. And it went on and on and on and on. Order found himself loving the pained and tortured expression Empty Hand continuously displayed and after so long, the next instant Empty Hand died, he respawned as a shallow copy of his former being. Gone was the regal dark form standing at more than eight feet tall. Gone was the casual power he wielded almost contemptuously. The creature before Order was sickly and weak. It couldn't move its body or do much of anything. It wheezed in exertion at simply existing. What, what did you do? It managed to ask, on the verge of death. Order floated down slowly, touching on the ground before gliding across it, only to stop before the servant of the Dark One. You seem, surprised. Aiden's voice sounded out, layered with an undercurrent of power. My power. Without your connection to the Great Darkness, you are nothing. The Order State was feeling particularly chatty today. He bent down. Where is the powerful leader of the gentry? Where is the right hand of the natural opposite to everything? Where is the being that waved away Darkseid's attack with a crack of the universe as if it was nothing? Where is all your arrogance? Order held out a hand to the side and the despair in empty hand increased a thousandfold. The essence of his abilities, pure darkness roiled around in Order's hand. Yes, whatever your mind is trying so hard to refuse is true. No, give it, give it back. Empty hand weakly reached out towards Order's palm. Nope. Order shook his head. You wanted this, remember? Then he got up. Be comforted with the knowledge that I shall send your master into the nothingness after you. Order smiled. Now die. Order did something impossible. Equity was a chaos-attuned weapon. It held the whole mass of Aiden's chaos state. But Order had learned something from Aiden's memory. At high levels, due to the weighty realm of a concept or aspect of reality, a balance was needed to keep everything in check. That balance was maintained by a counterforce to naturally oppose an abstract or concept. Water to quench fire. The great darkness to counter the presence. There were exceptions to this rule but almost all things followed it in some form or other. That meant, equity could theoretically have its own opposite. The only thing left to do was call it out. Order energy, mystical and elemental in nature began to twist and clash in order's hand. Then with an ease that was highly deceptive of the difficulty in the dusk, a long white calligraphy brush appeared in his palm. MMMH. Fitting.
a brush to write in structure to the world, order and to disapprove that which we do not want. Order laughed, twirling the heaven-defying artifact in the air. Equity appeared in his other hand. Empty hand felt a pressure unlike any from both artifacts. The power they held was enough to make someone a menace for an entire universe. Order held both opposing artifacts in the air. One meant to bring about massive change but used to mostly cause havoc, and the other to give form, beauty and purpose to raw energy, order and chaos. I wonder what would happen if I brought them both together, fused in perfect harmony. Who could stand in my way? Lucifer? The Presence? The Great Darkness? We both know that is not our purpose, you are meant to be his reasoning, yet, in here where the walls separating us are thinner than paper, we are corrupting each other. My passion is eliciting true emotions in you, emotions that you cannot learn to control in such a short time, so pause and think before you do something you might come to regret later. The chaos state informed order, voice projected mentally. Order smirked. Whatever do you mean, I am he and he is me, you are us, so anything we think of doing, is something that he has already considered. He slowly brought both hands together. The sky darkened and became bright at the same time. The clash of both energies expressing themselves in his space of being through a separation in the sky. One side was dark and ominous, the other was blindingly bright. Order had ignored chaos words. His reasoning was that maybe emotions were good for him. They made him feel. He didn't feel before. Tremors soon after began to rock the world. The white and purple energy webs holding the whole realm together struggling to heal and preserve Aiden's self. Stop this madness. Chaos spoke up. This time his earlier bored tone was nowhere to be heard. In its place was a stern command, one that promised consequences if it were not followed. Or what? I have complete control here. What do you hope to achieve by ordering me to cease my actions? Actions that will serve him for the best. We both know of Aiden's track record. Maybe someone else needs to start making the decision around here. The distance between both artifacts grew smaller and smaller. Space splintered apart as the shock waves produced by Order's actions hit empty hand and with one last despairing attack completely destroyed him, essence and all. The servant of the great darkness perished. Imagine having enough power to never be afraid again, to never lose a fight, to never lose anything. We could be truly eternal. Order began to chuckle, getting animated while chaos stayed silent. Imagine having any woman we want. I know his thoughts, they're mine as well. His heart yearns for her. But his body, his body seeks out fulfillment that she alone cannot grant. To what end? Power is all well and good but that is such a shallow goal. He wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be happy and now that you're influenced by my emotions, you knows that sometimes no amount of power or prosperity can fill a hole that needs love and care. Chaos countered. Order did not relent. His face scrunched up in disgust. Love and care? Who needs that pile of shit? His face changed again. This time into a crafty expression. His tone took on a softer note. And besides, who says we cannot have it all? Power then love. I know he will thank me for it. He needs me. Just like he needed you when you decided to expel all chaos energy from the realm causing rifts across the mortal plane. Or the time you decided killing a galactic warlord was better than keeping the world safe. Following that choice, the planet was destroyed and now we're saddled with over a billion lives to think about. Chaos took a dig at him. Order paused. I prioritized our realm. What the fuck do you think would have happened had I not done what I did? I created the realm in the first place. Me. It wasn't you or Aiden. It was all me. He went silent, letting out a sigh. The weapons inched closer, both energies fighting each other while Order used his authority to bring about a stable fusion. In any case, we are all on the same team, I am doing this for us. Why can't you see that, you parasite? He softly asked, straining with exertion as he tried to bond the two artifacts. Stop. If you do this, you will destroy us all. You know nothing, so shut the fuck up or do something to try and stop me. The world began to actually crack apart. The overload of energy became too much to contain and Aiden's space of being was paying the price. Chaos attempts to stop the order state all ended up in failure. Veins appeared on Aiden's face as he yelled. The ground below cracked apart like an eggshell, the grains of sand making up the floor begun spilling through. More cracks spread like spider webs above the sky. Come oa oon. Ah, why won't, you, just, woo walk. With a sudden click, both artifacts touched each other. The whole realm exploded. Elsewhere. Gaia shook, 
Security failsafes activated with Gaia trying her best to stabilize the world on the brink of splitting apart. Everyone felt it. Something horrid had happened. Chapter 263, Marshalling Forces Lady Gaia, What is Happening? Yo, outfitted in full armor regalia inquired the second Gaia made herself known to all of them. A realm-wide alert was playing in the sky, warning everyone to stay indoors and avoid going outside. The whole world was in a frenzy. All the continents experienced earthquakes and other unnatural disasters caused by two extremes meeting and clashing upon each other continuously. Gaia had put all her effort into ensuring that the human continent was mostly protected from the worst of the disasters. On the other continent spurring the Skinead Island chain, Aiden's home island and the Lion Turtle Island that was at the center of everything, tornadoes, tsunamis and earthquakes wreaked havoc across the lands. Stopping them required energy. Energy that was not as readily available as before. Somehow getting more energy from the source was becoming an issue as the realm began to vibrate at different frequencies inconsistently, causing the link the core had to the source to sever. She was working on reinstating it but that seemed to be taking more time than they actually had. She was working on a faster backup plan. Which is why the sun was dimming. The sky lost its blue color. A darkness that seemed almost oppressive even from this far out began to swiftly overtake everything. Many animals died. Gaia used their life force as soon as it came through to add to the strength of the continental wide shielding to protect from the space debris and meteors caused by the explosion of the training planet Aiden had been on. Gaia spared some of her considerable computation power to investigate while trying to contact Aiden. The reason for the darkness, immediately shocked her, apart from her own actions with the sun, draining its energy to construct a shield around the planet and stop the calamities happening, something else was going on. She dropped her primary objective and warped space to appear before the cottage, sending an alert before she arrived. She was glad to see everyone waiting for her in various states of readiness. Yotl being the god of war was naturally the commander. They all bowed their heads at her once they sensed her presence. Then they gasped at the way she looked. Gaia was the realm, so any form she took reflected it. And right now she did not look okay. Her whole blue figure was filled with cracks that pulsed with different elemental energies. Lady Gaia what? Listen up. Things have taken a turn for the worse. I am engaging protocol doom day. What? Vata blinked in surprise. Surprise that was shared by every single spirit around. Right. Yotl nodded before turning towards Cory and the kids. My lady. You and the kids need to leave with Lady Gaia right now. Something is happening and before we figure out what that is, the safest place for you right now is at the core of the realm. No. Gaia told him, just as another tremor rocked the whole island. The core has been compromised. They need to get out of the realm in case we can't stop what is happening. She said urgently. Wait. Cory interrupted, hugging Kai and Breeze close to herself. Where's Aiden? Say I and the others perked up at that. They didn't know what was happening but that question was the only one that mattered. I want dad. Breeze whispered in a scared tone to Kai. The other girl patted her head in what comfort she could provide. Everything will be okay. Kai said. Yeah. Everything will be okay. Vor and I will protect you. We have been training, right Vor? Say I asked his brother as they hovered protectively over Cory and the girls. MMMH right? Vor nodded with a confidence he wasn't really feeling. Meanwhile a mental conversation had been going on during this time. What do you mean he is missing Gaia? How can he be missing? That's impossible. Cory replied in anger after what Gaia had told them. The sea was now almost too rowdy and the only thing that stopped the massive tsunami about to hit the shore and submerge the island was the shield Gaia had constructed around it. Please Lady Cory, if Gaia finds out anything about the master's whereabouts, the first person she is going to inform will be you. Right now we need to evacuate you and the children. Cory relented upon Yotl's reasonable words. Nodding in confirmation and agreeing to drop the subject was one of the hardest things she had ever done. You will go with Rava. She will protect you all. Gaia finished. A sleek spaceship looking very similar to a Martian bioship only bigger appeared on the beach next to them. It's similar to a Martian bioship but can travel at faster than light speeds due to the core which is constructed from stranium. I input a galactic map to show you where you need to go. Most of the highlighted planets are places where Aiden is worshipped as a god. It will be up to you to choose which one you want. Now hurry. Yotl ushered them inside the ship while staring at the sky with narrowed eyes. My sister. Rava asked Yotl only for the panther god to kiss her on her forehead in assurance. I will do everything I can to make sure that she is safe. 
A yellow portal that seemed unstable appeared under the bio ship the second Cory and the kids entered it. Cory looked back before the door closed. Good luck. She told them, her hands over her baby bump. Then the ship was swallowed by portal. The minute they disappeared, portals appeared all around the beach and coming out of them were Earth's heroes led by Superman. The entire Justice League and Justice Society barring those who were outside the realm lined up behind the premier members of the League, Batman, and Superman. The only one missing from the triumvirate was Wonder Woman. That was somewhat addressed when from another portal, Amazon warriors dressed in armor and carrying weapons came through another portal. The garnered attention as Ippolito and her people bowed their heads before Yotl. It will be an honor to fight alongside you, Lord. Yotl nodded in thanks. We gathered everyone here as soon as we could. What is going on? Superman asked. Yotl looked at Gaia and she took that as cue. She launched off into a short but shocking explanation. The entire realm is shifting between different layers of the void. At the clueless looks she was getting, she tried to dumb it down. Something ripped a hole in time and space, changing our vibration frequency and now we are connected to another universe. She pointed to the rapidly darkening sky. I am using the energy from the sun to construct a shield around the planet but, we have a big problem. The inhabitants of the universe we are connected to, seem to favor the dark, and they can sense us. They are coming our way. Are the civilians safe? Batman asked, already connected to the Ethernet using his wrist device. Gaia waved a hand, prompting a projected love feed to appear which showed the wide blue shimmering shield covering the entire world. Yes they are but we do not have much time. We need to make sure we hold back whatever is coming for us up until I can fix the positioning issue and hopefully get us back to our own lair. Where is Aiden? Red Arrow asked, causing murmurs to break out. He is the top dog after all. If anything he should be. The master is facing a much bigger threat than we are. Otherwise he would be at the forefront, ready to face this new challenge with great defiance. Do not besmirch his name. Yotl spoke up before Gaia could, his eyes shifting to their feline form. Red Arrow wilted under his gaze, looking away with a snort. So what's the plan? Superman questioned. The tremors and disasters had calmed down somewhat. The sun had dimmed from the loss of most of its power. Gaia had gone on total lockdown mode. The sky was still bright, owing to the shield of energy around the whole planet. Gaia brought out a map of the entire planet. Four huge continents with vast pools of ocean water in between. Batman walked forward and surveyed the map. What do your initial scans suggest on the number of enemies we are about to face? The map panned out wide, showing the planet and then thousands of blinking red dots coming out of a pulsing blue zone a few thousand miles away from the atmosphere of the planet where a hole in space had been ripped open. Someone sucked in a deep breath. This is going to be fun. Said Raph, twirling his say in his hands. Your idea of fun is different from mine. Donnie told his brother. The former shrugged. All these years together and you still haven't built a taste for it. I'm disappointed Donnie. Raph joked. SHH, Raph let's focus on how we're going to stay alive for the next hour or so. Leo shushed the both of them. How long till they arrive? The Flash wondered. 24 minutes, nothing more nothing less. Gaia quickly answered, her attention on priming the battle drones, which were only a little bit weaker than the ones guarding the Skinnyad Tower. After studying the maps some more, Yotl came up with a suggestion. I propose Lady Gaia open up the shield at this particular location. He pointed a finger at the farthest continent from the human populated one. That will allow them to focus on making it past us instead of bombarding other locations to try and breach the shield. Batman added, seeing the logic in it. Not to mention the opening will be small, they will not be able to bring through their full force. We can then focus on stemming the flow while Lady Gaia works on getting us out of here. They finished hashing out the rest of the plan, going through details such as placement and how to split the forces. Before Gaia could warp all of them to the location they had agreed upon, a few grey portals appeared on the beach. Oh you have got to be kidding me. Kid Flash muttered when from within the portal, Michael walked out. Following close behind him was a group of villains like Black Adam, Killer Frost, Deadshot, Shredder and his five mystics. Sorry for being late. Michael told Gaia. A few people needed to be convinced that they actually have helping spirits. Chapter 264, far from a couple billion years ago, a powerful comet smashed onto a small planet, just a few of hundred million years old. The planet orbited a relatively mature star. Its yellow light providing enough sustenance to have the potential for evolution of life from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms. 
Yet that was not as easy as it seemed. The planet lacked something, an essence to push that potential into state, an essence that was present in its closest neighbor. There were no dinosaurs or other prehistoric animals as one might expect when hearing about the age of the planet. It wasn't even the only planet orbiting the star system. It was the fourth, on that point, just like Earth. This fourth planet that would come to be known as Mars supported the potential of sentient life. Single-celled organisms was just the start. However its potential for evolution, as stated before fell short. It was not as strong as its neighbor. It seemed that life would end at single-celled organisms. Through some natural constraints, it would not jump the first hurdle. The first great filter. This planet was even more nondescript and not really noteworthy, when compared to the scale of the large universe. It was just, basic. But then, through the starlit canvas of the cosmos, a grey comet that had initially started out as something bigger than the very solar system, was streaking through space towards our unimportant planet. The meteor that smashed onto that small planet changed everything. The impact was an explosion of such high magnitude that every single trace of life on the surface of the planet was destroyed by the heat and pressure. The planet lost a third of its body, which were stones and rocks that would hover around it, revolving for years before forming into Mars' first moon. And those changes would shift a very important thing while strangely enough, as if fighting to keep its pre-written fate, nothing much else. The core of the meteor managed to dig deep into the crust of the planet, making it all the way to the core as a pulsing, huge boulder the size of a bus, only to eventually settle near the dense and hot core of the barren rock orbiting around the sun, healing. A couple million years would go by and caused by an esoteric energy wave not native to this universe, life would begin anew. Single-celled organisms would sprout and thrive, this time not on the surface of the planet but deep in it, on a self-sustained environment around the core. Roiling and twisting elemental energy gave rise to liquid water, oxygen, and everything else that could support life. A few hundred million years later and the first of the multicellular organisms would appear. Aquatic animals inside the water pools or near the core. The heat and gravitational force from it was nullified by a very weird phenomenal. Mystical energy. Magic. It seemed that the conditions for life had only been a side effect of this. The conditions were very similar to those found on Earth. A few more hundred million years would see the eventual evolution from aquatic animals to land-walking beasts. A true split had occurred. Another billion years would pass and whether it was by fluke or planned by some higher power, the environment would enter the dinosaur age. And the first phase lasted over 300 million years, the second a little over 500 million years. During that time, the third planet, Earth had similarly evolved and realized its potential for sentient and then sapient life. The surface of Mars on the other hand was barren and dry, seen from space or even on the planet itself, the soil was red and lifeless, wind storms buffeted the landscape constantly, it was uninhabitable. But someone knew that to not be true, a powerful being noticed the energy signature coming off the planet. Modern day scientists would term this energy as dark matter, not really having a good explanation for what this detected energy was. The Sorcerer Supreme of the time. Agamotto part of the triumvirate known as the Vishanti would use his prodigious mystical abilities to construct a dense energy shield around the core of the planet. Having sensed the alien quality of what was contained in the core, he knew the dangers and opportunity it presented. He would regularly come to check on the binding spell, regularly update and maintain it, fixing matters such as energy containment which was the prevalent issue, and Agamotto would meditate upon the mysteries contained in the energy. He would learn not to harness it but to guide it using his own spirit. Agamotto would spread these teachings to the sorcerers under him, instructing them upon the two main branches of this energy that they could connect to just as easily as dimensional powers. Yet this energy was much more powerful and seemed to possess no limits aside from the user's own ability to handle this train on their souls. The mystic power branches were thus split into, dimensional energies, personal energies, universal energies and the avatarian practices. The two main branches developed from this new branch of magic called avatarism, were elemental magic and anti-natural mystic energy. The first was self-explanatory. They could connect to any of the main branches of the elements, wind, fire, water, and earth. Earth however seemed to be weaker. There were many theories about this but the main one was the one proposed by Agamotto. He thought that maybe earth magic was weaker because of the elder god Iskari a limiting control over the element. This led to those who agreed with this theory to also propose that the reason why Gaia would do that was perhaps because avatarism came from a god. Just like how gods granted special humans powers maybe they were blessed by a god to wield this gift. Maybe avatarism came from the avatar. 
that unpopular belief would see the very first split between the sorcerers. Staunch practitioners of avatarism abandoned dimensional and universal energies to focus on avatarian practices. They walked with the world and became known as druids. The field of elemental magic was further developed when druids and sorcerers discovered they could use subskills related to the four elements. Fire had lightning, combustion, plasma, heat and many others. Wind was cloud magic, which was extensively used to control the weather and cause rain to fall on arid areas, and its other subsets like sound. Water too had its own subskills, though the users struggled to access its subskills apart from mist, ice and healing. Earth element only saw marginal success. However after a few hundred years, the druids and sorcerers who remained persistent and stubborn were able to cultivate subskills such as magma magic, gravity manipulation for unassisted flight, crystal magic which was highly sought after and even plant magic. On to the second category, the anti-natural mystic practices were magical disciplines that worked directly to oppose or significantly alter a natural phenomenon. There were two categories in this practice, chaos and order mystical energy. A power that had no limit. Ten sorcerers could use order to cast a planet-wide spell and change anything from laws of nature that governed the continued existence of life to the life the planet itself contained. They could make themselves gods. Likewise, ten sorcerers of sufficient strength could destroy an entire planet, submerge it in darkness by using chaos mystical energy freely. This was the true golden age of sorcerers. Even powerful eldritch abominations seeking dominion over the earth were not too challenging for them. They fought with skill and power, the practices of the avatarism, the name coined by Agamotto enabling them to stand on par with a young Odin fresh off his conquest of the Nine Realms. But such power often breeds greediness and just before Agamotto's ascension, one of his students decided to take over forcefully. He wanted to fuse order and chaos magicka and become the most powerful sorcerer to ever walk the earth. Not even Agamotto could combine the two. They were opposing sides, two extremes that clashed heavily. There was no way to safely get them working together. Agamotto had tried it over his thousands of years of existence but each time he ended up with failure. His student was just as determined as Agamotto had been and far less nice about it. Death raged across the whole world as his student, the very first sorcerer termed as a dark mage, tried everything from the dregs of divinity from evil realm lords such as Dormammu and Chthan, to contracts with demons. He learned the teachings of the Tao from the eastern side of the globe and supplemented these teachings with the shamanism from Africa and North America. He became a very experienced druid, able to use all four elements easily. He waged a campaign of death all in a bid to surpass his master and become the one true mage. But Hagamoto was far stronger, far more experienced and after giving him countless chances to redeem, far more merciless. The conflict culminated in a legendary battle that caused the oceans to boil, land to crack and the whole planet to tremble. Agamotto finally won. And after that he realized the dangers of the anti-natural mystic energy and added another spell to the core of Mars. The spell restricted any magical practitioner from ever accessing both magicka. He made sure to pass down the role of monitoring the spell work and ensuring it did not break to his successor. Agamotto ascended and a new sorcerer supreme took charge. Years passed. The Sorcerer Supreme title had been passed down over three times by now. A group of powerful beings created by an even more powerful group of beings known as the Celestials arrived on Earth. This new group was humanoid and possessed powers that were different from conventional power systems like dimensional energies, personal energies like Chi and Avatarism. They were known as the Eternals. They were directly empowered by their creators with something called cosmic energy and were charged with one specific objective. The destruction of alien creatures preying on the young human race, called deviants. They carried out this mission almost religiously, taking over humankind's development and increasing it by decades while hunting down large concentrations of deviants and ending them. Some of the astute ones noticed the absolutely staggering energy pulsing from Mars, the fourth planet on the solar system and they all decided to inform their master, a celestial known as Arisham. He ordered them to maintain a strict observation on the planet but not do anything else. The sorcerers, druids and this new group of beings called the Eternals understood each other and continued on with their separate but similar missions. The Eternals learned a lot about humanity, how fickle and selfless they could be. There was as much potential for good in them as bad. They settled among them learning their ways. They became hailed as gods. And that caused them to lose sight as they grew to love humans. Then tragedy struck and nothing was ever the same. A huge war sprang up that claimed the lives of countless humans. They had used the gifts of science gifted to them to wage war. The Eternals split up and retreated to different parts of the world. 
more years passed, empires like Rome and Ottoman rose up and fell. Nations sprang up as democracy became a thing and the globe became more connected. The industrial era arrived and brought with it new ways of doing things. Men braved the seas in long voyages to distant lands. World War I begun and passed. World War II begun and brought with it more death and more advance in science. Humanity's creation, an atomic bomb claimed the lives of a lot of people, destroying cities and leaving behind biological defects in the survivors and their descendants. The year 2000 arrived. Deep within the core of Mars, something stilled. Something ancient and incomprehensible. The Vishanti felt it in their dimension. The All-Father Odin immediately went on a long Odin sleep in preparation. Arisham gave the Eternals new orders and the time for their reunion grew closer. The mad titan Thanos started having nightmares and dreams that made no sense. The Ancient One opened her eyes from where she was meditating. On a barren red-soiled planet that housed the very thing she had been using to keep herself alive, she gazed down and felt her heart skip a beat. He was waking up. Chapter 265, The Dark Arm Necron, Nurin, Ares, Doomsday, Upside Down Man, Eclipso, Dark Sid and finally, Empty Hand, all powerful aspects of the great darkness, four of whom had grudges against Aiden Strong, three of whom had died, and been brought back by the great darkness infinite and terrifying power. The three of them stood behind the plague of creation, an army made from the great darkness, an army that consisted of foul beings with no ounce of remorse. From demons to eldritch abominations, some with powerful dark magics while others with bodies that induced nightmares and insanity upon all who bared witness to them. Yet the dark army was only the first wave of enemies that Gaia had to face. Fraden's realm had been unlucky enough to have a rift in space that connected to Earth-7, the gentry's base of operations. And the first wave was nothing before the power of those who stood behind them, Intellectron, Demogagon, Lord Broken, Hell Machine, Dame Merciless and although broken and destroyed by order, the right hand of the Great Darkness sat on a throne in the war-torn world of Earth-7. An empty hand was full of hate towards the one who made him fail his master. In a different timeline, the Super Judge, last monitor of the multiverse would have arrived, answering a distress call and proceeded to give his life for the last surviving member from that Earth. This time things were different. Empty Hand completely decimated the group of heroes from that universe in anger at his loss in Aiden's hands. Aiden had fast turned from the biggest investment of the Great Darkness to its biggest hindrance towards remaking the multiverse in its own image. With the last of its influence on Chaos Energy, the Great Darkness managed to take advantage of the explosion caused by Aiden's two states fighting to connect the realm with his seat of power in the physical world. Empty Hand gave the order, and the Dark Army answered with Aiden's pantheon. The full force of those standing ready to defend what was their home, temporary or not was not as big as you would expect. Aiden's pantheon and family were first in the lineup. They had changed location to the ideal battlefield according to the plans they had drawn up. And it was now time to defend. Before the spirits and gods was the mother of the realm, Gaia. She was glowing blue while pulsing out her energy to attract the horde towards their position. Yotl turned to address the masses of gathered heroes. We only need to hold on for an hour or so. After that, we will have one. Stay on your toes and do not allow yourself to be cornered. Then he turned back around, changing forms into his humanoid panther war god form. The air became charged with a certain kind of energy and a few seconds later, a blue shield materialized in the sky, rippling into visibility as the first wave of attacks landed. Superman floated in midair using his supervision to see past the shield. His eyes widened. My god. He frowned, looking at his companions below. They're here. And they are many. Most of the heroes and villains gulped. Steady Lady Gaia. Yotl said, holding up his arm. The shield started flashing dangerously. I feel like taking my chances with the Hololens. Deadshot joked to Killer Frost. Too late for regrets now. Superior replied to him, body clad in a red cloak of energy. Wait. Yotl added. The shield was now reacting to the bombardment by ripping holes in other places around the globe to provide more energy to the point in the shield that the Dark Army wanted to pierce through. Ah, any time now. The Flash yelled, he like the others saw that it was just a matter of time before the shield was completely overwhelmed. Wait. Yotl refused. A bead of sweat fell down Kid Flash's forehead. Just a little more. Artemis' fingers turned knuckle white around her crossbow. Just as it seemed that the tension could not get any higher, Yotl finally gave the command. Now, open it up. 
The shield rippled like water as it opened up, revealing darkness and terrifying forms. The hearts of everyone skipped a mighty beat. These are things, were scary. Imagine the trench DNA spliced up with xenomorph DNA their energy signatures were just as bad as their monstrous forms. They came with varying sizes and seemed to surf on a tide of darkness. With the rift opened up, it seemed as if they were going to spill right through. A flash of lightning left everyone's eyes momentarily blinded as Vata made his move. A divine aura that has elements of dream energy blazed out of him. He had suddenly powered up to his true god form for just a single instant, wary to leave the mortals fighting on their side insane or blinded by witnessing the true body of a god. Begone. Black lightning, in the shape of one massive storm, streaked through the sky, with a thunderous roar. The alien creatures from the Dark Army thought they had succeeded in making it inside only to be completely shocked, literally, by the unexpected planet buster attack. 50% of the aliens near the opening in the shield turned to ash and were instantly destroyed. The shock waves produced drowned the next 25%. Holy. April O'Neil begun. Crap. Shit. Co. None of that can describe what we just witnessed. Leo added. That was severely cool. Mikey agreed. Don't get too happy so soon, look. Superion warned them. Despite the attack having enough power to destroy the Earth a 100 times over, it didn't even dent a portion of the true numbers in the Dark Army. Oh my god. Zadara said. A second later, he grabbed the helmet of fate held in between his arm and chest, ready to wear it. Are you sure? Batman asked from the side, two battle drones flanking his side. He had linked them to his wrist computer and could remotely control them. Yes. Zatara answered with conviction. He was doing this to ensure Zatanna and the rest had had a fighting chance. He wore the helmet. A blast of Ordo mystical energy washed out into the surroundings, the Lord of Ordo taking the helm. Will it be enough? Batman asked himself, eyes cast towards the sky. Past the shield opening. An endless army of dark beings swarmed towards the mouth of the rift and behind them were a few very notable individuals, stripped of their wills. Darkseid, Nren, Ares, and Doomsday. The day of reckoning had arrived. Elsewhere. Overload. Overload. Host condition critical due to unstable energy signatures volatile pattern. Warning. Mind erasure eminent. Warning. Physical vessel deterioration eminent. Warning. Soul eradication eminent. Deploying countermeasures, lesser miracles exhausted. Condition Starby. Warning. Personality disassociation observed. Preserving true self. Failed. Preserving memories. Failed. Preserving essence. Question mark. Domain incompatibility observed. Overload. Explosion eminent. Emergency energy reserves exhausted. Requesting for faith energy. Initiating, initiating. Initiating, zero worship is found. Running diagnostics. Spatial positioning, unrecognizable. Warning, soul deterioration occurring at an unprecedented rate. Complete function loss. True death in T-6 seconds. 5. 4. Incoming transmission. New stable energy source detected. Commencing repairs. Time until repairs are complete colon 2,860,689,041 years. Commencing hibernation protocols. Transmission saved. The year was 567 AD. The Sorcerer Supreme of that time had a dream. A dream that prompted him to get up and visit the Time Stone. The dream was of a vision that on the surface made no sense, yet underneath the obscurity, foretold a terrifying omen for the future. A flock of doves fighting against a blood-red and blue hawk with regal weight and a wingspan that stretched out for millions of miles, covering the whole sky. Its slashes instantly tore the world apart, destroying the flock of doves and revealing a powerful creature in the shape of a fearsome serpent at the center of the destroyed earth. The serpent and the hawk fought in a short battle. The serpent could do nothing as it was torn apart into dregs of flesh by the hawk's powerful claws. The hawk then turned to the Sorcerer Supreme's observing eyes and once he looked deep inside those blazing orbs of majestic power, Merlin's legs shook as his knees lost strength. He saw a righteous fury. An anger that would consume the world, would, not could. He felt more than just insignificant, he felt empty. Thief. The word instantly jolted him out of sleep. He walked into the library of Kathmandu and perused any details he could find on what he had just dreamt of. His powerful spells that could pierce through time and space even without the time stone or the space stone revealed nothing, and no amount of reading showed him what he wanted.
No, needed to see. He finally settled for the last option, looking into the future through the time stone. That's when things began to make more sense in the most nonsensical way possible. Every timeline that had the chance of occurring was laid bare for his eyes to see. And every one of them showed him the same thing. The year 2000 would start the countdown to the end of the world. Merlin was shocked, appalled and heartbroken. That was 1,500 years into the future, long after he would have died and his body rotted. Yet, he could not let that be humanity's fate. What about everything he had worked for to ensure the protection of his species? Was it all for nothing? Merlin made a decision. He pushed himself past the recommended limit, delving deeper into the time stone and what it revealed, seeking an answer. Any answer, to what was going to be the fall of humanity. An acolyte found him in his quarters, eyes bleeding. His gaze empty, of hope and life, the singularity had drained him of both. On a parchment of paper, he'd written. Do not fight it, once he awakens, fire shall burn down the vast forests, water shall freeze and boil, windstorms shall ravage the land bringing with it despair, the earth will crack and swallow everything. Heed my plea, do not fight the man in purple and white. The ancient one finished her explanation, she took a sip of her tea and stared at the two Ezers sitting before her listening with rapt attention and in the case of Thor, a small skepticism. That is why I need your father to honor the promise he made to Agamotto. The time has come for the Avatar to awaken and in case things do not go favorably, Asgard's help will be invaluable. And you said coming to Earth was going to be boring. Loki told his brother. Chapter 266 The strength Aiden's family Varric ran around the lab like a headless chicken, checking over the functions of each of the machines. Will you just settle down? Luther asked, a little miffed. The former billionaire was dressed in a white shirt whose sleeves were folded slightly and fiddling with a loose screw on the huge energy harnessing machine holding within it a piece of spirit vine. S-H-H. I'm trying to think, Varric turned to Zuli. Do the thing. He yelled, lowering his googles and typing out another simulation run. Zuli turned on the switch to begin the process as Varric monitored the rising energy levels. Yes, yes, it's, it's working. His words trailed off as the gauge made it all the way to 70% before quickly and swiftly falling down to zero. No no no. He banged his head on the screen of the monitor. What happened now? He looked around, activating diagnostic runs. I told you there was an 80% chance of failure. Luther told him, stepping away from the machine holding the now dried up spirit vine. I don't understand, Varric said, throwing his hands in the sky. The machine works. Energy conductivity and storage are at a 100% efficiency level. Only the spirit vine itself is not rising up to dusk. Untapped clean renewable energy and we can't even use it. He raged throwing away the spanner in his hands. Luther looked on at the man's antics. We can figure something out. No need to act childishly. Actually, I have a theory. Zuli spoke up, grabbing the attention of both genius men. To his credit, Varuk was too mentally tired to tease her. She tapped a few keys on the pad and sent it to the holographic feed projector. The integrity of the energy source decreases once the energy harness reaches 60%. In other words, sir, this particular spirit vine is not strong enough to hold in and produce the kind of energy we need. Varok finished in a eureka moment. Then perhaps, I can help out. Gaia's voice came through the comm systems just as she appeared from a portal. Behind her was a green-colored girl with cherry-red lips, a curvy body and a majestic presence that seemed to wash out into the surroundings. Luther, Varuk and Zuli felt almost overwhelmed as the girl looked around, a carpet of vegetation beginning to cover their surroundings. How about we make the spirit vines stronger then? If they are durable enough to handle the load, then we might just make it out of here without resulting to some desperate measures. Gaia proposed. Varuk and Luther looked at each other, agreeing to work together. Elsewhere. Superman blitzed past a troop of harpy-like creatures, his heat beams shooting out of his eyes landing on some of them, lightning the load attacking Black Canary. Canary took that opportunity to flip away from the rest, landing on a platform created by Green Lantern before releasing a wide sonic scream that threw away the harpies and devastated the surrounding areas. John Stewart completed the construct he was making which turned out to be a fly swatter, swinging it after Canary had jumped away. It landed on a wolf pack whose coats emitted a corrosive darkness that dripped onto the ground. The swatter threw them away, producing a pressure blast that fire took advantage of to increase the intensity of her flames. 
a tornado made up of fire started wreaking havoc on the enemy's side, carrying away monsters and burning them into ash. She then pushed her hands to the ground, turning the tornado into a carpet of flames that covered the ground, flowing to devour blackened twigs and trees growing from the dead corpses of the Dark Army. Black smoke rose up from the ground. Using the cover of the smoke, Batman pressed a key on his wrist watching the drone on his side started shooting plasma bolts at the Dark Army. A shield made of blackened earth rose up to block the plasma bolts. However Ice and Killer Frost stepped forward, both having the same idea and pushed both of their arms out. The ground below them was covered by frost before huge chunks of ice speared past the earth dome. Darken ran forward, using her darkness to travel through the shadows in place. She flashed in between a group of orc-like creatures and tightened her hands into fists. Tentacles made of darkness speared out of the shadows, killing and maiming over twenty of the orcs. She swept her hands to the side and from the dead orcs, shadowy forms rose up, wearing the same armor and resembling the dead orcs. Well done Darken. Michael spoke to her mind, then he showed her something that lit a fire under her. The mental image of her father in chains atop a peak overlooking a world of lava. See me after this, I have a present for you. Michael added, causing a smile to appear on Darken's face. Finally. The shadow orcs began attacking their compatriots, and each shadow that fell, rose anew under Darken's power. Insolent. A massive form fell on the shadow orcs, crushing them under its feet. The new figure was revealed to be a bony giant wearing samurai armor, with a massive katana and green burning eyes. An undead one. Nabu commented. He's mine. He went through a dozen hand seals and the space between the undead monster and page increased dramatically as space folded. Lord of Order. Die. The skeleton managed to see Dr. Dot Faith's form flying towards it from a long distance away. It raised the katana in its hands only for a flash of light to appear in midair. The skeleton found both of its arms cut off at the elbow. Yotel's raised hand grabbed the axe that had flown back after the attack. Dr. Dot Fate managed to take advantage of the opening and create an ankh that was shaped into a huge sword. He threw it and watched as it penetrated the undead's chest before blowing it up. The Flash managed to run and jump towards the massive falling katana that was taller than him. His hand flashed with scarlet lightning as he pushed the pommel of the katana towards a gathering army of small imp-like creatures. Lightning covered the katana in a coat of erratic energy. It cut through the air and dug into the ground before the small creatures. The energy overloaded and an explosion of the built-up lightning washed out into the surroundings, frying the creatures and leaving behind the blackened sword. Enough. A shout escaped from the open rift in space. The fighting ceased as four individuals made themselves known. They fell towards the ground and landed in one massive stomp. The whole open plains of where they were fighting rumbled upon their arrival. The Dark Army made way for them to pass through. Moving back to separate from their opponents, body pulsing with the mysteries from the great darkness, Darkseid floated forward, arms held behind him. Flanking his sides were Rares, Nren, and Doomsday. Lady Gaia, how soon until we get out out of here? Yotl inquired, twirling his godly weapon. I'm working on it, keep them occupied for twenty minutes or so. She answered. Yotl looked at the new arrivals and smiled. We can do that. He looked to his side at Vatu. The god was floating in the air, just waiting for Yotl's order. He had also noticed the new arrivals, his head turned as he stared back at Yotl. An unspoken conversation occurred in between them. A new plan began taking effect. Spiritual energy and divine energy started roiling off Vatu in waves of purple light. The whole battlefield turned to stare at the light show. Yotl then turned to his right and saw Michael, removing his black tuxedo coat. Michael nodded at his brother, folding the sleeves of his shirt all the way to the elbows, revealing intricate tattoos that had every sin and immoral act written in black color. He also loosened his tie. If Vatu was like a walking talking shining beacon of light, Michael's darkness seemed to suck everything inside it. Allies and enemies alike knew, even without saying anything that something was about to happen. Doomsday. Superman said, eyes shining with a red light and face scrunched up in anger and fear. Doomsday roared and exploded forward, breaking the ground underneath his foot from the force of the lunge. Wait Kryptonian. Michael told Superman before he could fly forward. We will handle this. Michael's steps were slow and steady. A pair of black gloves appeared around his hands, formed from his tattoos, announcing sins, immorality and suffering. Doomsday was like an unstoppable force as barreled forward. The contrast was almost laughable. Doomsday's massive spiked form 
eyes full of madness and hate for everything against an unassuming 6,1 young man whose presence scared everyone around. Doomsday's first strike was a heavy fist that caused the air to scream as it was torn apart. Everyone thought Michael was done for. Everyone except for the ones who knew him. Yotel smiled knowing that the fight was basically over. Doomsday's fist landed on Michael's open palm. Nothing happened. All that power had been sucked away into nothing by one of the countless sins Michael had control of, gluttony. Doomsday blinked its eyes in shock. Then it pulled back its other hand to throw another attack. Michael's other hand landed on its chest. A curse of murder, the act of taking a life in cold blood, jumped off his right glove and entered Doomsday, destroying his heart and shredding his brain. All his functions ceased as organs failed. Over a dozen more curses attacked its body, dismembering its limbs and other body parts. Everyone was shocked as the rotten body of Doomsday fell to the ground. Michael looked to his front, using his hand to sweep away his long normally groomed hair out of his eyes. That ladies and gentlemen. He smiled a wide vicious grin. Well that was just the opening act. He stepped over the corpse of his foe, walking towards the increasing numbers of the Dark Army, pouring in from the rift. Blasphemy of the highest order, Michael stated, stretching his hands out. Thinking that you could dare face off against the forces of the Avatar, Master of Chaos and Order, Godkiller, Demon Bane, Aiden fucking strong. Yotel looked at Vata from the corner of his eyes. Are you ready, brother? He asked. The plan was going off without a hitch. Just a few more seconds. Vatu answered. If this plan worked then fighting them would become much easier. Michael stopped a short distance away from the Dark Army. The split between the two forces was a long stretch of land, separating both groups from each other. On Gaia's side there were no more than 1,000 fighters, a mix of the world's heroes and the Amazonian warriors. On the other side, there were more than 10,000 in the force that had made it through the shield. So here's my question, what kind of torture do you want for your eternal damnation? Chapter 267, Darkness She came from a world of both green and metal. Of fresh air and smog. Of destruction and rebirth. A world where she fought for a worthy cause and received condemnation. Known as Poison Ivy, the public looked at her and saw a villain. A terrorist. And the truth was, they weren't wrong. She was exactly that. Someone selfish. Someone who only cared about her children her plants. Yet therein laid the conflict. She had still been human. A part of her at least. Before the green reached out and offered to get rid of the crushing loneliness Pamela Eilie had grown up with. Now she was something else. Her evolution had gone perfectly. She was no longer human, at least not under our microscope. Gaia had prompted a change. A change that was not only physical but mental and emotional as well. She was no longer Pamela Eilie, or Poison Ivy. She was the mistress of the green. She was Gaia's child, one born out of a need for the last dregs of the Parliament of the Green to continue a legacy. And she would not fail her new family. This, the mistress of the green, the spirit of plants, swore on her new name, Iva. It's stable. Luther stated, looking at the readings displayed on the terminal. The energy harnessing machine was working perfectly to siphon out the spirit power before yielding it to a powerful power battery with an audium core. The spirit vine is holding up. No degradation of its biomaterial. Zuli spoke up as well. Of course. Iva said with an undercurrent of arrogance. She smiled lovingly at the spirit vine in the machine. My child is more than capable of such a trivial task. Incredible. Varok said over her shoulder, startling Iva so much that she screamed, created a vine from her palm and slapping him away with it. Sir. Zuli shouted in concern as Varok smacked onto the walls of the chamber, before sliding down comically. He raised a thumbs up. I'm okay. Varok wheezed getting up and shaking his head. Why would you startle me like that? Iva asked. A sunflower seed fell down from her red hair and immediately sprouted into the form of a hulking monster made up of green skin and a mane of sunflower petals across its face. It wore the rough bark of a tree across its body as an armor of some kind and was seven feet tall with a square face and red eyes. Mistress, I sensed your distress. Who do you want me to fuck up? The being that had been earlier known as Swamp Thing asked. Luther blinked his eyes. What? No one. I am fine now. Iva breathed in and released a slow breath to calm herself down. Okay, holler if you need me to fuck someone up. Then the creature exploded into a bunch of rose petals across the room, bringing with it an aromatic scent. Lex looked around and realized he was surrounded by crazy people. 
Zuli was fussing over Varric, even going as far as trying to stick a thermometer on his. Luther looked away from their antics. His eyes landed on a new arrival. Iva, Gaia had introduced her. Poison Ivy, he knew her by. Luther was fascinated by her new change and more than that, her enhanced abilities. Complete and total control over plants, her chlorokinesis is even more enhanced than when she was plain old Poison Ivy. Luther observed. His words prompted her to look at him. You have something to say Luther? She asked with narrowed eyes. Luther smiled. Is that any way to greet an old friend, Ivy? He drawled, charm oozing out of him. It's Iva. And I do not remember you and I ever being friends, Luther. She answered irritated. Zuli and Varok looked at each other. Is this really the time to do this? Zuli asked. Luther bit down on the urge to call them out on their bullshit. They were even more easily distracted than he was. Then again, he had long decided to suffer the company of folks with limitations of the mental kind. Everyone was stupid, that was just the way of the world. The smile on his face slipped off, as his stern business persona came to the forefront. Fair enough. He said. But we're now on the same team. Let's not forget that. Iva said nothing in response, merely turned to the spirit vine. Luther what are the readings? Vara cast just as a tremor rocked the building. There was still a fight going on. And Gaia was relying on them to come up with a way to ensure that this worked. He needed this to work. It's... Luther went silent, his eyes widening slightly in shock. It's working. The statement made the rest stare at each other in surprise. We actually did it. Zuli said, launching herself to hug Varric. Of course it was going to work. I never doubted it. Varric answered returning the hug. Then he cleared his throat and stepped back, trying to look nonchalant at the contact between him and Zuli. Okay, Zuli. Do the thing. He ordered. While a little disappointed, Zuli was quick. Right away sir. ga e e e She shouted. Elsewhere. The Dark Army all stood before Michael. Behind the Warden of the Hololens was a mega-huge phantom of a Dementor with hundreds of limbs and eyes. Fear has no place inside a god. Ares spoke up, pointing his warhammer at Yotl. You have something of mine, give it back, dog. The insult grated on Yotl's nerves but he knew it was only just a matter of time. The Dark Army's forces were steadily increasing. They were now numbering in the 15,000s and Gaia's forces were getting restless. You and I have no true enmity. Your master is a creation of the Great One himself. Give up and live. Fight and die. Darkseid's voice boomed out. Sheesh, get a breath mint will ya? Michael said, waving his palm across his face. Batman surveyed the scene, feeling that something was off. Michael traded insults with Darkseid but did not attack. Michael's own power and the easy way he dispatched Doomsday, someone even Superman could not be tacted as deterrent and the Dark Army did not attack. But still, Batman got the sense that that wasn't the whole picture. There was no way all 15,000 plus, dark creatures could be intimidated by one person. The other inconsistency was Vatu. The dude was openly glowing while holding a purple energy sphere in between his hands, charging it. The attack seemed simple and small but even Batman and the rest could feel just how deadly the power contained inside was. Yet, it didn't seem to cause the same reaction of caution in the Dark Army. No feelings of danger were elicited. It was as if, their instincts did not warn them. A look at Michael and Batman understood why. Unseen by most, Michael's shadow had sprouted over thousands of limbs and stretched out towards the Dark Army through the ground, touching each of their shadows. He was manipulating their emotions, Batman theorized. Making them wary to attack but not wary of the attack Vatu was openly charging. None of them even noticed that they were falling into a trap. Batman gulped, re-evaluating Michael's threat level. He could control emotions perfectly. What else could he do? Back to the plan itself. It did not make sense that the reason for stalling the enemy was simply so that Vatu's attack could land. There had to be something else. Yotl might have looked like all brawn but Batman has seen beyond that facade. Inside was a very shrewd mind. It was eye-opening, all of Aiden's loyal subjects were just as terrifying as him. Bruce decided to find out if his conjectures were right, so looked at Martian Manhunter and the green alien understood what he wanted. You are stalling. Why? Batman asked through the mental link, Manhunter had created with Yotl. Just wait for it. Yotl answered. Any minute now, brother. I do not think I can handle this any longer. Vatu warned Yotl. Batman narrowed his eyes, Yotl had let him hear that. Everyone, be on the ready. 
He used Martian Manhunter to spread the warning to the rest of the forces. Gaia. Yotl muttered, time was running out. The twenty minutes she had asked for were almost over. Darks had narrowed his eyes. They were planning something. Something. Now. Gaia's shout came through. Vatu. Now. Vata heard the order and quickly finished charging the power from the chaos side, divine side and spirit side inside him, into the purple ball of destruction in between his hands. One, condensed with the power from three very potent energies. The ball shot off towards the dark army and it seemed as if it was going to land on Darkseid when the attack suddenly ascended under Vatu's control. The opening in the shield above them instantly closed once the ball of destruction made it through. Gaia could now pull in power from a new source, a spirit vine enhanced by the mistress of plants and using it, they could retaliate properly. The shield closing had cut off the 15,000 forces away from the bulk of their army which numbered in the trillions. The ball was so powerful, none of the ones it passed could even feel or sense it. Hundreds of thousands, then millions, eventually billions of creatures from the dark army succumbed to the shroud of roiling energy surrounding the ball as it hurtled through space. The power contained inside had reached a whole new level. It was akin to one of Aiden's serious attacks, and taking into account that Aiden could destroy a galaxy, that was saying something. The ball destroyed everything in its path, as it barreled forward towards its target, controlled not to shift its trajectory by Gaia herself. The target was the hole in space, leading to another universe. The minute the ball of energy reached the torn space, connecting Gaia and Universe 7, the whole realm shook and trembled as Gaia teleported the whole realm back to its own lair of the void, far removed from the DC multiverse, far from the Great Darkness influence. Darkseid, Nren, Ares and the rest of Empty Hands forces understood that things had just taken a turn for the worst. They were not only cut off from reinforcements, they could not even sense the rest of their forces. In a desperate bid to destroy them before they were overwhelmed, they all attacked. Omega beams bigger than before, enhanced by the great darkness came out of Darkseid's eyes. The former new god yelled out in exertion as the beams took on a dark red color, taint of divine weapon constructs from Ares flashing with black lightning shot out of the god. A large beam of destructive demonic energy blazed out of Nirin, the edges lined with hellfire. Now if Vata had the most destructive abilities out of Aiden's divine spirits, then Yotl was the opposite. His defense capabilities were his strongest point. A shield made of ornate gold covered his front fully. Then it expanded into a dome of golden energy that covered all his allies and himself. All those attacks slammed onto the shield, heavily. The attacks failed to make it through. Instead of bouncing off and washing out into the already devastated surroundings, the shield started consuming them. Yotl felt his own divine reserves refill as the energy in the attacks was converted and consumed. Then he added those reserves to the strength of the shield, allowing it to become even harder to break through. More energy spilled out of the resurrected Darkseid, Nren, and Ares. The darkness adding more power to each of their individual attacks. Yotl frowned as he felt a corrosive effect take over the shield. Then a torrential amount of power immediately started coursing through him. He looked behind him and saw Dr. Dot Faith gripping his shoulder. Behind him, everyone within the shield were holding hands. Yotl realized they were transferring energy and stamina from each of the over 1,000 people around to Dr. Dot Fate, and then Faith channeled it into Yotl. Finish this. Fate told him. Yotl smiled. The shield he was controlling grew thicker as the corrosive effect became inert. It could not take hold faster than Yotl could get rid of it. Brother, any time now. Yotl told Michael, using both hands to maintain the shield. And now for my final act. Bind. From small portals in the ground and in the case of flyers in the sky, long pale hands shrouded with a thin black clothing, reached out and grabbed every single member of the Dark Army on their legs and other parts of their bodies, holding them in place. The strongest of the army, Darkseid and the other two contemptuously shrugged off the hold, their energy managing to destroy or at least harm the hands. However, they had no idea Michael could endlessly produce and control countless Dementors. The Hololens creatures replaced each of their destroyed compatriots and when thousands of Dementor hands managed to grab onto each of the three, there was nothing they could do within a short time frame. And that was all Yotl needed, with the attacks from the Dark Army ceasing due to the Dementors distracting and immobilizing them, Yotl made his move. The shield under his control, meant to protect also had another function, using the mysteries of his divinity, he could send back an absorbed attack, with ten times the initial power. The shield groaned as it started pulsing with all the stored energy. The Dark Army grew restless as Yotl added the energy of all his allies on top of his immense divine energy and the energy from the absorbed attacks. 
The shield began thumping as more and more power was added to it and then compressed. An enormous beam, shining white with specks of different colored energies like the Green Lantern's will power, a Lord of Order's mystic energy, a Kryptonian solar energy, magic from Zatara and more, exploded out of the shield. All that power was carried forward by Yotl's spiritual divine energy, reaching a scary level that was above even what Vata could produce. Empty hand, through the eyes of Darkseid could not believe how things had gone from good to worse in only a few minutes. He had thought that only that man was dangerous. Now, observing through the eyes of what had been once a galactic warlord of immense power, he understood just how much he had underestimated Aiden's forces. First Vata had sent an attack that destroyed Earth-7 where Empty Hand had been, recovering from his first ever loss. Ninety-nine percent of his being, separate from the Great Darkness had been destroyed by Aiden. Even for a cosmic entity with incredible power like Empty Hand, that, order, thing, it scared him. He had been utterly and completely beaten, his true form destroyed. Even now, he had only been brought back but not fully healed. Order energy still wreaked havoc across his metaphysical being. A power that was so potent that even if you were resurrected, it still did not cease attacking you. So it was with a lot of glee that he attacked his realm in retaliation. But never had he thought that Aiden's subjects were formidable as well. He had lost. For the second time. One might have expected empty hand to rage and curse. Instead, he smiled. Well done, brother. You truly are master's creation. Empty Hand was at last convinced that his defeat was warranted and because Aiden Strong was a special project of the Great Darkness, it did not sting him to accept the loss. There was one thing that was special amongst all the beings from the Dark Multiverse, the Darkness, never really left them, whether Aiden Strong knew it or not, inside him, the will of the Great Darkness lived on. Darkseid and the rest were drowned out by the light. Gaia had won. Chapter 268 New World, Old Me Part 1 Space was neatly sliced open in a perfect circle as an orange portal appeared in midair. From inside the portal, three figures emerged led by a bald-headed woman dressed in yellow robes with a focused look on her face. She surveyed the scene, which was red, rocky and dusty with no apparent life around. Her hands flashed with yellow light and the slight choking she was hearing from behind her ceased as one of her partners took in big mouthfuls of breaths. Loki stopped wheezing and stood upright, massaging his throat while glaring at the back of the woman in front of him and Thor. A Thor that was trying his hardest to mask his laughter. You, Sage, do you have any idea who I am? The trickster god raged. Ah come of it brother. You did prank her followers back on Midgard, after all. Thor told him, slapping his shoulder slightly. Loki glared at him as well, shoving off the palm his brother placed on his shoulder. I could have suffocated he said, pushing his hair off his face. What's wrong? The Ancient One asked with humor laced in her tone. As the god of magic, a simple spell to breathe in space should be easy enough for you. Loki's face went beet red while Thor snickered. By the All-Father, she got you there brother, ha ha ha. Shut your mouth Thor. Loki spat out, before turning his eyes to the Ancient One. And you. Know this, sorcerer, I am a god, I have lived for thousands of years. I have a glorious purpose. Just then the whole planet was rocked by tremors. Thor and Loki both went silent, remembering that they were on Mars for a reason. It's starting. Thor said, placing his palm flat on the ground. He got up and removed Mjanil from its place on his hip. The god of thunder's eyes started glowing blue. With a green flourish of his divine energy, two daggers appeared in Loki's hands. This feels like the start of every battle we have ever been in Thor. The tension. Thor's face became hard. The only thing missing is the excitement. Thor answered. Somehow he wasn't sure he would enjoy fighting whatever this was. However, a mission from his further before he went on his Odin sleep was something he could not simply ignore. The tremors intensified, a crack running from a raised hill a thousand meters away towards them and it wasn't the only one. The whole planet was being struck by at least a 10.0 magnitude earthquake. The ground before them was fracturing at a very fast pace. Loki and Thor looked around and surprise colored their faces. Dust storms of red sprang up, along with hills and huge boulders breaking apart into many pieces. A dense black smoke with seemingly no visible source began to also drift out of the cracks in the ground. The planet seemed to be on the verge of exploding. Maybe further could have gone on his Odin sleep at a later date and not left us with this kind of task? I do not think we're quite cut out for this Thor. Loki was quick to say when the smoke began to spread out through the ground, corroding rocks and soil, infecting the red color and leaving behind a ashy landscape. 
I am no coward. Thor ground out with confidence. Whoever this is, enemy or friend, I shall meet him as a warrior. Loki eyed his brother with familiar frustration. Sometimes I wonder if you're brave or simply lack common sense. The Ancient One finally made a move from where she had been standing. All traces of a joking mood evaporated. Her eyes opened and she released a small breath of air. It was time, pulling power from invoking the Vishanti, magical circles inlaid with complex shapes and patterns, covered her palms. Hold on to something, preferably, each other. Then she stomped one of her legs onto the ground, hard. A section of it, the one they were standing on, measuring about fifty feet across, rose up to the sky at her urging. Loki and Thor buckled unsteadily, the former dismissing one of his daggers to grab onto Thor's flowing red cape. The shaking stopped as the piece of ground under them, ascended to about five hundred meters off the ground and stopped. Then a lot of mystical energy washed out of the Ancient One as she spread her arms to the side, grunting in power. Right before their eyes, grids of yellow light covered the shaking planet and then as if it was a cake, each section under the grid was cut into its own individual piece. Like a cake at a birthday party or a fruit, perfectly sliced under a sharp knife, Mars was broken apart into tiny almost comparable in shape and size, pieces. Incredible! Loki muttered, looking at the Ancient One with new eyes. The power it would take to achieve something on this scale should not only be immense but also be of a high quality. Yet, she can control every single speck. He shook his head. The Ancient One's left hand tightened into a fist as she chanted. Then ever slowly, each piece separated from its neighbors, like a puzzle opening to reveal what it hid underneath. A puzzle that hid something ancient, something terrifying. A black ball of infinite chaos energy swirling around the core of Mars. Right before their eyes all was revealed and nothing would ever be the same again. X Mansion. Professor Charles Xavier looked at the helmet on the small raised platform, cerebral. You're stalling Charles, his oldest friend and enemy, Magneto said. Charles sighed, looking at Eric from the corner of his vision as he stood on his left. Then he felt a gentle hand squeeze his shoulder. Jean. We can all feel it Professor. Whatever this thing is, it's waking up. She told him, face unfocused and eyes glowing with a scarlet light. It feels. Otherworldly. She is right, Charles. This could be another apocalypse situation. We cannot let that happen. Magneto informed him. We need to know where it's coming from and deal with it before it gets out of hand. Not everything can be solved with violence, Eric. Xavier chided him only to receive a mocking laugh in return. Your pacifism would see us dead Charles. Besides, we both know that sometimes doing the ugly thing for the greater good does not make you evil, it means you're strong enough to taint your hands so that someone else will not. A noble sacrifice, that is what you have taught your X-Men, is it not? Xavier did not answer. That same argument was timeless. Eric and he, had said everything there was to say a long time ago. He reached out, took the helmet of the stand and wore it on his head. Immediately, his already prodigious mental abilities were immediately enhanced to a completely different level. He could feel every single mind on the planet. Every child, man, woman and animal. Nothing was hidden from his mind. It was, easy. Then he pushed to see past that. His awareness spread out to cover the moon, then beyond that. He felt it. Charles sucked in a deep breath as his eyes opened wide. His eyeballs started glowing a white color. Professor. Jean tried to shake him out of it, but Charles could not stop seeing. His mind had been exposed to something no human or mortal really should have ever seen. It changed him. I will stronger than him, stronger than Apocalypse. The only comparison he could make was say that it was just as strong as what he had locked away in Jean's mind. He tried to detach himself from its tight grip and failed. He felt himself getting submerged in it. Charles did the only thing he could, he connected with the whole collective of human consciousness, relying on the mental webbing of seven billion people to shoulder the weight of this being. Magneto and Jean felt a mental load fall on their minds, something heavy that caused a feeling of awe, appreciation and terror. It spread out like a wave of light to cover the state of New York, the nation and then the rest of the continents. Every human being on the planet felt it. For a mere two seconds, they all experienced what Xavier saw. Futile. Xavier said, cutting off the mental projection of the entity from the rest of humanity. Even that many minds couldn't handle it. His body slumped on his wheelchair. Jean massaged her forehead while getting up and scrambling towards Charles. Professor. Professor, wake up. Magneto removed his helmet, throwing it away and wiping his nose to see blood. The helmet, 
designed to keep out telepaths had been rendered useless by whatever that was. Is he okay, Charles? He too, walked forward in concern. I could feel him, asking for help, he tried, tried to rely on the rest of us. The entrance to Cerebral opened and Cyclops, Storm, Colossus, Logan and Hank ran in. What happened to Chuck? Wolverine deployed his claws, hostilely looking at Magneto. And what was the thing? Logan wait. Storm told him as Jean looked back at them with a shocked look on her face. The professor, his mind, I, I can't feel it anymore. Elsewhere. Charles opened his eyes to a world of white, he blinked. Who are you? A tall man with long black hair asked him from behind. What? Xavier wondered, turning around to see nothing but the same whiteness that went on forever. Oh wait, there was something or rather two things that stood apart from the white. One of them was. Xavier's mind changed the subject in lieu of something more interesting. He looked down at himself and gaped. He was standing up. Loki. Thor shouted out of nowhere, even after walking around, he had seen nothing but white all over. Both Xavier and Loki turned to look at him. I swear, if this is one of your tricks I will not forgive you. Thor warned, raising his hammer and pointing it at Loki. Xavier raised his hands. Gentlemen, surely we can handle this in a more amicable way. If we work together. Loki rolled his eyes and interrupted Xavier. Look around you fool, he addressed Thor. Does this seem like something I could come up with, really? A void of nothing but white? It lacks imagination. Thor frowned, considering his brother's words. I suppose you're right. If there is anything suspicious about this, it's the mortal who popped in from nowhere. Loki pointed his dagger at Xavier. Where did you come from? He asked with narrowed eyes. Even Thor started giving Xavier a suspicious look, walking slowly to flank the leader of the X-Men in between Loki and him. Xavier did not answer. Instead he had a finger on his temple, trying to break out of what he knew was a trap for his mind and the other two. They could introduce one another after they were far away from danger. Answer me mortal. Loki ground out dangerously. Don't bother. A new but familiar voice said from above them. Ancient one. Thor said, finally noticing her along with the other two. Xavier blinked at the dagger held very close to his neck. He stepped away from Loki and looked up. That voice. Xavier muttered. The Ancient One made no reaction yet. Hello Charles. She said, not looking down. Eyes turned to the sky as if waiting. How do you know me and why does it feel like we've met before? Charles questioned, finding the whole thing more and more complicated. Her voice reminded her of the flashes and nightmares of an impending doom he would usually get at night from using Cerebral too much. His powers would seemingly be influenced by his dreams and go a little haywire. The good thing was that he hadn't hurt anyone yet. Cerebral. Xavier finally said. I always feel a sort of, void and your voice in the middle of that void whenever I use Cerebral to scan the world. He murmured with a tone colored in realization. It's you, I can't feel you, I have never felt you. The Ancient One smiled a little. That is because I am a sorcerer professor, and I have a few tricks up my sleeve for dealing with those who try to poke their noses in my business. Xavier opened his mouth and closed it after the Ancient One's words. He truly had no response to that. Is this your doing? Xavier asked, already knowing the answer to that question. Loki and Thor both listened as well, waiting to hear the Ancient One's response. No. It's mine. A new voice. This one managing to sound young, old and tired all at the same time replied. In the white featureless sky, a pair of eyes emerged, one a deep red and the other a deep green. The irises were surrounded by a ring of white and black. Loki and Thor both stumbled back. Yeah, maybe father should have handled this instead. Thor agreed with Loki's earlier statement. Elsewhere. On the other side of existence, from a higher dimension, the watcher knew fear due to four simple words. I can see you. Chapter 269, New World, Old Mepa The Three Elemental Disciplines and the Mysteries of Earth, How and Why Colon. Fire, also known as the first of the three, is the easiest to wield and direct. The fastest to get out of the caster's control as well. This element while not particularly loved by druids, is widespread amongst the Red Lotus, more information on them can be accessed in the history of magic. Air, is peaceful and beloved just as it is dreadful in the wrong hands. All druid practices base air as the foundation of their teachings. It is as potent as one wills it to be. Water is the third in this triumvirate of elements. Water can be flexible and hard. 
Its subskills are the most versatile. Water has a very close relationship with air and fire, forming storms and steam as a result of what many call web fusion. The web is a theorized connection in between each element. Though numerous studies have been done, no one knows for certain if it exists. However, all magical practitioners who connect with the avatar dedicate their lives to reaching this theorized layer of magical control. It is believed that if one were to gain control of the web, then they would automatically become the god of true magic. Reality would be theirs to do with as they wish. Earth can be summed up in one word, difficult. It is stubborn, sharing similarities with how we see it expressed, the ground, tough heavy boulders, mountains and deserts. It defies change, content to maintain its size and shape, moving only when pushed by a higher force. Wind, water and fire can be directed by gaining connection with their mysteries. Earth is absolutely not the same. Thousands of years and the only subskills unlocked are gravity and crystal manipulation. And even these two subskills are only wielded with prodigious talent by members of the Red Lotus. Rumors say they have even unlocked another subskill, one that brings with it major destruction, lava control. How? Huh? There is a process of magical progress, where a second generation mystical practitioner finds it much easier to understand the mysteries of each of the elements with a lower difficulty than the older generation. Over the years, understanding becomes easier to grasp, leading to many elemental subskills being discovered and subsequently unlocked. This entire phenomenon is known as avatarian sublimation. Power is given to magi in exchange for creative application of each element. Through that, subskills such as plant control, light manipulation, ember manipulation, cloud manipulation, blood manipulation, elemental aura, elemental zone, elemental enchantment, glam creation and many more have been made possible. Avatarian sublimation added credence to the unpopular belief that the avatar is not only a dimension of power like other realms. An example being the dark dimension where the dread Lord Dormammu has dominion. The avatar is instead, an actual god of magic, one with great influence in the physical world. The greatest mystery of all, right next to what is under the red lotus base, see, most catastrophic natural phenomenon of the past few centuries for reference, is who or other what is the avatar. Rumblings from an unknown 16th century druid. Colon. Aiden's POV. I came to covered in warm light that reminded me of one of my mum's loving hugs. What? My throat was dry. No sooner had that thought crossed my mind than I immediately felt okay. As if the slight discomfort was immediately done away with a minute I recognized it. Weird. I flexed my will, still not completely sure of what was happening. The warm light fractured right before my eyes and then the cocoon I was in, seemingly washed out into my surroundings in a gooey magical energy. The way I imagined sound would look like as a solid, viscous and thick. The energy melted into the ground. I touched down on a warm carpet of green grass. Whoa. This place was beautiful. And weird. The sky kept on shifting color from a red hue to pink then silver, then yellow and even more colors without a designated pattern. The air was full of small undetectable energy pockets, showing that anything living here would not need sustenance as the place itself provided the energy needed to live. There was a waterfall, falling from a great height to my left, feeding into a small lake about five football fields in size. Then the lake itself had glowing floating lotuses with a few wisps of light fleeting about. Are those fairies? I raised my presence and flew towards the lake, undetected. The water was so clear I could see deep into its depths, almost gasping at the beautiful aquatic plants and fish that reminded me of the water dimension's many variety of marine life. And yeah, they were fairies. Tiny humanoid forms that shared similarities with Tinkerbell, dressed in colorful flower clothes made from petals and small leaves. They had kingdoms or rather, villages above the huge floating lotuses, all a variety of color. Some were blue, others were red, a few more yellow and the last ones were green. Huh, that's interesting. It's almost like they are following a theme. What grabbed my attention and made me watch them for hours on end was how they seemed so, alive like little actual people, arguing, laughing and pranking each other, they were so beautiful. I held out my hand to the lake. Protection from all that seek to do you harm. I blessed them, using a lesser miracle. It worked but I frowned. The faith energy inside felt different somehow. A multicolored shower of light fell upon the lake like snow. This way, no one could hurt them. I left the lake and continued exploring more of the place, and it only left me amazed the more I saw of it. There were a few animals as well, and they looked no different from the ones on Gaia except for one major difference. Color. A family of deer had green stripes across their brown hides. 
a fox with a burning yellow tail chasing after a purple rabbit that seemed to pop in and out of place with blue streaks of lightning, covering its body. A flock of birds flapped their wings and rode on white air that covered their bodies, above the sky. Then there was this humongous snake made entirely of the rocky carapace that had its body coiled around a huge tree housing literal bees with wings of darkness. And many more strange creatures. This place was what you would expect the end of a rainbow to look like. In fact, I floated up towards the beautiful skies which were nothing but swirls of elemental energy particles. I knew what I needed to do, like a command from the realm itself. I looked at the wide spread of magic happening under me. I name you, Rainbow Land. There was a shudder and I felt a sort of wrongness. I frowned, did I always suck at naming stuff? All right, here we go again. How about, Land of Magic, Langig? The shudder was stronger this time. A tough customer, this one seemed to be. Arcadia? I got the sense it was too cliché. Mystical groove? Too simple. Myriad palace. Too ostentatious. I tried every single name I could come up with while flying around some more, just enjoying the place. By the time I had flown around the small magical land that seemed to be the size of North America, I understood why none of what I was proposing worked. None of those words expressed what this actually was. This was not like Earth or Gaia. The only thing similar to it was the core of Gaia but even that lacked a very specific thing. I did not know what it was but, the connection I felt with this place was second to none. It resonated with me. As if I was it and it was me. A connection formed over millions, no, billions of years. My soul imprint was on every shred of energy and matter I could perceive. That's it. I name you, Energia. My soul piece. There wasn't a shudder or anything too eye-catching. Just a sense of rightness. A sense of correctness. The only thing missing was. Wait. I blinked, getting out of the trance I had fallen into right after waking up. It was like this incessant need to claim this land as mine by naming it was needed. Even though I already had a realm, it almost felt like, this one was simply just better. Like it was actually mine mine, not something order created. Yet, was that thought process right? I mean I loved Gaia and could control it with a thought, so, what was this? I shook my head, why was it also so hard to focus? It almost felt like I hadn't thought in so long, that my attention span was like a child's. Okay focus what's happening? I floated back to the ground slowly, my mind running at lightning speeds, trying to connect my thoughts and figure out why I was here when the last thing I remember was. Empty hand. My divine sense rippled out of me without a single instant wasted, presenting me with a change of scenery past energy. If empty hand had survived order then I had to change that. My gaze speared further, past the twisting and roiling layer of chaos and darkness encasing energy in a protective membrane. And for good reason. My god. My divine sense told me of the impossible. For starters, energy was not in my main dimension, as I had theorized. Neither was it even in my main DC universe. I remember the Earth being destroyed, yet here it was. Time travel? No, that can't be it, because how and why would they be here then? A few very strange figures that only pointed to a terrifying conclusion. One that I needed to disapprove of immediately or risk insanity at just how far from home I was. Especially because. I couldn't feel Gaia. I stomped down on that very grim thought and focused on proving myself wrong. My divine sense swept out further, leaving behind the Earth, past the solar system, past the nearest star system, billions of uninhabitable planets with a few among them that had life in all different ways. Like the blob people who looked like slimes living on a moon orbiting a cold planet on a star system 50,000 light years away. Then past the Quadrant, the Gree, the Nova Empire and even more alien civilizations. Some were spread out over dozens of star systems, faster than light travel spaceships making that possible. I even managed to identify a few very important figures, Darkseid, oh sorry Thanos and his retinue. I joke but the ominous feeling inside me only grew bigger and bigger. Carol Danvers was fighting a Kree Empire battalion in one of their many colonies and actually winning. Past the closest galaxies to our own there were even more crazy alien species and that only became true, the more my divine sense spread. After covering the entire observable universe and with every single thing I detected only telling me what I did not want to hear, I pulled back my gaze. This. My legs lost their strength as I sat on a rock with my head held in between my hands. This is. Impossible, huh? The last thing I remember is giving the reins over to order. Something went terribly wrong. 
I knew I could access the memories after a short meditation session and figure out what had happened and why I couldn't sense Gaia. Before I could do exactly that, the few figures I had sensed outside of Energy made their move. I frowned. I had to deal with them first before I could get some privacy to access Order's memories and get some answers. I felt Mars, which was simply the outer covering of energy get pulled away by a power that made me raise my eyebrows. The energy was different from what I had ever felt while also containing an essence that was eerily familiar. That energy peeled away Mars like a fruit, exposing the core. Exposing energy. I raised my eyebrows. Well, isn't that interesting? Time to have a conversation with the Sorcerer Supreme. Chapter 270, New World, Old Me Part 3 Pulling the Ancient One, Loki and Thor into a mind space was as easy as breathing. Displayed by my divine sense range, my mental abilities had gone past what could be termed as normal. My telekinesis was sufficient enough to juggle planets as if they were nothing and my clairvoyance was so enhanced even I had trouble dealing with the flashes of high-speed images about the future and its possibilities. I have always liked surprises so I made sure not to use that skill to spoil the future for me, only if I ever felt the need. And my psychokinesis which was just another fancy term for energy control was, changing. Back to the matter at hand. I was irritated by my current situation. The fact that Thor and Loki were here meant it wasn't by chance, seems like the higher tier powers knew of me, or something like that. I passed through their memories easily. Understanding I was violating their privacy but also knowing that mental context was better than listening to them explain why they were here. Holy. Crap. More than a million years had passed from what the ancient texts say. Yeah or rather the ancient one was not only charged with making sure the time stone was safe but also with making sure the universe was protected. From me. The avatar. A being even Agamotto himself could not deal with. Something from before the age of gods. Traced to the time of the celestials. Somehow I was also the antithesis to Null, the god of darkness. Never even met the dude but goddamn if these sorcerers couldn't spin a tail. I wonder, is that going to cause trouble? Maybe a celestial force sent to kill me to stop the rise of another Null? Or Null himself finding a way to come at me for some stupid power-hungry reason? Man, I think I traded DC's grime dark for stupid Marvel soap opera drama. Let's focus on that for a second, I had ended up in the Marvel Universe and stayed in this rock for an uncountable number of years, something had seriously gone wrong, and I knew I could get the answers I wanted simply by just clicking on the system. I looked at the corner of my vision and the piled up notifications there. Of course I had noticed them, but, I was afraid. I barked out to laugh, scaring the wits of a few chameleon squirrels on a tree branch above me. The squirrels blended into the branch to hide away. I paid them no mind, simply staring down at my pale soft hands, the calluses were gone. My body seemed to have been made anew, weird, still, just because I had used up over a million years, that does not mean it was too late. Time is relative. Maybe when and it's when not if, I got back, only a few short years will have passed, maybe, a lone tear fell out of my right eye and onto the ground. I wiped away the trail. I am a god. An emperor. And, I also miss my family. I can't believe there's a chance I might have missed my son's birth. I can't believe there's a chance I didn't see say I, Kai, Breeze, Vor, Aqua all grow up. Oh god, Aqua. She is all alone in the water dimension. Separated from our family. All alone just like, me. My body grew light. Power started brimming inside me as my emotions got out of control. Then just before I could blow up again, I clammed hard on my self-control. A sigh broke out of me. When did I start getting so emotional? Was it a consequence of my situation maybe? If so I needed to get it under control. Opening my eyes fortunately revealed that apart from a small scorched patch under my feet, no other damage from my outburst was present. I knelt down and touched the scorched soil. Where my teardrop had fallen, something was growing. This is so cliché, I chuckled to myself, caressing the small sapling. Using clairvoyance, I knew all there was to know about its future. The Tree of Healing. An image of a huge tree with a massive canopy hanging over hundreds of meters in the sky and spanning out to thousands of meters away appeared in my vision. All would be healed under it, no matter the wound, whether mental or physical or spiritual. Touching the sapling gave me clarity. It didn't really matter how much time had passed now, did it? I was the avatar and what we excelled at was control. Time was a fundamental aspect of nature, probably the greatest because it presents change and chaos presents change. So what if I had been looking at this all wrong? 
What if space wasn't actually more connected with air as I had thought but instead was another expression of order? Like a small part of it? The layer, the canvas of reality. And time, time could be chaos. Not really a flow or a straight line but a jumbled mess of past, present and future all mixed and combined into a thick solution that was chaotic inside a container that was space, order? Could this be a different concept to what was known? Something that worked for me, maybe. But, no that would mean that I would have to reconsider a lot of things that had hitherto never failed. But fuck all that. Ugh. My mind kept on drifting to thoughts that weren't even important. I needed to deal with my guests before figuring everything else out. Yes, I was avoiding seeing how bad it was. Sue me. Taking one step forward, I emerged in a white world overlooking them. I watched from the sky, undetected. And by my name, it actually was them. I don't know what I was expecting but, my eyes did not lie. The clothes and energy signatures confirmed that I wasn't dealing with cosplayers or something like that. These were real and breathing Asgardian princes and a powerful sorcerer who could make time her bitch. I cocked my head to the side. And it doesn't seem like they are the only ones here either. I felt a telepathic scan pass over the planet. The mind behind it was powerful. Very. At least for a mortal. I reached out to it and pulled the owner of the scan into the mind space. A certain mutant activist leader. Xavier stumbled into the mind space looking confused and wary. So, I thought. This wasn't just the MCU but a Marvel Universe with mutants alongside the roster of live-action heroes I had watched an eternity ago. Speaking of heroes, I wonder if the Marvel ones will disappoint me as much as the DC superheroes did. Then again, even in terms of likability, Marvel heroes take the cake. DC is full of people who see things in black and white. Absolute right and absolute wrong. Marvel is much more complex. The heroes deal with a lot of villains and sometimes they understand that the only way to end a threat is to eliminate it. They were realistic while still being heroes. The second I pulled Xavier into the mind space, I felt another set of eyes, these ones cleverly hidden away above space and time. They bore right through the layers of space to watch me. I can see you, I told the watcher you are to and immediately his gaze receded. Good, I don't want anyone to poke their noses in my business. Now, to tell the other three the same thing in a way that will convince them I wanted to be left alone. Is this your doing? Xavier asked the Ancient One. Seeing a chance to announce myself, I finally spoke. No, it's mine. The effect was immediate. Fear, wariness and surprise with a judicious amount of curiosity and the case of the Ancient One fell upon them. They looked towards the sky and came face to face with my eyes, peering down at them like the god I was. So you finally decided to show yourself. The Ancient One addressed me with a small upturn at the corner of her lips. She is bold, I observed. Reminds me a little of Cory. What in the Nine Realms are you? Loki questioned. The same curiosity was shared by the other two. Thor had his hand wrapped around Njolna and looked like he was two seconds away from attacking. The serious expression on his face was shared by Xavier. On the latter's part though, his eyes contained a certain light, interest and a certain hunger. Was he thinking of ways to further his agenda for peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans? Keep dreaming Charles. Just don't involve me. Who said I was hiding? I asked the only member of the group brave enough to not show her fear. I believe introductions are in order. I am. She began only for me to interrupt her. The Sorcerer Supreme, Yao. Born into bet millennia ago. The eyes in the sky narrowed. The Ancient One lost the smile on her face as I continued to speak. A trace of nervousness appeared in the midst of the wariness she held for me. Despite that, her confidence, blazing like a wildfire kept going strong. MMMH, she had a backup plan in case things went south. A bit too spry for a human who has lived for hundreds of years. I told her. Then again. The whole mind space shook as my humanoid form rippled into being right in between them. I held Mjolna in my hand by the handle, having grabbed it from Thor's hands faster than he could react. The enchantments cast on it tried to fight me but ultimately failed. I threw it to the sky, feeling out its weight. There was a substantial amount of power hidden inside the airy weapon. I know how you have kept yourself alive, I gotta say, never had someone steal power from me before. It almost feels like death is a light punishment for such a thing. I finished telling the Ancient One. I turned to a speechless Thor and threw Mjolnir back at him. Great weapon, but it's a clutch. If I were you, I would use it to supplement my divinity, not store it inside because I never tried to learn how to control it. Oh the hypocrisy in me. Chaos was still inside equity. 
Did he just? Loki stammered, eyes shifting between me and the hammer in Thor's hands. How dare I? The Ancient One did a few seals and immediately, I felt Thor and Loki get expelled from the mind space. I raised an eyebrow as she flew down. Smart move. She had no idea what I would have done had Thor attacked, so sending them away was the right move. I mean I would have only smacked him around a little. Maybe broken a few bones but that's it. Really. I promise. I shrugged, turning my back to her and facing the bald-headed man before me. A man who did not flinch under my chromatic eyes. Just barely. What is your deal? I wondered, walking around him a little. You have a strong mind but, did no one ever tell you that snooping is bad? I whispered next to his ears. A shiver went down his spine as he took a step back. I can hear your thoughts, Charles. You are afraid and with good cause. I released a little of my aura. I am nothing like you have faced before. Apocalypse is nothing in front of a cell on the skin of my pinky finger. Boo. This time he flinched. I chuckled a little, turning to the Ancient One. Well, what the fuck do you want? The Ancient One took a deep breath. Peaceful coexistence. She said. Pass. I immediately refused, gliding closer to her. I am quite aware that you are not the only one stealing power from me to keep yourself alive. I could feel it. The almost unnoticeable drain in my reserves that did not even account for 0.0000000000000000 Ah fuck too many zeros to count, percentage of my total energy capacity. I had grown more powerful, to the point, even I myself had no idea what I was capable of. But I knew I would have fun finding out. What I did know was that it wasn't enough. There was a, feeling of loss inside. And through that power, sorcerers and druids across the world have kept the earth safe for years. So please, see the good not the bad. Weird. That was the same thing I told the Justice League. She was right but, if I was to make it back, something told me I would need every ounce of my power I could get. And I'm supposed to care why? I asked her. I don't have the context of what's going on but I can assure you, the world is a dark and dangerous place. Why don't you judge for yourself if they deserve your power or not? Charles finally found the courage to address me. A reasonable request. The Ancient One grabbed onto the lifeline offered. I thought about it for a few seconds before bursting out in laughter. Ha 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 oh god. This, this is priceless. You guys are funny as fuck. I mean you have sucked on me like leeches for thousands of years and still it's not enough? I asked them, were they actually serious? Looking at the Ancient One's face set in a grim visage, I decided to give her a test. If she succeeded then, maybe I would listen to her request, if not, I was going to take back everything that was rightfully mine. I held out my hand. How bad do you want things to stay the same? I questioned before continuing. Give it. The Ancient One knew what I was asking for. She didn't answer for a few seconds but I could see her jaw working like crazy. Then ever so slowly, she reached into her robe and came out with the thing giving her the confidence to actually face me. The Book of Vishanti. I could feel an aura of mystical might that overshadowed even the helmet of Nabu coming off the book. She placed it in my hands all the while never looking away from my eyes. The minute she let go, her mind was overcome by this incredible worry but within that worry was hope. Hope that I was not an enemy. Hope that I wouldn't hurt anyone. And with the book of Vishanti in my hands the only thing that she thought could pose a danger to me, I made my decision. Here's the thing, I am taking back all the power stolen from me. She sucked in a breath, despair almost clouding her eyes. But in return, I'll create a force. A pool of dimensional power that your sorcerers and druids can draw in power from to do magic. What? You can actually do that? Xavier questioned in shock. I am the most powerful thing you have ever laid your eyes on Charles. And yes, that includes the Phoenix Force locked away in Jean's mind. She would probably give me a good workout if we were to clash though. Xavier went silent at that. I turned to the Ancient One who was similarly stumped by my wild claim. Think of it as a gift of goodwill for showing me that the heroes in this universe are reasonable and can actually trust. Plus, I want you out of here so that I can actually focus on what truly matters, finding out what happened and making my way back home, I thought to myself. New book alert. Colon. I reap souls in my spare time, DC slash bleach. Chapter 1, Hell Beckons. Davian's POV. The cold was barely noticeable. I inched in through the back door as the breeze ruffled my clothes once more. I looked behind me to make sure I wasn't being followed. They weren't expecting me to come but I couldn't be too sure. 
they knew I was dangerous and I had a reputation for not letting shit slide and this, this was. Fuck. I muttered, leaning on a post and letting the weight of emotion push me to the ground. My eyes burned with unshed tears. This, this was too much man. You need to get up. I slapped myself on the cheek, psyching myself up for what needed to be done. My knees gave out and I stretched out my legs, looking up and allowing the tears to fall. Real men don't cry. They blame it on onions or the Lakers winning. I chuckled, remembering what Nick always said whenever he got too sappy from rewatching Friends. I swear, never met a nigger that. There was a ruffle from over the fence as I heard Max begun to bark before going silent. I immediately stiffened when torchlight started shining through the small chain link fence. There's nothing there man, Max is tripping as usual. Mark's voice was easily identifiable. Yo Dre, check your dog before I put a bullet through the one-eyed freak. There was a scuffle before I heard the solid thump of a fist landing on a body. Don't call him a freak. Andre yelled back. Hey, hey, stop this shit right now before Papa hears you two fuckwits. Serena, Andre's sister and our girl's manager said. She was and wasn't a pimp. She liked to call herself a proprietor of pussy. Shit used to make me laugh before I went in and did time. We even used to have a little something going on in the past. Now, all I could feel was hatred for Papa Fred and his kind. The torch disappeared and I heard them all enter the house. Tensions were high right now but it didn't seem as if they knew that I had survived. That I had gotten out of the apartment alive. That I only had a bullet on my shoulder but was relatively okay. That I was okay only because Nick shielded me with his body. I wrapped my fingers around my trusty Colt 1911 and removed it from my pocket, only slightly wincing at the pain in my shoulder. The blood was leaking from the hasty glued wound and I could still feel the bullet inside my flesh in the middle of the arm and chest. I breathed heavily, studying the gun in my hand under the waning light of the moon. Then I grabbed it and placed it right next to my temple, clenching my jaw. I could do it here, right now. I could end it all. A shot to the head and a release from this life. It would be so easy. I wasn't afraid of death. What I was afraid of, was living. Living without the most important person in my life. Bitches came and left, Nick always stuck by me. I was content to hustle for money the dirty way, hitting up liquor stores with Dre and a mark before Papa Fred decided we were ready for the real shit. Nick never abandoned me, even when I pushed him away. Fuck. All those memories reminded me of why I couldn't pull the trigger. In many ways, Papa and the gang had been a family but Nick, Nick had been real. Nick had been the brother I never deserved. And after taking a fall for Dre over allegations about an attempted manslaughter, he had finally convinced me to get out. And I had agreed. I got out and my so-called family tried to off me. It wasn't anything personal either. Once you're in this life, getting out wasn't easy. But, they made it personal when they took out my best friend. That's why I couldn't let shit go. No. Most of the gang were not around. I had made sure of that. I knew how to stall them. They were over at 6th Street owing to a call about our rival gang being spotted around our turf. But the ringleaders the ones who mattered were around. I got to my feet and cocked the gun, slowly releasing it. You would be surprised at how much noise the cocking handle makes. I stretched my neck, swallowing the grunt of pain at the agony on my shoulder. Slowly unlatching the hatch holding the backyard door closed, I snuck in. I knew this place like the back of my hand. Max was on me in a second. SHH boy, go get it. I threw the piece of meat out into the street and watched the hound run after the tasty treat. He trusted me and would be knocked out for about ten minutes, somehow that felt worse than what I was planning. I secured the hatch and slowly walked towards the house. The stair boards creaked when I stepped on them, before I finally reached the doorstep. The buzzer did not work. Papa Fred usually made about 50k a week but he still chose to live frugally, most of our, sorry. Most of the gang's money was spent on the corrupt cops on his payroll. I also made sure to send a little gift to some high-profile news channel about just how dirty the arm of the law was. By trying to kill me, Papa had caused what he was trying to avoid. I knocked on the door two times without a response. Andre and Mark were probably high already and lazing around on the couch while, I looked at my watch. Yup, Papa was probably watching game highlights as was his daily routine. Which meant, I felt someone make their way to the door while complaining. I know you all can hear me Andre. You better not show your fucking. Serena's words cut off once she opened the door and found a gun pointing towards her forehead. Then she looked at the person holding the gun. My cold dead eyes stared back unflinchingly. Serena's breath hitched. Guilt and fear warred inside her eyes. 
Davi. I pulled the trigger and blew her brains out. The shot rang out through the house and I had scrambling feet. Serena. Papa Fred's voice was usually deep and menacing but today it sounded panicked and rushed. I raised a hand and waited. The next person to come running towards the door was Mark. See, I've never really liked Mark, and Mark knew it. The second he saw me, he said. Shit. And tried to roll away. A scream of gut-wrenching, ball-bursting pain escaped him because, well, I had shot his balls off. Mark. Andre showed up just as Max began to bark once more outside the fence. Andre saw Mark bleeding out on the floor and his sister dead under my feet and scrambled for his gun in anger, uncaring that I had one pointed at his face. Andre was a bit of an idiot. A large hand grabbed him and pulled him over the corner. Another shot rang out as my bullet managed to graze his shoulder and his cries of pain begun. Papa, Papa, it's Davy. Davian is alive. I could clearly hear the distress in his voice. Yes, you you grateful prick. I'm alive. Davian. Impossible. Papa Fred's voice came out of the corner. Fred what? Serena's mom, Mrs. M and Serena's younger sister appeared from another room. Martha. Get out of here now. Papa was quick to say and Martha obliged with a scared look on her face. I had a clear shot of her back. All I had to do was pull the trigger and I could cause Papa the same pain of losing family that he had put me through. I breathed out and let them run through the front door. I was a monster but only to those who crossed me. I'm disappointed Papa. You used to tell us you were in the marines yet. You're huddling behind the kitchen counter like a little bitch. I taunted, digging my hand inside my pockets and bringing out the little surprise I had brought with me. You're a dead man Davi. I will make you scream you little shit. I'll fuck you up like I fucked your whore mother. I'll shove a broken piece of bottle up your ass and cut off your dick and balls you fucked erd. I tsket. So many profanities. Where is the refined businessman who wears the hide of a crook? Oh my bad, guess it's the other way, huh? Please Davi. Don't kill. Andre started to say before I heard a resounding slap. Shut the fuck up you useless piece of shit. I stepped over Serena's cooling corpse and arrived next to Mark who was trembling and lying on a pool of his own shit and blood. I put a bullet through his brains in disgust. His body slumped onto the ground. Max had suspiciously gone silent. I didn't hear any barking on the outside. The tasty treat had been laced with a knockout drug. I stepped over Mark's dead body. So I've been thinking, Pops. I never really got to tender my resignation. I'm thinking of trying out a new career path. Subway's hiring and although I hear the pay ain't that good, it's honest work. The door to the bathroom was now next to me. I knew Papa Fred. Fuck I had a lot of patience. Too bad today it wasn't going to save him. I pulled the pins off the grenades I had been carrying then began to count to five seconds. At three, I threw them towards the kitchen before entering the bathroom and jumping into the bathtub. Phew. I heard his voice as he realized my little surprise. The, the curse was replaced by a loud boom that messed with my ears, left them ringing as I struggled to even breath. Dust covered the entire room and a chunk of the door was missing. I stumbled past the debris and made my way to the kitchen, gun at the ready. What I saw was nothing but burnt body parts that smelled like badly cooked meat. I couldn't even distinguish who was who. I bent down and saw a piece of an eye. It was blackened but I thought the eye was staring at me in anger and bitterness. I spit on his remains as I felt the anger and hate in me abate a little. Just a little mind you. I was still mad and I wanted to make them all pay. The back door was slammed open as the rest of my former gang walked in with guns. The pin from the third grenade dropped onto the floor as I turned around. Hey boys, what took your asses so long? Colon. As I lay there, feeling the cold metal of the bullets inside my upper body and the burn in the wounds left by a missing leg, arm and a huge chunk of my left chest, I couldn't help but think about all the mistakes I had made. The crime life was all I had known and now it was poetically the thing that led to my downfall. The pain was unbearable, however I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. My best friend was gone and the gang I had once called my family was now nothing but a distant memory. I had carried out my vow to avenge him and now it was time for me to pay the price. Darkness began to take over, clouding my vision completely until I saw nothing, felt nothing. I let go of life. My soul detached from my body. It was all so light. Light and heavy at the same time. Then I began to see something once more. A red hole that occupied center stage, in the darkness. A darkness I wasn't sure I was alone in. The red portal beckoned me and I knew that my fate was sealed. It was an instinctual feeling. I was headed straight to hell, but I accepted it with grim determination.
The crimes I had committed, the lives I had ruined, the pain I had caused, all of it weighed heavily on my conscience. But even as I spread out my hands, if I had any, and allowed the pull, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of regret. Perhaps if I had made different choices, if I had sought redemption earlier, things could have ended differently. My background was a contributing factor but it shouldn't have been an excuse. But it was too late now. The only thing left for me was to face my punishment with as much dignity as I could muster. And so, I took my last breath and passed through the portal, ready for whatever lay ahead. Hell may have been my destination, but it was also my penance for a life of crime. Chapter 271, Collision Part 1 30 Advanced Chapters in my Pat.Rion Pat.Rion.com slash Saint Barbido I'm so excited for the next few chapters. Check out my Pat.Rion guys, I promise you won't be disappointed. Of you are. I'll give you the refund. Please give me your power stones people. Colon. Chapter 272 Collision Part 1 General POV. My lady, it's getting cold out here. Would you please consider coming inside? The High Priestess of the God of Light asked. She was a beautiful thing. Dressed in a long flowing golden robe, with pink hair and white glowing eyes. Her most prominent feature however were the huge beautiful white wings behind her. Cory enjoyed her company and thought she radiated a warmth that reminded her of Aiden. I can still feel his presence. The Tamaranian princess said, smiling sadly. Her fingers inched up towards the necklace on her neck. A promise that no matter where he was, he would always find his way back. His divine touch is ever present among the believers. Serena assured her with a smile. They both looked up at the starry night sky. We have faith even when all hope seems bleak. Even when despair is all we can see. The light from Adonal will never stop lighting up the sky. And so we can sleep content with the knowledge that everything will be okay. Cory chuckled. Wise words. He would love you. Then she caught herself. Does. He does love you. Serene smiled brightly. Thank you Star Mother, she bowed only for Cory to grab her by the shoulders. Please don't bow. I thought we agreed for you not to call me that. She chided lightly. Serene merely smiled. Mum. They have a honey pool. Can we go swimming in it? Breeze's voice came from inside the palace. A scandalized look came over Cory and she flew inside at fast speeds while shouting. Kids that is not a swimming pool. Do not dare enter the starlight waters of healing. She left Serene alone, standing on a balcony overlooking the holy city of Adonal. We pray for you Lord, we pray. She held her palms together and softly said. Elsewhere. The Ancient One and Xavier were still caught by surprise by my words enough that they didn't react when I made my next move. Now leave. I told them, dismissing the mind space and expelling them back to Earth through spatial manipulation. It was instantaneous. One minute the Ancient One's mind was working lightning fast trying to comprehend and theorize if what Aiden claimed was actually feasible, creating a force. It wasn't entirely impossible. Odin had his Odin force which was a well of divine and mystical power only accessible to him. And in some way, avatarism could be considered a force. It was different from other dimensions of power that's for sure. It had its own rules of application and system that had not only been developed for countless years but one that also had some inherent uniqueness. Like how elemental magic could be summed up in four main branches. Between one blink of an eye, the Ancient One found herself seated in her room with Thor and Loki sleeping before her, knocked out. One of them was using the other as a pillow and Mjolnir was painted a very bright pink color. The Ancient One found herself chuckling. The Avatar was not what she expected at all. She got up and paused in her step. Now that she was back, it made sense that the Avatar had also let Xavier leave. She stared at nothing for a few seconds before leaving for her personal library, there was a lot she needed to know. Especially if the Avatar actually made his claims a reality. The fact that the minute she stepped inside she felt the familiar energy pulse of the Book of Vishanti, brought a smile to her face. Yeah, not at all what she was expecting. X Mansion. Child's body jerked as his mind was thrown back into his body. Oh my god. Professor. You're okay. Jean said with a worried look on her face. Xavier blinked his eyes, feeling a little disoriented after what had happened. He was back. Charles recognized his room and the scent of his couch. He slumped down in relief. Don't crowd him. Let him have some space. Hank McCoy popularly known as Beast informed the gathered X-Men, Cyclops, Jean, Wolverine, and Storm. Magneto was also present, standing a short distance away. Charles, come find me when you can. We have a lot to discuss. 
The Ancient One's voice sounded out in his mind along with an address of where they could meet up. She cut off the mental link before Xavier could answer back. Unfortunately, the people in the room managed to grab Xavier's attention. Good to see you're okay old friend. Magneto said, nodding his head slightly. We shall discuss whatever it was you experienced when you are not occupied. Then he turned to leave only for Xavier to hold out his hand. Wait, Eric. The X-Men gasped. A second later Xavier realized why. He brought his eyes down at his crippled limbs. He had actually moved his feet. His left leg was off the couch and bent slightly, muscles shifting under his pants and supporting him. I can feel my legs. He told them, feeling the almost overwhelming bombardment of sensation, prickling as his brain reworked, remembering how to translate signals from his now healed spine. My god. Storm muttered Dashi and the rest, even Charles looked on in shock. Charles, you can walk. Magneto was similarly stunned. His old friend who had been crippled for a huge chunk of his life could now walk. But how? Cyclops spoke up, asking the question that was in everyone's minds. Xavier smiled a little, the face of a dark-haired man with tan skin, green and red eyes appearing in his vision. I have a pretty good guess on who's responsible for this. Aiden's POV. I stood in outer space, simply staring out into the solar system or rather at the blue planet harboring the only intelligent life for hundreds of light years. It was only just entering the 21st century. The year below being 2001. It was as expected, beautiful, even with all its flaws. The cradle of humanity, as I like to call it. And to keep it that way, I needed to make sure Mars was around to divert or block asteroids that might collide on Earth. I turned my back to Earth and focused on the atmosphere of Mars. The Ancient One had left it in small perfectly sized segments drifting in space, I mean, I couldn't really blame her for that, seeing as I was the one who had banished them back to Earth. Let's change the first thing. I raised my hands and stopped. For all my power, I actually had little clue on how to go about it. Should I use magic? I mean I had no practice with it. It was different from my divinities and my elemental energies. Magic was unpredictable. So maybe no. Okay how about, my eyes glowed as I captured every detail of the planet. The rotational speed of each individual piece of the planet, the general size of the segments, any out of place tectonic plates and its most probable axis of rotation, then gently, telekinetic feelers washed out of me, covering the drifting segments in shinic energy. It got easier as I started to put the planet back together, melding the separate sections of the crust together in the best possible way. I took great care not to break apart the outer and inner cores, energy having been preserved by the Ancient One through some spell. With time. The red planet was back to its original, well almost original shape. A few state-sized loose rocks still drifted round. Those, I disintegrated into nothing by shredding them apart with spatial rifts. It was crazy just how easy space responded to me here. It was even more crazier that I could somehow sense another influence on it. An absolutely incredible pool of power on Earth that connected all of space together. An infinity stone. The space stone. I pulled back my shinik energy and wiped a non-existent bead of sweat off my forehead, then looked to the side and waved at Heimdall. Tell your king that next time, he should come by himself. It's basic courtesy from one monarch to another. Then I shielded the entire Martian airspace and planet away from curious cosmic gazes. Finally, I thought, breaking through the atmosphere and flying around, making sure that Mars was actually visibly okay. Then lastly, after getting tired of only seeing red, red and more red, I ended up sitting on a rock. Some peace and quiet. A calm lonely air swept across the red landscape. The mood was somber and silent. You can't keep on ignoring me forever. A tired voice said to me, as if carried by the lonely wind. I shook my head at chaos mentally projected words. Not ignoring you. It's just, I couldn't concentrate with them around. There was a brief silence, during which I reached out into my infinite hammer space and pulled out or rather tried, to pull out equity. I'm not in your hammer space stupid. Chaos told me, to which I frowned. Then please enlighten me as to your location. And why the sass? Look deeper within. I followed his instructions and tried to access my space of being. Immediately equity sprang into my arms before I could even go there with my conscience mind. You, thanks. For a second there, I thought you were going to leave me inside that fucking place for more billions of years. Chaos spat out annoyed. I'm sorry. I apologized rolling my eyes. It's not like I could help it. Still a bit confused about the whole thing, I hit him with an intense look. 
Now could you please tell me what the fuck happened that brought us into the Marvel Universe? I frowned as a few flashes of order fighting empty hand appeared in my mind before he stopped projecting his memories at me. Hey, hey, why'd you stop? I was just about to see where it all went wrong. Order was winning without any effort. Besides the fact that you can access those memories yourself? I groaned. Come on dude, my mind is messed up a little. Yes, besides that. I responded grouchily. It seems you have some more visitors. He gave the reason and I immediately cut off the mental link and felt it. A spacecraft of some kind, right outside my property. Ha ha, suck on that Elon. Motherfucker. I growled out the minute I teleported and appeared before the Domo, the spaceship of the Eternals. An old group of immortals who had been on Earth almost from the time when humanity had been born. You have got to be shitting me. One of the hatches on the spaceship hanging above the Martian atmosphere, opened up. Out flew a very familiar figure though we had never before met each other, Icaris. The Superman rip-off sighs were glowing. He said nothing but from his glowing golden eyes, he was probably not here to welcome their new neighbor, I. Emi. Chapter 272, Collision Part And who the fuck are you supposed to be? With my patience at an all-time low, I was bound to be rude. Icaris' face tightened. Then he did something unexpected, he bowed. Apologies for the unannounced intrusion. I am here on behalf of my... He went silent, probably trying to find the right word. Boss. I frowned. Okay. And what does this boss of yours want with me? I questioned, pulling forward slightly. Was it Tarisham specifically or just Ajak? So far though, Icarus though had been polite, so I decided I would reciprocate, to be on the safe side. I tried to access his memories and found my telepathic capabilities blocked. Smart. Instantly. I was curious. The only being that could actually block me had to be a celestial. So Arisham wanted to see me? Why? Let's lay down the facts. What do I know of celestials they had been around for longer than anything else and possessed technology and cosmic power on a level that was, if I was being completely honest just a little bit higher than mine. I mean, they fucking crafted worlds. Earth had a frigging celestial as the core of the planet. Do you know how up you had to be to do shit like that? Still, as stated earlier Rikeries had been polite. Maybe they actually did come in peace. From my interactions with the Ancient One and Xavier, the people here seemed a bit more reasonable than where I came from. I got closer and finally stopped before him. He warily shifted his gaze towards equity in my hand before looking up at me and nodding towards the Domo. He consents me. Chaos said. Duh, you have the capacity to destroy an entire world on your own. It would be surprising if he didn't. I answered in a low tone, by Akari's stiffened posture. I guess he still heard it. Enhanced senses. There wasn't even an effective air medium for my voice to reach his ears. Must be a perk granted by cosmic energy. Be careful. They might seem amiable but trust me when I say, hostility can come from the most unlikely of places. Before I could inquire more on that strange response, Icarus was already turning around to board the ship. If you could kindly follow me. I did as he requested, keeping a short distance between us. I was already scanning the ship with my divine sense, storing the blueprints of the old and FDL capable craft inside my mind. It was very technologically advanced. Gaia would have a field day with this. A film of energy passed over me as I flew inside the Domo. The instant I stepped through, my eyes fell on the entire group. In front of them and wearing ostentatious clothing even by the Eternals' standards was a beautiful middle-aged woman, who radiated a certain kind of mom-like warmth. Ajak. Welcome. She said. We are known as the Eternals. I wasn't sure if the way they stood together was meant to be intentional but it ended up looking cool as fuck and cinematic. Hello, Eternals. I waved lightly. Way to make an awesome first impression. Chaos snorted. Shut up. Besides, when are you ever this chatty? He said nothing. You can call me, Avatar. I shrugged. It's the name that the only mortals who know of me found fit to describe what I am. And what exactly is that? A tall woman, dressed in a white outfit with golden accents inscribed on its form asked. She had a certain intensity that I immediately found myself liking. Diana wasn't the only who had an attraction to beautiful and strong individuals of the opposite gender. Though it's Cory for me all the way. I'm guessing she is Dina. A mystery. You're welcome to figure it out if you want. I answered. Dina narrowed her eyes at me. Dangerously. Apologies, I realize we haven't properly introduced ourselves. Ajak cut in. I turned my attention back to her. 
From the left, we have Gilgamesh, she described them one by one. Gilgamesh was a huge muscular dude in a blue costume of the same make as his fellow Eternals. He nodded amicably at me. Then after that there was a small girl with a cheeky look on her face, Sprite. I am going to ensure that she and Breeze are kept far away from each other. Fuck, I miss Breeze. The next Eternal was a male with a blank expression on his face. He looked as if he wanted to be anywhere else other than there. Druig. Out of everyone else, something told me he was the most dangerous. A notion that was immediately broken when I laid my eyes on the next Eternal. She was pretty in that girl next door sort of way. However that was not the most outstanding thing about her. Her cosmic energy contained something very strange and familiar. Something I could almost touch upon. Ah, you're staring. Chaos pointed out unhelpfully. I know. My response at seemingly no one only further increased the looks of bewilderment and confusion the Eternals were staring at me with. Sorry, I told Cersei. For some reason, I can't stop staring at you. I felt like slapping myself the second I said that. Poor choice of words. You think? Chaos chuckled. I ignored him. Something was definitely fucking with my mind enough for me to notice the strange behavior. I had been unfocused and said weird shit ever since waking up. Ikari stepped forward a bit aggressively. Oh, that's cute. Whoa, calm down hotshot. It's not what you think. I raised my hands up. Hotshot? No one talks like that anymore. Chaos was quick to interject. Fuck you. I threw back. Ooh sick insult. I am so offended right now. Just ignore him. Ajax shook her head at him and he stepped back. You know what would be good? If you said good doggy to him. Chaos bonch on for causing well, Chaos leered its ugly head. It was getting easier to ignore him. That's a lie. Your power, I motioned at Cersei. What is it? She seemed unsure for a second before answering. At least she didn't look to Ajax for direction. I can see why the older Returnal chooses her as her replacement in the future. It's in the little things. Matter manipulation. She answered. My mind instantly started running in thought. Why did I feel such a crazy connection to that? I'll explain it later. Right now you're being impolite. There was a lot chaos was keeping from me, and I had a feeling it was going to change everything. I listened as Ajak finished introducing the last three. Fastos who was the resident genius. They gotta be one of those by necessity. The Avengers had Tony, the Justice League had Bats, though there were smarter heroes in the roster and so on. Then there was, Icaris. The strongest eternal, load of crap. Cersei could own his ass if she wanted to and I also suspected Noah was the better fighter. The others seemed willing to act cordial with me but Icaris, there was this, hidden aggression aimed towards me. I picked up on it almost immediately despite the earlier politeness. Perhaps he's jealous. You did look like you were hitting on his girl. Chaos had a point though I would die before agreeing. Seriously, those years I was stuck inside Energer must have starved him for conversation and now he was trying to make up for all that lost time. And finally, Vna. You're skilled, I commented. Very. Is he seriously trying to hit on Vna? Sprite whispered at Gilgamesh. His funeral. The large man answered. Vina on her part ran her eyes up and down my form. I love your sword. I smiled tightly as Chaos laughed inside my mind. The only compliment she gives you and it's not even aimed at you, but your weapon. I'll take that. Then my mood changed. I had already wasted more than enough time. I looked at Ajak, the clear leader even reading by their placement. She was in the middle of the pack. Now that we have the niceties out of the way, could you please tell me what you came all this way for? Their whole demeanor changed as well. They stood on the ready, cautious but confident, the same sort of confidence the Ancient One had displayed. Ajak breathed in. As I am sure you already know, we are not from around here. We hail from a world called Olympia. She stepped to the side showing me the projection of a star map and a magnificent planet. Our creator, Arisham the leader of the Celestials, tasked us with shepherding humanity by protecting them from alien creatures called the Deviants, hell-bent in destroying budding intelligent life in planets across the universe, they attack en masse, the only solution being us. The image showed a young earth and civilizations from the past, then the images shifted to show an image of a creature that was like a huge dog with tentacles and spiked across its body. A deviant. The projection continued with the Eternals standing above the corpse of the Deviants. I listened as Ajax shamelessly lied. How she could bear the life for more than 5,000 years was crazy and impressive. 
The worst part is that the others have no idea their lives are a lie. Being dishonest about their mission is one thing but having your whole existence based on a falsehood is crossing the line. Chaos spoke through my mind. He was right. I could see how the rest deferred to her, respected her, loved her. It was the same way Yod, Michael and Vata would follow me to death and back. They were her family and she was purposefully placing her fear for Arisham before her love for them. She had the choice to change things for the better across thousands of years but didn't. Instead, she wasted their time and lives on a senseless mission that brought more pain than good to the world. But it's her duty or it's why they were created. Those were just excuses that stank of the same preordained bullshit that saw me clashing and eventually killing the fates. Was I biased? Yes. Yes I was. So I would give her a choice. Let's call her out on her bullshit then. I told Chaos. Oh I love the sound of that. I can tell that things are just about to get chaotic. The resulting cackling reminded me of the Joker. Insane, cruel and gleeful. There's the Chaos I know. I couldn't create a mental link with her mind but that didn't steal options from me. I tapped into the air and sent words that terrified her straight to her ears in a low volume that only she could hear. Except for our budget Superman of course. By Akari's stiffening, he heard them as well. I know the truth Ajak. You are no saviors. You're just Harisham's thugs. I think it's time you tell your family what you have been hiding from them all this time. Tell them the truth, or I will. The words made Ajak towards me in panic, fear driving her to make a rash decision. Kill him. He's planning to attack. Icaris was already in motion. I felt his body slam into mine, then I smashed through the walls of the Domo as we both flew outside. Chapter 273, Collision Final Part Equity was loosely held before my chest. The broad side of the sword blocking Icaris punch from the get-go. I wasn't too surprised to act, only too surprised that Hajak actually would. What the fuck just happened? Chaos shared the same shock as I did. I guess she made her choice. I answered softly, lightly flexing my arm and sending Icaris flying away through the air. The Eternal arrested his momentum and sent laser beams made of cosmic energy from his eyes, before flying in himself sustaining the attack. Why would she fuck it up this much? Is she dumb? Is keeping Arisham's secret more important than the lives of her family? Chaos was getting more worked up now. Equity vibrated with a dark energy. I sent a slash of darkness speeding forward, blocking the eye beam successfully and easily. I took a step and the air fractured around my body as I appeared behind Ikaris. The Eternal's mental activity spiked up in alarm as he detected me. You know the story of Icarus? I asked. Let me educate you. I slammed my forearm down onto his back and a shockwave rippled out. Icarus shot towards the surface of Mars at great speeds. The Domo started priming up power, before it could do something with it, whether escape or attack, I sighed, sidestepping a laser beam from below the obscure clouds of dust covering Mars. Icarus. I don't know about the strongest but he surely is the most persistent. The yellow lasers were dragged across the sky, aiming to slice me apart. Once again, I used equity to not only block the beams but absorb them as well. Find out what you can about cosmic energy. It's something new, something capable of blocking my telepathy. I informed Chaos. Kill them all. Chaos told me, making me scowl a little. You do know that Hajak is the one responsible right? The rest have no idea about the lie except for Icaris. No sooner had I said that, when Icaris finally speared through the atmosphere of Mars, one hand pulled back in a fist. His face was set in a snarl. The left hook that came in from the left was fast and heavy, capable of destroying an entire building upon impact. I slapped it away before slamming Equity's pommel onto his belly, breath left his lungs or whatever passed for his breathing organs as he bent and floated back. Before he could charge in, I was next to him in a flash, Equity's edge on his neck. Stand down, Icaris. I don't want to hurt you. Then I felt a feeling of overwhelming hate overcome me. Black energy extended out of equity without my urging. The slash sliced through the Eternal's neck like it wasn't even there. The slash expanded, headed for the Domo. I immediately activated spatial load and reloaded space as it was a few seconds ago. The skill activated, but I immediately felt more gazes look onto me. Fuck off. I warned and felt most, if not all, recede. You got some explaining to do. I told Chaos, clamping down on my control not to kill the newly revived Icaris. Speaking of whom, his eyes were stormy with rage. They glowed as he let loose psi lasers at close proximity. I answered him with my own eye beams made of purple flames. Anything hotter and nothing would be left of his face. The eye beams plowed through his attack and knocked his head back. 
He let out a wordless scream while clawing at his eyes. Over his shoulder, I saw the Dommer reorient itself while powering up. Ajak. I laid a palm flat on Ikari's costume chest and let loose an explosive force. Ikari's was sent flying towards a cosmic energy beam shot at me from the Domo. His body was hard enough that he cut through the attack, cosmic energy running rampant as it bounced off his body. Then he collided against the Domo, not destroying it but definitely making it rock while in the sky. Instead of attacking though, I looked at Equity. Okay what the fuck is up with you and your sudden dislike for the rest of the Eternals? Ajak is the problem. The others are clueless about what's really going on. Icaris is also fighting me out of some sense of duty, yet you almost know you did kill him without my say-so. The reason for my question and outburst were the violent urges Chaos had been projecting to me while I had been fighting Icaris. They were suggestions on what I should do to them. They still decided to attack you. It's a betrayal. They betrayed us. Just like he did. So, fuck. Them. Up. He shouted. No, screamed at me. What in the hell are you talking about? I was confused and getting slightly annoyed at all the secrets. They're getting away you dumb idiot. He shouted back. Sure enough the Domo had opened up to receive Icaris and instead of attacking, were now pulling away from the planet. Running. Smart move. Also. Fuck that. Don't to change the subject. I know where they are and can deal with Ajak at any time. I told Chaos. But clearly, we have a few things we need to address first, don't you think? If you have something to say, say it now. Stop playing around, throwing tidbits and trying to chat. Stop taking out your pain on others. Stop trying to act like the past million years meant nothing. They did. We lost time. I lost time. There was silence for a few seconds as my chest rose up and down in anger. During that time, the Domo had left Mars and blazed a trail across space, running towards the Earth. I knew where they were. We were not even close to being done. Ajak had some answering to do but right then, right there, I was determined to put an end to all the mystery and the tiptoeing around the subject. Well, what the fuck do you have to say now? I prompted. Instead of answering me, Equity sent over his memories. And once I saw what I had been hiding from, my mind buzzed, as agony gripped my chest. A non-physical feeling of a different kind of pain. How could, how could he? It felt as if I had lost strength. My biggest asset, order. The one thing that had gotten me out of trouble, time and time again, the one thing I could depend on to always handle what I couldn't, had betrayed me. Not just any betrayal but one whose consequences were far-reaching and destructive. We haven't been asleep for a million years. It's been billions. Chaos told me in a heavy tone, one hiding pain. I gave him a weak snort. I couldn't believe it. A billion years, that's so god, I think I need to sit down. I thought to myself as my power started getting out of control. The sun was responding to my feelings and huge rings of solar energy were pulsing out of its form in solar flares. One of the ones headed towards the Earth met a shield of some kind around the planet. I had been ready to act, maybe use spatial load again but for just a tiny second, I didn't care, I didn't give a shit that countless people would die. Elsewhere. The Ancient One knew what was coming and used the three sanctums to block the devastating solar flare that would have left the Earth a barren wasteland on the surface. The heat wave slammed on the magical shield and caused beautiful colors of pink, red, yellow, green and orange to appear in the sky, seen from different places of the globe. The panoramic flares became a sensation, none knew that they had just been saved. Their savior turned her attention to the sky. There wasn't much that the Eye of Agamotto could tell her. It had its own restrictions. Restrictions caused mostly by the existence of the Avatar. The warning she had received from looking into the future and seeing the devastation the solar flare would cause was only one of the few things she could clearly see. That and the arrival of Dr. Dot Strange, the one who would become the greatest of all of them were the most important visions she could perceive. She hoped that the titanic power she could feel blooming in outer space sent no more curveballs her way. Aiden's POV I walked away to my new magical realm after calming down the sun. Inside Energia, everything faded away as I entered my meditation under the waterfall that poured into the fairy lake. I needed to see the memories for myself. Finding the separation of Psyche between me and Order was easy enough, my mental abilities as stated many times before, had grown incredibly powerful. Are you sure about this? Chaos asked. Too late for that question, isn't it? I answered and heard him withdraw back into equity. He had warned me and now it was my turn to take the plunge and see it for myself. I felt myself sink away from the physical world. 
I pictured our mental selves. On one side there was me, rich with emotion and knowledge and on the other side, what I expected was cold logic and reason. True impartiality to the world except what directly concerned me or mine. Except, there was nothing there. Nothing there except a message of some kind. I mentally tapped it and let it play. My vision changed from the beautiful and magical landscape of energy to the top of a peak in my air dimension. The one where I used to meditate. For a few seconds, I was disoriented, almost giddy that by some fluke I was back. Then I started noticing a few key differences. The sky was dark only a dim light which came from somewhere, lighting up the surroundings enough that I could perceive what was happening, and before me, peering over the edge of the cliff was order. He looked like me, stood like me, was me. Soft black locks floating in the wind, tall and wearing an ostentatious robe of white. Why, that one word was filled with so much pain as it left my mouth. I felt choked up and nauseous. Order straightened up, still not looking at me. These are the last dregs of my consciousness. The last dregs I left behind to sort of, say goodbye Aiden. He turned to stare at me and I almost stumbled back in shock. His eyes were pools of black with webs of the same color covering his eyes. He had on his face a wide smile that reeked of evil. An evil that reminded me of one being. Empty hands master and my supposed creator, the great darkness. Oh, he groaned. Why do you look at me like that, Aiden? He took a step forward, hand reaching out towards me. I took an involuntary step back. What happened to you? I questioned. The hand he had held out fell back down. He cocked his head to the side, looking around and away. His body jerked like a doll. I guess, freedom. He answered, lips left open after the word was out. Freedom from you, he hit me with an intense look of, hatred? No not hatred, ridicule and maybe anger. I kept quiet, stumped by the whole affair. Do you have any idea what you did when you fought empty hand in your space of being? I shook my head. I'll tell you. The separation between your three states, order, prima and chaos was rendered, poof. He threw his hands up. Prima? I'm guessing that's me. And suddenly, suddenly I could feel. Influenced not by you but by him. He chuckled. Chaos. That little fuck. The statement was full of venom. And now that I could feel, I could also attribute emotions to my memories. And I found out that to you, I am nothing more than a tool. A tool to use when you need and then discard, push it back to the darkness where it can't see the light until the next time you need it. What the fuck is he on about? I shook my head. Can he hear himself? You betrayed me because you felt I was treating you unfairly? Even as the words left my mouth, I could not believe them. So you looked at your memories, at everything we've gone through. Battles against angels, demons, supervillains and decided that, all of it meant nothing? What in the world? That's it? That's why he subjected me to a fate worse than death? How could this thing have ever been a part of myself? Chapter 274 A Talk with Order 30 Advance I could see from his eyes that he knew it. Knew how nonsensical his logic was, so I twisted the knife even more. What you're doing is giving yourself excuses to hide behind, because you're a coward. You feel guilty but instead of owning up to your mistakes, you dig yourself deeper into the hole. Apologize you dumb twat and we can move on. His face changed at my words. The anger was traded away for hatred. How could I ever make such a hateful expression? Shut the fuck up Aiden. You know nothing. I stepped up to him, a chuckle full of derision escaping me. Oh really? You think it's fun having the reins, the control? Chaos knows and understands that we all have our own parts to play. I haven't had it easy, you haven't had it easy and neither has he. But things were getting better you fucking fool. We were on our way to getting everything we ever wanted, but then you fucked it all up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I felt a force smash into me and slam me through the ground. My body carved out a groove through the rocky floor below, before it was forcefully stopped by a boulder. I fell to my knees and stayed there, only looking up as Order walked up to me. I'm not gonna fight you Order. I shook my head, a billion years lost because of impatience, a billion years lost because of low self-control, because of fear, he wasn't worth it. I felt him grab onto my hair and turn my face upwards. Even when you're nothing, you try to act as if you're better than me. You Aiden Strong are a dick. An asshole. An idiot who has only gotten this far because of luck and my power. His black eyes were wide, face twisted in a hateful glare and mouth frothing with spit. He pulled me up and dragged me to the edge of the cliff without my protesting. 
It's about time you realized that without that, without me, you're nothing. He roughly pushed me forward and made stare down at the dark below. The darkness, it told me what I had to do. It told me who I was always meant to be. He stated in an unhinged tone. The awning black pool below the mist of the air dimension was devouring everything. And now I understand why the sky was dark, all the light had been sucked away. The pool changed and began to show me what had happened. I saw a shadow behind order as he pushed both equity and, a paint brew, no, its name, its name was Origin. He pushed both together under the whispers of the shadow behind him as Chaos tried his best to stop him. There was an explosion that tore apart my space of being once both weapons got closer. The resulting impact shredded my body and soul, killing me suddenly and completely. My space of being was left looking like a dumpster with rifts and pieces of what had been thoughts, self-reflections, experience, knowledge and dreams, floating about, lifeless and grey. I. Died? Yes, Order whispered gleefully next to my ears. But more than that, I was finally free. Origin, the paintbrush entered one of the spatial rifts and disappeared into the void, lost in the countless worlds of the wide infinitude. But before I could go, I needed to make sure you wouldn't come after me. He added. Oh no, please don't tell me. I took away your connection to Gaia, a gift once given by me, that being the only way you can traverse worlds. I have no idea where you headed up but trust me when I say, you're staying there. I was stuck in Marvel, and I had no idea where Gaia was. I closed my eyes and when I opened them I had changed my mind. Rage the likes of which I had never felt before made the whole space around us shake. Then everything stopped. I looked up at him with a cold gaze. I am going to fuck you up. Elsewhere. It had been a month. A month in which things had started getting back to normal. The danger was past. The fight for the realm between, the gentry and Gaia had been broadcasted to the whole population and what that had elicited was awe and fear in humanity. Fear that they would come back, fear that next time the heroes wouldn't win. But more than the fear was adoration. Not for the heroes but for the new rising stars. Vatu, Michael and Yotel had been widely shown to be pushing back empty hands forces and with their full power in display, Aiden's religion only grew from there. It was picking up speed. From a mere 100,000 to 60 million true worshippers and even more curious people joining, it was well on its way to becoming a major religion and tensions were already rising up between what Gaia called Avatarism and other major religions. On her part, Gaia and the Avatarian pantheon, consisting of Michael and Yotu, Vata was outside the realm with the mission to bring back Rava, Cory and the kids, were standing before a large whirlpool in the middle of the ocean. With them was the mistress of the green, Iva. I can feel her. Without Master Raiden here, we will have to pool all our power together to open up this new realm. Gaia told the other three floating in the air behind her. Her tone was somber. They each bowed their heads. What do you need from us, Lady Gaia? Yotl spoke up for all of them. Let's stand in formation, then I need each of you to transfer your power to me, I shall handle the rest. They did as instructed, quickly forming a cardinal point-like formation while hovering above the whirlpool. Gaia nodded at Yotl, Michael, and Iva. Then as one, boundless divine spiritual energy began to pour into Gaia in black, red and green colors. Her blue form flickered with power as she absorbed the energy and refined it, separating the mysteries contained inside. A cloak of white energy covered her. Then she pointed both her arms to the whirlpool. The white energy fell down in a huge beam that struck the whirlpool and made the whole ocean royal around. Far away. Massive waves rocked the coast of the main populated continent. Why are we doing this again? The residential area is close to 30 miles away. That's too far for the water to reach. Killer Frost complained. Focus. Darken was quick to tell her. Unless you want to end up back in the Hololens, do what you're fucking told. Killer Frost threw a scathing look her way before snorting and looking away. Darken rolled her eyes, turning her attention to the sea. It had begun. Okay remember, Lady Gaia said that we are only to stop the water if it reaches us. Paige told the ice meta human behind her. Killer Frost nodded, a chilly mist escaping her hands. They had both seen it. A white lance falling from the sky and momentarily shining brighter than the sun. They shielded their eyes before looking back once the beam ended. And then the ground shook. They were both standing on a cliff overlooking the coast and the wide expanse of water. The cliff was very tall but even it almost faded in comparison to the tsunami about to hit shore. It was like an hungry beast. Killer Frost took a step back. Ah, that is close enough, don't you think? 
Frost questioned as the water managed to rise to a towering 4,000 feet. No its momentum is too much. Just wait for my signal. Once the tsunami had drowned out the beach and was headed towards them, Darkon gave the signal. Now. She jumped up to the sky and spread her hands out wide. Two huge curtains of darkness fell from the sky at her urging on both sides of the cliff but spaced out much further, creating a channel and directing the bulk of the seawater towards Killer Frost. There was another reason why Killer Frost had been chosen for this job. It wasn't common and only a few cases had been reported so far but, some individuals found their abilities enhanced by the spiritual energy in the air. And then there were special cases like Killer Frost. Icicle. Let's do this. From her shadow, out sprang a polar bear cub. Spiritual energy started roiling around both of them as the polar bear cub added its spirit energy to Killer Frost's metagene. Snowflakes fell from the sky as the temperature suddenly dropped to degrees nearing absolute zero. With confidence granted from Icicle's help as the spirit of Frost, Killer Frost managed to smile at the towering wave of water that was now blocking the view of the sun away from her. She stepped forward and pushed out her hands. The effect was almost instantaneous. Millions of water liters were frozen in under a second. Darkon looked down at the beautiful crystal that resulted from Killer Frost's actions and smiled. They did well. A short black snake with purple eyes coiled around her neck, his twirl staring at Killer Frost and her spirit. Darkon chuckled, scratching the small snake on its head. Don't be too jealous, Siren. We are still way cooler. Darkon told the small spirit of shadows. These two were the only known cases of spirits contracting with humans. On another note, the existence of lesser spirits had astounded many, and the prospect of the spiritual arts schools was now even more anticipated. Darken flew down and dismissed the massive dark wings that were made from darkness. She smiled at Killer Frost. Well done Frost. Icicle barked beside Killer Frost's legs. The latter bent down to rub out the cub's fur. A gentle look that looked out of place in the face of a supervillain appeared. It's all thanks to this little guy. Darkin was about to say something when Seren and Icicle both suddenly looked out towards the water. The two girls noticed the change and also turned to watch. Darkin blinked her eyes. What is that? Like a nuclear bomb explosion, an energy wave that was distinctly blue was spreading outwards from the ocean. Its origin point seemed to roughly be where Gaia and the rest had been trying to open the water realm. Frost grabbed Icicle. We need to get the fuck out of here. She told Darkin. Darken nodded, creating a platform of darkness below them and lifting them up. Hold. Before she could finish her statement, the blue energy wave reached them. Aiden's POV. I was not proud of it. Blood covered my hands. I felt a presence appear behind me. No not appear, reveal, because chaos had been here from the start. Watching as I tried to reason with order or the last dregs of himself he left behind. And when reasoning failed, he was there as I tore him down. He was there as I broke my word not to fight him. Technically I didn't, there hadn't been a fight, Order choked on blood as he looked up at the sky. Frido. I stomped down on his neck, hearing a snap, stopping him from completing the word, ending him. I saw the light disappear. You, you beat him to death. Chaos stated in a shocked tone. Yes, I replied, looking at the broken form of what looked like my body. The white robe he had worn was now red. Yes, I did and I am going to do worse once I capture the real him. Far far away. In a divine groove of the other world, a spiky-haired Saiyan wearing a supreme Kai outfit was meditating above a pool of water that shifted color in uneven intervals. He opened his eyes, revealing black eyes full of mirth. He looked up at the sky of the other world. I know you're coming for me Aiden. I can feel it. He smiled. But the minute you step foot in this universe, there is no going back. I will not only destroy you, I'll take everything you have. Laughter rang out. Chapter 275, Poetic Just I held out my hand to Order's broken form. Wisps of white-colored energy gathered above the palm of my right arm. Below us, his body disintegrated into nothing. I paid it no mind in exchange for the Order essence I had extracted from him. He's a fool. Inexperienced. A child. Just because he has my memories he thinks he can outsmart me? With this, tracking him will be as easy as breathing. I turned around to Chaos, who had been suspiciously quiet. What? You have something to say? I held his gaze long enough for him to look away. No. I don't. Good. I pushed past him and on the second step, opened my eyes in the real world. Unclasping my palm revealed the essence. I immediately got up and walked out of energy. 
The next step was too risky to carry out inside. Space was as always empty, cold and silent. But this particular instant, it seemed uninviting, as if aware of what I was about to do. I floated serenely for a few minutes, mentally readying myself. Then equity appeared in my hands. You think I'm being too irrational? I mentally projected to chaos. Yes. But I also understand that you're right to feel the way you feel. I am the part of you that is passionate. About the good and the bad. But you're not me. So don't get lost in feeling that you end up losing yourself. You are the prima. You are the balance between me and him. Don't forget that. I nodded, eyes blazing with determination. I won't. Then I raised equity up to the sky. The cosmic gazes came back again in full force. I ignored them in favor of letting out a little of my aura. My hair changed from black to green. My body began to leak out divine energy causing a tornado of air in the dead vacuum of space. The air turned into very small particles of snow. Now. Equity came slashing down, tearing apart space and revealing nothing on the other side. I smiled, covering my body with meaning and the mysteries of all my power. Then I expended countless lesser miracles to enable me to survive in the void between worlds. Are you sure about this? Chaos asked in alarm. The thing was, Chaos knew what was above the hierarchy. What was above him and order? The void. The true emptiness. Denial of existence, denial of being. Only high tier complex out of us all beings could do more than perceive it. I wasn't there yet. The only reason I had been able to even move the entirety of Gaia to another layer of the void was because of the power afforded to me by both order and chaos. To count as a true out of all being, I needed the three O's, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. But for now I could cheat. My miracles basically counted as one-use omnipotence coupons. And although I couldn't use a major miracle as that was reserved for something else, I could at least stack lesser miracles together and use them to stave off the nothingness that would seek to pull me apart and meld me into the void. Yeah, I am. I answered chaos and plunged inside. Only to hit the wall. What? I placed my palm flat upon the opening in between the fabric of space. Trying to push my hand in, yielded no results. The wall was stubborn, immutable and too durable. I pulled back my limb, folded the fingers into a punch and let it fly. My punch landed on the invisible wall and did nothing. I clenched my jaw, flying back to add more distance between us. My hair changed from green to red. My form bunched up as I elementalized. My eyes became burning orbs and I stood at more than twenty feet. I had gone into my flame god form. Equity changed size to match me and started burning with a silver flame that was then enhanced by chaos energy to look completely different. Imagine motes of black fighting for dominance against super hot and super destructive silver flames. This was an attack that if carelessly released, would leave a scar that could not be healed in the universe. Good thing I was only aiming to use it to puncture through the hole. Let me out. I calmly requested him, my uninvited guest. Who you might ask. The golden light floating in space next to me. It had always been there. Then again, he was everywhere at the same time. I am not holding you captive Aiden Strong. The one above all said, projecting his voice through the vacuum. Oh yeah? I motioned to the hole before me. Then why? Because the two are meant to be separate, good and bad. Just as the presence has his opposite so do I and he, like the great darkness is unforgiving. I cannot allow you to give him access to this side. Something bled out of me. Motivation. The one below all. I realized, powering down. Greater than my anger for order was my hate for my apparent creator and if the one below all was similar to the great darkness then. I fixed space, watching as the fabric I had torn apart was melded once more. Fine, I faced him, seeing nothing but more light inside of more light inside of more. I simply looked away, the vision of what my eyes had captured almost overwhelming my mind. True omnipotence man, gotta get me some of that. Then help me. There was silence and then. No. He answered. Not exactly surprising but. Why? I needed to know the reasoning behind why he wouldn't expel someone that could cause calamity across his creation. Because you can't pay the price for my help, Aiden Strong. Handle this on your own. Then he vanished, bringing the darkness back. Space have never felt even more uninviting. I tightened my hand into a fist. Another dead end. Fuck 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 fuck. Boom. A trail appeared in space, blazing with power as a figure burning in streaks of myriad flames exceeded the concept of speed. 
I was that figure, clearing over millions of light years in a split second before accelerating even more. Worlds, clusters, supermassive black holes, star systems, cosmic clouds and billions upon billion of stars passed by me as I went past the observable universe. My logic was, if the one above all couldn't help me then I was breaking out forcefully. At least on the edge of the universe if the one below all decided to attack or spread his influence, it would be too far away from any populated worlds and he could be stopped before it was too late. Chaos. I need all your power. Everything you can spare. I was too far gone. Having the prospect of freedom get dangled in front of me and then stolen away was more than just infuriating. I didn't have a word to express the kind of emotions going inside my mind. The only thing I could see was Cory and my kids' faces. They were waiting for me, waiting for Daddy to come home. Tears were openly falling from my eyes. I didn't care anymore. One way or the other, I was getting out. That or die trying. Chaos said nothing but a torrential wave of energy poured into me. A truly infinite amount. He was absorbing the chaos from all around us. Stars died. Black holes collapsed upon themselves, leaving behind a dark and lonely universe behind my wake. The beauty that you would witness from looking up at the sky was disappearing but I didn't care. In fact I needed more. As the Lord of Balance, it stands to reason that I could do more than use all four elements. I hadn't tried it before but I was more than certain I could combine and use them all at the same time. Not just the elements mind you, but everything I had. My divinities, my physical strength, all of it. I did exactly that. One of my eyes changed to red. My left side unraveled into wind while my right unraveled into myriad of colored flames. I could feel the load getting too much. This form was imperfect but the power it afforded me despite the body being on the verge of breaking down, only sustained by my high speed regeneration, was crazy. I could almost touch upon the next level. A level that would make me transcendental among cosmic entities. It was incredible and too much. My hair was the first to go, burning away from the power I was exuding. I dispatched lesser miracles by the dozens just to keep the form going for one more second. The second second, having taken only one to make it all this way. The edge of the universe was before me in an instant and I responded by throwing everything I had at it into equity. Then chaos enhanced the power and it was glorious. The instant the impact of my combined power which came out looking like a black, darker than dark slash, landed on the metaphysical wall of the universe, it all became undone. Cracks ran up, down and sideways of the wall, spreading and adding more spider webs to its form, revealing what was beyond. A whiteness that confused the mind, a void that was different from my own lair which I had conquered only by relying on the connection I had with order and chaos. Now that one of them was missing, I could only look for other ways to cheat. But I had made it. I instantly dropped out of the unstable form I had taken. Wow. I can't believe that actually worked. Chaos told me. I know. I was free and my face reflected that, a smile of accomplishment making its way to my face. Do you think your connection with Energer will remain after you leave this universe? Chaos wondered. I don't know. I shook my head. But Energer is going nowhere, this is important, we need to go after order and get back my connection to Kaia, the longer we wait, the more time he has to prepare. I don't disagree, but, Energer might not be as safe as you might think. Chaos pointed out, making me grind my teeth. Fuck, you're right. The Eternals. They know about Mars. Hume, not what I meant but yeah. Still, this is the Marvel verse and you might be forgetting about a certain someone who eats planets for breakfast. If he senses the energy fluctuations coming off of Mars then. Galactus will devour it. Shit, I closed my eyes. Energy or freedom? Why not both? I can sense a connection to energy. It's a strong one stronger than even Gaia. I can make it back if I sense that something is wrong. This is not a chance we can miss. I decided. It was a gamble. But life is always a gamble, isn't it? And if it came down to it, I stopped that thought in its tracks. I could have both. I knew it. Which is why, I flew towards the void with a determined look on my face. Then everything went wrong. Look out. Chaos shout was enough to shake the heavens but it stopped me right in my tracks. From the cracks around the veil, wall separating the universe, golden light began to mend them quicker than I had destroyed them. I stumbled back in shock, feeling the influence of a lot of cosmic beings behind the light. No. A heavy aura slammed onto my shoulders and I found myself immobilized. Aiden Strong, you are being punished for your actions against creation. The judgment is, death. 
a voice coming from everywhere all at once announced. The most ironic part was how my punishment was carried out. All of my power, the one I had used to break apart the wall of the universe was gathered and then in a controlled beam of pure destruction, redirected towards me. Poetic justice, at its finest. I said as the light drowned me under. Then darkness 